Book Five, Chapter Seven of the History of Sir Richard Calmady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, two thousand and twenty. The History of Sir Richard Calmady by Lucas Mallet. Book Five, Chapter Seven. Splendide Mendax. Unpunctuality could not be cited as among Madame de Valaube's offences. Yet, on the morning in question, she was certainly very late for the twelve o'clock breakfast. Richard Calmady, awaiting her coming beneath the glistering dome of the airy pavilion, set in the angle of the terminal wall of the high-lying garden, had time to become conscious of slight irritation. It was not merely that he was constitutionally impatient of delay, but that his nerves were tiresomely on edge just now. Trifles had power to endanger his somewhat stoic equanimity. But when at length Helen emerged from the house, irritation was forgotten. Moving through the vivid lights and shadows of the ilex and cypress grove, her appearance had a charm of unwonted simplicity. At first sight, her graceful person had the effect of being clothed in a religious habit. Richard's youthful delight in seeing a woman walk beautifully remained to him. It received satisfaction now. Helen advanced without haste a certain grandeur in her demeanour, a certain gloom, even as one who takes serious counsel of himself, indifferent to external things, at once actor in and spectator of some drama playing itself out in the theatre of his own soul. And this effect of dignity, of self-recollection, was curiously heightened by her dress, of a very soft and fine woollen material of spotless white, the lines of it at once flowing and statuesque, while as headgear, in place of some startling construction of contemporary Parisian millinery, she wore, after the modest Italian fashion, a black lace mantilla over her bright hair. Arrived, she greeted Richard curtly, and without apology for delay, accepted the contents of the first dish offered to her by the waiting men-servants, ate as though determinedly and putting a force upon herself, and, that which was unusual with her before sundown, drank wine. And watching her, involuntarily, Richard's thoughts travelled back to a certain luncheon party at Brockhurst, graced by the presence of genial, puzzle-headed Lord Fallowfield and members of his numerous family, when Helen had swept in, even as now, had been self-absorbed, even as now of the drive to newlands all in the sad november afternoon following on that luncheon he also thought of communications made by helen during that drive and of the long course of event and action directly or indirectly consequent upon those communications he thought of the fog too enveloping and almost choking him when in the early morning driven by furies still virgin in body as in heart he had ridden out into a blank and sightless world, hoping the chill of it would allay the fever in his blood, and of the fog again in the afternoon, from out which the branches of the great trees, like famine-stricken arms in tattered draperies, seemed to pluck evilly at the carriage as he walked the smoking horses up and down the Newlands Drive, waiting for Helen to rejoin him. And now, somehow, that fog seemed to come up between him and the well-furnished breakfast-table, between him and the radiant expanse of the vivacious, capricious, half-classic, half-modern mercantile city outstretched there, teeming, breeding, fermenting, in the fecunditing heat of the noonday sun. The chill of the fog struck cold into his vitals now, giving him the strangest physical sensation. Richard straightened himself in his chair, passed his hands across his eyes impatiently. Brockhurst and all the old life of it was a subject of which he forbade himself remembrance. He had divorced himself from all that, cut himself adrift from it long ago. By an act of will he tried to put it out of his mind now, but the fog remained, an actual clouding of his physical vision, blurring all he looked upon. It was horribly uncomfortable. He wished he was alone. Then he might have slipped down from his chair and, according to his poor capacity of locomotion, sought relief in movement. Meanwhile, silently, mechanically, Helen de Valorbe continued her breakfast, and as she so continued, 
in addition to his singular physical sensations of blurred vision and clinging chill he became aware of a growing embarrassment and constraint between himself and his companion so far his and her intercourse had been easy and spontaneous because superficial since that first interview on the terrace a tacit agreement had existed to avoid the personal note now for cause unknown that intercourse threatened entering upon a new phase it was as though the concentration the tension which he observed in her and of which he was sensible in himself must of necessity eventuate in some unbosoming some act almost involuntary of self-revelation this unaccustomed silence and restraint seemed to richard charged with consequences which in his present condition of defective volition he was powerless to prevent and this displeased him mastery of surrounding influences being very dear to him at last coffee having been served the men's servants withdrew to the house but the constraint was not thereby lessened helen sat upright her chin resting upon the back of her left hand her eyes under their drooping lids looking out with a veiled fierceness upon the fair and glittering prospect richard saw her face in profile the black mantilla draped her shoulders and bust with a certain austerity of effect it was evident that by something she had been stirred to the extinction of her habitual vivacity and desire to shine and richard for all his coolness of head and rather cynical maturity of outlook had a restless suspicion of going forth even as on that foggy morning at brockhurst into a blank and sightless world full of hazardous possibility where the safe way was difficult of discovery and where masked dangers might lurk solicitous to dissipate his discomfort he spoke a little at random you must forgive me for being such an abominably bad host he said courteously i'm not quite the thing this morning somehow i had a little go of fever last night my brain is like so much pulp helen dropped her hand upon the table as though putting a term to an importunate train of thought i have always understood the villa to be remarkably free of malaria she remarked abstractedly well so it is i quite believe that the servants certainly keep well enough but so unfortunately is not the port helen turned her head a vertical line was observable between her arched eyebrows the port she repeated richard swallowed his black coffee perhaps it might steady him and clear his head the numbness of his faculties and senses alike exasperated him filling him with a persuasion he would say precisely those things which wisdom would counsel to leave unsaid yes you know i generally go down and sleep on board the yacht there was a momentary pause madame de valorbe's lips parted in a soundless exclamation then she pushed back the modest folds of the mantilla leaving her neck free the action of her hands was very graceful as she did this and she looked fixedly at richard carmody i did not know that she said slowly and then added as though reasoning out her own thought and naples harbour is admittedly one of the most pestilential holes on the face of the earth are you not tempting providence in the matter of disease richard are you not rather wantonly indiscreet on the contrary he answered and something of mockery touched his expression i see it quite otherwise i have been congratulating myself on the praiseworthy abundance of my discretion and the words were no sooner out of his mouth than richard cursed himself for a bungler and a slightly vulgar one at that but upon his hearer those same words worked a remarkable change her gloom her abstraction departed leaving only a pretty pensiveness she smiled with chastened sweetness upon richard calmedy a smile nicely attuned to the semi-religious simplicity of her dress. Oh, perhaps we are both a trifle out of sorts this morning, she said. I too have had my little turn of sickness, sickness of the heart, and that seems unfair, since I rose in the best disposition of spirit. Quite early I went to confession. Confession? Richard repeated i didn't know your submission to the church carried you to such practical lengths 
Evidently we are each fated to make small discoveries regarding the habits of the other today, she rejoined. Possibly confession is to me just what those nights spent on board the yacht lying in that malodorous harbour are to you. Helen's smile broadened to a dainty naughtiness infinitely provoking, but pensiveness speedily supervened. She folded her hands upon the edge of the table and looked down at them meditatively. I relieved my conscience. Oh, not that there was much to relieve it of, thank heaven. We have lived austerely enough, most of us, this winter in France. Only it becomes a matter of moral, personal cleanliness after a time, all that. Exaggerated, but very comfortable. Just as one takes one's bath twice daily, not that it is necessary, but that it is a luxury of physical purity and self-respect, so one comes to go to confession. That is a luxury of moral purification. It is a bath to the soul, ministering to the perfection of its cleanliness and health. She looked up at Richard, smiling, that same dainty naughtiness very present. You observe I am eminently candid. I tell you exactly how my religion affects me. I can only reach high thinking through acts which are external and concrete. In short, I am a born sacramentalist. And Richard listened, interested and entertained. Yet since that strange blurring of fog still confused his vision and his judgment, vaguely suspicious that he missed the main intent of her speech suspicious as one who listening to the clever patterer of a conjurer detects in it the effort to distract attention from some difficult feat of ledger domain until that feat has passed from attempt merely into accomplished fact and indirectly that is where my heart sickness comes in she continued with a return to something of her former abstraction and gloom i was coming away coming back here and i was very happy it's not often one can say that. And then, poof, like that. She brought her hands smartly together. The charming bubble burst. For upon the very church steps I met a man whom I have every cause to hate. As she spoke, the fog seemed to draw away, burnt up by the great flaming sun-god there. Richard's brain grew clear, clearer indeed than in perfect health, and his still face grew more still than was even to it quite natural. Well, he asked, almost harshly. And Helen, whose faith in her own diplomacy had momentarily suffered eclipse, rejoiced, for the tone of his voice betrayed not disgust, but anxiety. It stirred her as a foretaste of victory, and victory had become a maddening necessity to her, Destinel had forced her hand. His natural infirmity of purpose relieved her of the fear he could work her any great mischief. Yet his ingenuity, inspired by wounded vanity, might prove beyond her calculations. It is not always safe to forecast the future by experience of the past in relation to such a being as Destinel. Therefore it became of supreme importance, before that gentleman had time further to obtrude himself, to bind Richard Carmody by some speech, some act, from which there was no going back, and more than just that. The sight of her ex-lover, though she now loathed him, possibly just because she so loathed him, provoked passion in her. It was as though only in a new intrigue could she rid herself of the remembrance of the old intrigue which was now so detestable to her. She craved to do him that deepest, most ultimate despite, and passion cried out in her. The sight of him, though she loathed him, had made her utterly weary of chastity, all of which emotions, but held as hounds in a leash, ready to be slipped when the psychological moment arrived, and by no means to be slipped until the arrival of it, dictated the tenor of her next speech. Well she answered with an air of half-angry sincerity altogether convincing. I really don't know that I am particularly proud of the episode. I know I was careless, that I laid myself open to the invidious comment which is usually the reward of all disinterested action. One learns to accept it as a matter of course. And you see, Paul Des Tonnel. Ah, oh, Des Tonnel! Richard exclaimed. Oh, you have read him? 
Everyone has read him. And what do you think of him? <laughs> that his technique is as amazingly clever as his thought is amazingly rotten. Oh, I know, I know, she said eagerly. And that's just what induced me to do all I could for him. If one could cut the canker away, give him backbone and decency while retaining that wonderful technique, one would have a second and greater Théophile Gautier. Richard was looking full at her. His face had more colour, more animation than usual. If, yes, if, he returned, but that same if bulks mighty big to my mind. Oh, I know, she repeated, yet it seemed to me worth the attempt. And then you understand, who better, that if one's own affairs are not conspicuously happy, one has all the more longing the affairs of others should be crowned with success. And this winter especially, among the sordid miseries, disgraces, and deprivations of the siege, one was liable to take refuge in an over-exalted altruism. It was difficult in so mad a world not to indulge in personal eccentricity, to the neglect of due worship of the great goddess conventionality. With death in visible form at every street corner, one's sense of humour, let alone one's higher faculties, rebelled against the futility of such worship. So many detestable sights and sounds were perpetually presented to one, not to mention broth of abominable things daily for dinner, that one turned with thanksgiving to beautiful form in art, to perfectly felicitous words and phrases. The meaning of them mattered but little just then. They freed one from the tyranny of more or less disgusting fact. They satisfied eye and ear. One asked nothing more just then. Luckily, you will say, since the animal des tonnelles had very surely nothing more to give. In speaking, Helen pushed her chair back, turning it sideways to the table. Her speech was alive with varied and telling inflections. Her smallest gesture had in it something descriptive and eloquent. And so I fell to encouraging the animal, she continued, almost plaintively yet with a note of veiled laughter in her voice. Reversing the order of Circe, Naples inclines one to classic illustrations, sometimes a little hackneyed. By the way, speaking of Naples, oh, look at the glory of it all just now, Richard. I tried to turn not men to swine, but swine to men, and I failed, of course. The gods know best. They never attempt metamorphosis on the ascending scale. I let Destronel come to see me frequently. The world advised itself to talk, but being rather bitterly secure of myself, I disregarded that. If one is aware that one's heart was finally and long ago disposed of, one ceases to think seriously of that side of things. Oh, you must know all that well enough. Witness the sea-borne furnishings of my bedroom upstairs. For half a minute she paused. Richard made no comment. Oh, well, hard words break no bones, she added lightly, and so, to show how much I despised all such censorious cackle, I allowed Destournel to travel south with me when I left Paris. You pushed neglect of the worship of conventionality rather far, Richard said. Helen rose to her feet. Excitement gained on her, as always, during one of her delightful improvisations, her talented viva voce improvements on dry-as-dust fact. She laughed softly, biting her lip. More than one hound had been slipped by now. They made good running. She stood by Richard Carmody, looking down at him, covering him, so to speak, with her eyes. The black mantilla no longer veiled her bright head. It had fallen to the ground, and lay a dark blot on the mellow fairness of the tessellated pavement. White-robed and statuesque, yet not with the severe grace of marble, but with that softer, more humanly seductive grace of some figure of cunningly tinted ivory, she appeared just then to gather up in herself all the poetry, the intense and vivid light, the victorious vitality of the clear, burning southern noon. Oh, well, conventionality proved perfectly competent to avenge herself, she exclaimed. The animal des Tonnelles took the average, the banal view, as might have been anticipated. 
he had the insane presumption to suppose that it was himself, not his art, in which I was interested. I explained his error and departed. I recovered my equanimity. That took time. I felt soiled, degraded. And then today I meet him again, unashamed, actually claiming recognition. I repeated my explanation with uncompromising lucidity. Richard moved restlessly in his chair, looking up almost sharply at her. Hm, waste of breath, he said. No explanation is lucid if the hearer is unwilling to accept it. And then the two cousins, as though they had reached unexpectedly some parting of the ways, calling for instant decision in respect of the future direction of their journey, gazed upon one another strangely, each half defiant of the other, each diligent to hide his own and read the other's thought, each sensible of a crisis, each at once hurried and arrested by suspicion of impending catastrophe, unless this way be chosen, that declined, though it seemed in good truth, not in their keeping, but in that of blind chance only, that both selection and rejection actually resided. And in this strait, neither habit of society, fine sword-play of diplomacy and tact, availed to help them. For suddenly they had outpaced all that, and brought up, amongst ancient and secular springs of action and emotion, before which civilization is powerless and the ready tongue of fashion dumb. But even while he so gazed, in fateful suspense and indecision, the fog came up again, chilling Richard Carmody's blood and oppressing his brain as with an uprising of foul miasma, blurring his vision, so that Helen's fair downward-gazing face was distorted, rendered elusive and vague, and along with this distressing restlessness took him, compelling him to seek relief in change of posture and of place. He couldn't stop to reckon with how that which he proposed to do might strike an onlooker. His immediate sensations filled his whole horizon. Silently, he slipped down from his chair, stood a moment, supporting himself with one hand on the edge of the table, and then moved forward to that side of the pavilion which gave upon the garden. Here the sunshine was hot upon the pavement and upon the outer half of each pale, slender column. Richard leant his shoulder against one of these, grateful for the genial heat. Since her first and somewhat inauspicious meeting with him in childhood, Helen had never, close at hand, seen Richard Carmody walk thus far. She stared, fascinated by that cruel spectacle, for the instant transformation of the apparently tall and conspicuously well-favoured courtly gentleman just now sitting at table with her, into the shuffling, long-armed, dwarfed and crippled creature, was at first utterly incredible, then portentous, then, by virtue of its very monstrosity, absorbing, and to her adorable, whetting appetite as veritable famine might. Chastity became to her more than ever absurd, a culpable waste of her own loveliness, of sensation, of emotion, a sin against those vernal influences working in this generous nature surrounding her, and working in her own blood. All the primitive instinct of her womanhood called aloud in her that she must wed, must wed, and the strident voice of the great painted city coming up to her, urgent, incessant, carried the same message, as did the radiant sea, whose white lips kissed the indented coastline as though pale and hungry with love, while the man before her, by his very abnormality and a certain secretness inevitable in that, heightened her passion. He was to her of all living men most desirable, so that she must win him and hold him, must see and know. In a few steps, light as those of the little rose-crowned dancer of long ago, she followed him across the shining floor. There was a point of north in the wind, adding exhilaration to the firm sunshine as ice to rare wine. The scent of narcissus, magnolia and lemon blossom was everywhere. The cypresses yielded an aromatic myrrh-like sweetness, the uprising waters of the fountain, set in the central alley, swerved southward, falling in a jewelled rain. Helen, in her spotless raiment, came close, and Richard Carmody turned to her. But his eyes no longer questioned hers. 
they were as windows opening back onto empty space, seeing all, yet telling nothing. His face had become still again and inscrutable, lightened only by that flickering, mocking smile. It seemed as though the psychological moment were past, and social sense, ordinary fashions of civilised intercourse, had not only come back, but come to stay. "'I think we will omit Destournel from our talk in future,' he said. "'As a subject of conversation I find he disagrees with me, notwithstanding his felicity of style and his admirable technique. "'I will give orders, which I hope may help to protect you from annoyance in future. "'In this delightful land, by wise exercise of just a little bribery and corruption, "'it is still possible to make the unwelcome alien prefer to seek health and entertainment elsewhere. "'Now, uh, will you like to go back to the house?' The approach to the pavilion from the lower level of the garden was by a carefully graded slope of Roman brick set edgewise. At regular intervals of about eighteen inches, this was crossed on the principle of a gangplank by raised marble treads. Without waiting for his cousin's reply, Richard started slowly down the slope. At the best of times, this descent for him demanded caution. Now his vision was again so queerly blurred that he miscalculated the distance between the two lowest treads, slipped and stumbled, lunging forward. Quick as a cat, Madame de Valorbe was behind him, her right hand grasping his right elbow, her left hand under his left armpit. "'Oh, Dicky, Dicky, don't fall!' she cried, a sudden terror in her voice. Her muscles hardened like steel. It needed all her strength to support him, for he was heavy, his body inert as that of one fainting. For a moment his head rested against her bosom, and her breath came short, sighing against his neck and cheek. By sheer force of will Richard recovered his footing, disengaging himself from her support, shuffling aside from her. "'A thousand thanks, Helen,' he said and then he looked full at her, and she, untender though she was, perceived that the perspective of space on which as windows might his eyes seemed to open back was not empty. It was peopled, crowded even as those steep teeming byways of Naples, by undying, unforgettable misery, humiliation, and revolt. <laughs> yes, it is rather unpardonable to be as I am, isn't it? he said, adding hastily, yet with a certain courteous dignity. "'I'm ashamed to trouble you, to ask you, of all people, to run messages for me. But would you go on to the house?' "'Oh, Dicky, why may not I help you?' she interrupted. "'Oh,' he said, "'the answer to that lies away back in the beginning of things. Even unlucky devils such as myself are not without a certain respect for that which is fitting, for seemliness and etiquette. Send one of my men, please. I shall be very grateful to you. Thanks. And Helen de Valorbe, her passion balked, and therefore more than ever at white heat, swept up the paved alley, amid the sweet scents of the garden, beneath the jewelled rain of the fountain, that point of north in the wind dallying with her as in laughing challenge, making her the more mad to have her way with Richard Calmady, yet knowing that of the two, he and she, he was the stronger as yet. End of chapter 7 of Book 5Book 5, Chapter 8 of The History of Sir Richard Carmody. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book 5, Chapter 8, in which Helen de Valorbe learns her rival's name. I hear Morabita sings in Ernani at the San Carlo on Friday night. Do you care to go, Helen? The question, though asked casually, had to the listener the effect of falling with a splash, as of a stone into a well, awakening unexpected echoes, disturbing rather harshly the constrained silence which had reigned during the earlier part of dinner. 
All the long, hot afternoon, Madame de Valorbe had been alone. Richard, invisible, shut persistently away in those rooms of the entresol, into which, as yet, she had never succeeded in penetrating. Richard had not proposed to her to do so, and it was part of that praiseworthy discretion which she had agreed with herself to practice, in her character of scrupulously unexacting guest, only to accept invitations, never to issue them. How her cousin might occupy himself, whom even he might receive, during the time spent in those rooms, she did not know, and it was idle to inquire. Neither of her servants, though skilful enough as a rule in the acquisition of information, could in this case acquire any. And so it came about that during those many still bright hours, following on her rather agitated parting with Richard at midday, while she paced the noble rooms of the first floor, once more taking note of their costly furnishings and fine pictures, meeting her own restless image again and again in their many mirrors, and later near sundown, when she walked the dry brown pathways of the ilex and cypress grove, the wildest suspicions of his possible doings assailed her. For she was constrained to admit that though she had spent a full week now under his roof, it was but the veriest fringe, after all, of the young man's habits and thought with which she was actually acquainted. And this not only desperately intrigued her curiosity, but the apartness behind which he entrenched himself and his doing was as a slight put upon her and consequent source of sharp mortification. So today she ranged all permitted spaces of the villa and its grounds softly yet lithe, watchful, fierce as a she-panther, her ears strained to hear, her eyes to see, driven the while by jealousy of that nameless rival to remembrance of whom all the whole place was dedicated, and by baffled passion as with whips. Nor did superstition fail to add its word of ill omen at this juncture. A carrion crow, long-legged, heavy of beak, alighting on the clustered curls of the marble bust of Homer, startled her with vociferous croakings. A long, narrow, many-jointed, blue-black, evil-looking beetle crawled from among the rusty fibrous cypress roots across her path. A funeral procession, priest and acolytes with lighted tapers, sitting within the glass-sided hearse at head and foot of the flower-strewn coffin, wound slowly along the dusty white road, bordered by queer growth of prickly pear and ragged stunted palm trees, far below. She crossed herself, turning hurriedly away. Yet for an instant, death, triumphant, hideous, inevitable, and all the spiritual terror and physical disgust of it, grinned at her, its fleshless face, as it seemed, close against her own. And alongside death, by some malign association of ideas and ugly antic of profanity, she saw the belle tête de Jésus of Monsieur Paul d'Estenel, as she had seen it this morning, he looking back, hat in hand, as he plunged down the breakneck Neapolitan side street with that impish, bleating, goat-like laugh. By the time the dinner hour drew near, she found her outlook in radical need of reconstruction, and to that end, bade Zaley dress her in the crocus yellow brocade reserved for some emergency such as the present. It was a gown surely to restore self-confidence and induce self-respect. Fashioned fancifully, according to a picturesque seventeenth-century Venetian model, the full sleeves and long-waisted body of it, this low-cut, generously displaying her shoulders and swell of her bosom, were draped with superb guipure de Flandre à bride frisée and strings of seed pearls. All trace of ascetic simplicity had very certainly departed. Helen was resplendent. Strings of seed pearls twisted in her honey-coloured hair, a clear red in her cheeks and hard brilliance in her eyes, bred of eager, jealous excitement. She had indeed reached a stage of feeling in which the sight of Richard Calmady, the fact of his presence, worked upon her to the extent of dangerous emotion. And now this statement of his, and the question following it, caused the flame of the inward fires tormenting her to leap high. 
Ah, oh, Morabita, she exclaimed. What an age it is since I have heard her sing or thought about her. How is her voice lasting, Richard? Oh, I really don't know, he answered, and that's why I'm rather curious to hear her. There was literally nothing but a voice in her case. No dramatic sense, nothing in the way of intelligence to fall back on. On that account it interested me to watch her. She and her voice had no essential relation to one another. Her talent was stuck into her as you might stick a pin into a cushion. She produced glorious effects without a notion how she produced them, and gave expression, and perfectly just expression, to emotions she had never dreamed of. At the best of times, singers are a feeble folk intellectually, but of all singers I have known, she was mentally the very feeblest. No, perhaps she was not very wise, Helen put in, but quite mildly, quite kindly. And so if the voice went, everything went, and that made one reflect agreeably upon the remarkably haphazard methods employed by that which we politely call Almighty God in his construction of our unhappy selves. Design. There's not a trace of design in the whole show. Bodies, souls, gifts, superfluities and deficiencies, just pitched together anyhow. The most bungling of human artists would blush to turn out such work. Richard spoke rapidly. He had refused course after course, and now the food on his plate remained untasted. Seen in the soft light of the shaded candles, his face had a strange look of distraction upon it, as though he too was restless with an intimate, deep-seated restlessness. His skin was less colourless than usual, his manner less colourless also, and this conferred a certain youthfulness on him, making him seem nearer, so Helen thought, to the boy she had known at Brockhurst than to the man whom lately she had been so signally conscious that she failed to know. No, I hope Morabita's voice remains to her, he continued. Her absolute nullity minus it is disagreeable to think of. And much as I relish collecting telling examples of the fatuity of the creator, <laughs> she voiceless would offer a supreme one. I would spare her that, poor dear for she was really rather charming to me at one time. So it was commonly reported, Helen remarked. Oh, was it? Richard said absently. Though as a rule conspicuously abstemious, he had drunk rather freely tonight, and that with an odd haste of thirst. Now he touched his champagne tumbler, intimating to Bates, the house steward, sometime the Brockhurst underbutler, that it should be refilled. "'I haven't seen more of Beta for nearly three years,' he went on. Uh, "'My last recollections of her are unfortunate. "'She had sent me a box, in Vienna, I think it was, for the Traviata. "'She was fat then, or rather fatter. "'Stage furniture leaves something to desire in the way of solidity. "'In the death scene, the middle of the bed collapsed. "'Her swan song ceased abruptly.' Her head and heels were in the air, and the very largest rest of her upon the floor, bed and bedclothes standing out in a frill all around. It was a sight discouraging to sentiment. I judged it kinder not to go to supper with her after the performance that night. Richard paused, and again drained his glass. I beg your pardon, he said. What atrocious nonsense I'm talking. I think I rather enjoy it, Madame de Valorbes answered. She looked at the young man sideways, from under her delicate eyelids. He was perfectly sober, of that there was no question, yet he was less inaccessible somehow than usual. She inclined to experiment. Only I am sorry for Morabita in more ways than one, poor wretch. But then, perhaps I am just a little sorry for all those women whom you reject, Richard. The women whom I reject, he said harshly. Yes, whom you reject, Helen repeated. Then she busied herself with a small black fig, splitting it deftly open, disclosing the purple and rose and clear living greens of the flesh and innumerable seeds of it, colours rich as those of a tropic sky at sunset. And there are so many of those women, it seems to me. 
I am coming to have a quite pathetic fellowship for them. She buried her white teeth in the softness of the fig. Not without reason, perhaps. It is idle to deny that you are a past master in the ungentle art of rejection. What have you to say in self-defence, Dicky? That talking nonsense appears to be highly infectious, and that it is a disagreeably oppressive evening. Helen de Valorbe smiled upon him, glanced quickly over her shoulder to assure herself the servants were no longer present, and then spoke, leaning across the corner of the table towards him, while her eyes searched his with a certain daring provocation. Yes, I admit I have finished my fig. Dinner is over, and it is my place to disappear, according to custom. She laid her rosy fingertips together, her elbows resting on the table. But I am disinclined to disappear. I have a number of things to say. Take that question of going to the opera, for instance. Half Naples will be there, and I know more than half Naples, and more than half Naples knows me. I do not crave to run incontinently into the arms of any of de Valorbe's many relations. They were not conspicuously kind to me when I was here as a girl and stood very much in need of kindness. So the question of going to the San Carlo, you see, requires reflection. And then her tone softened to a most persuasive gentleness. Then the evenings are a trifle long when one is alone and has nothing very satisfactory to think about. And I have been worried today, detestably worried. She looked down at her fingertips. Her expression became almost sombre. In any case, I shall not plague you very much longer, Richard, she said rather grandly. I have determined to remove myself, bag and baggage. It is best, more dignified to do so. Reluctantly, I own that. Here I have no abiding city. I wish I had, perhaps, but I haven't. Therefore, it is useless, and worse than useless, to play at having one. One must just face the truth. She looked full at the young man, smiling at him as though somehow forgiving him a slight, an unkindness, a neglect. And so, just because to you it all matters so uncommonly little, let us talk rather longer this evening. She rose. I'll go on into the long drawing-room, she said. The windows were still open there when I came to dinner. The room will be pleasantly cool. You will come? and she moved away quietly and thoughtfully, opened the high double doors and left them open, and that without once looking back. Yet her hearing was strained to catch the smallest sound above that which accompanied her, namely the rustling of her dress. Then a queer shiver ran all down her spine, and she set her teeth, for she perceived that halting, shuffling footsteps had begun to follow those light and graceful footsteps of her own. Ce n'est que le premier pas qui coûte, she said to herself. I have no fear for the rest. And yet, crossing the near half of the great room, she sank down on a sofa, thankful there was no farther to go. In the last few minutes, she had put forth more willpower and felt more deeply than she had supposed. Her knees gave under her. It was a relief to sit down. The many candles in the cut-glass chandeliers hanging from along the centre of the painted ceiling were lighted, filling the length and breadth of the room with a bland, diffused radiance. It touched picture and statue, tall mirror and rich curtain, polished woodwork of chair and table, gleaming ebony and ivory cabinet. It touched Helen de Valorbe's bright head and the strings of pearls twisted in her hair, her white neck, the swell of her bosom, and all that delicate wonder of needlework, the Flanders lace, trimming her bodice. It lay on her lap, too, as she leaned back in the corner of the sofa, her hands pressed down on either side her thighs, lay there bringing the pattern of her brocaded dress into high relief. This was a design of pomegranates, leaves, flowers and fruit, and of trailing peacock feathers, a couple of shades lighter than the crocus yellow ground. The light took the overthreads and stayed in them. The window stood wide open onto the balcony, 
the elaborately wrought ironwork of which, scroll and vase, plunging dolphin and rampant seahorse, detached itself from the opaque background of the night. And in at the window came luscious scents from the garden below, a chime of falling water, the music faint and distant in rising and falling cadence of a marching military band. In at it also, and rising superior to all these in imperativeness and purpose, came the voice of Naples itself, no longer that of a city of toil and commerce, but that of a city of pleasure, a city of license, until such time as the dawn should once again break and the sun arise, driving back man and beast alike to labour, the one from merry sinning, the other from hard-earned sleep. And once again, but in clearer, more urgent accents, the voice of the city repeated its message to Helen de Valorbe, calling aloud to her to do even as it was doing, namely, to wed. To wed. And hearing it, understanding that message, for a little space shame took her, in face both of its and her own shamelessness, so that she closed her eyes, unable for the moment to look at Richard Calmady as he crossed the great room in that bland and yet generous light. But almost immediately his voice, cold and measured in tone, there, close beside her, claimed her attention. "'That which you said at dinner rather distresses me, Helen.' And then, shame or no shame, Madame de Valorbe of necessity opened her eyes. And so doing, it needed all her self-control to repress a cry. She forced her open hands down very hard on the mattress of the sofa, for Richard leaned his back against the jamb of the open window, and she saw his face and all his poor figure in profile. His left hand hung straight at his sides, the tips of his fingers only just not touching the floor, and again, as at midday, the spectacle of his deformity worked upon her strangely. "'And what of all which I said at dinner distresses you?' she asked gently, with sudden solicitude. "'You showed me that I have been a wretchedly negligent host.' In speaking, the young man turned his head and looked at her, paused a moment, almost startled by her resplendent aspect. Then he looked down at his own stunted and defective limbs. His expression became very grim. He raised his shoulders just perceptibly. "'Well, I reproach myself with having allowed you to be so much alone. It must have been awfully dull for you.' "'Oh, it was a little dull,' Helen said, still gently. I ought to have begged you to ask some of the people you know in Naples to come here. It was stupid of me not to think of it. I need not have seen them, neither need they have seen me. He looked at her steadily again, as though trying to fix her image in his memory. Yes, it was stupid of me, he repeated absently. But I have got into churlish bachelor habits. That can hardly be helped, living alone or on board ship as I do and I've pretty well forgotten how to provide adequately for the entertainment of a guest. "'Oh, I have had that which I wanted, that which I came for,' Helen answered very charmingly. I "'Had it in parts, at all events, though I could have put up with just a little more of it, Dicky, perhaps.' "'I warned you, if you remember, that opportunities of amusement, as that word is generally understood, would be limited.' amusement she exclaimed with an almost tragic inflection of contempt oh yes he said amusement is not to be despised i'd give all i'm worth and half my time to be amused but that again like hospitality is rather a lost art with me you remember i warned you life at the villa in these days was not precisely hilarious helen clapped her hands together Oh, you are wilfully obtuse, you are wilfully, cruelly pig-headed, she cried. Oh, pardon me, dear Richard, but your attitude is enough to exasperate a saint. And I am no saint as yet. I am still human, radically, for my own peace of mind, lamentably human. I am only too capable of being grieved, humiliated and hurt. But there... It is folly to say such things to you. You are hopelessly insensible to all that. 
so I take refuge in quoting your own words of this morning against you, that no explanation is lucid if the hearer refuses to accept it. Oh, I am dull, no doubt, but I honestly fail to see how that remark of mine can be held to apply in the present case. It applies quite desolatingly well, Helen declared with spirit. Then her manner softened into a seductiveness of forgiveness once again. And so, dear Richard, I am glad that I had already determined to leave here tomorrow. It would have been a little too wretched to arrive at that determination after this conversation. You must go alone to hear your old flame, Morabita, sing. Only, if her voice is still as sympathetic as of old, if it moves you from your present insensibility, you may read remembrance of some aspects of my visit into the witchery of it, if you like. It may occur to you what those aspects really meant. Helen smiled upon him, leaning a little forward. Her eyes shone as though looking out through unshed tears. It's not exactly flattering to one's vanity to be compelled to depute to another woman the making of such things clear. But it is too evident I waste my time in attempting to make them clear myself. No explanation is lucid, etc. Helen shook back her head with an extraordinary charm of half-defiant, half-tearful laughter. She was playing a game, her whole intelligence bent on the playing of it skilfully. Yet she was genuinely touched. She was swayed by her very real emotion. She spoke from her heart, though every word, every passing action, subserved her ultimate purpose in regard to Richard Carmody. And after all, one must retain some remnant of self-respect with which to cover the nakedness of one's... Oh, yes, decidedly, Morabita's voice had best do the rest. Richard had moved from his station in the window. He stood at the far end of the sofa, resting his hands on the gilded and carven arm of it. Now the ungainliness of his deformity was hidden, and his height was greater than that of his companion, obliging her to look up at him. "'I gave you my word, Helen,' he said. "'I have no notion what you are driving at.' "'Driving at? Driving at?' she cried. "'Why, the self-evident truth that you are forcing me rather brutally to pay the full price of my weakness in coming here, in permitting myself the indulgence of seeing you again. You told me directly I arrived, with rather cynical frankness, that I had not changed. Well, that is quite true. What I was at Brockhurst four years ago, what I then felt, that I am, and that I still feel. Oh, you have nothing to reproach yourself with in defect of plain speaking or excess of amiable subterfuge. You hit out very straight from the shoulder. Directly I arrived, you also told me how you had devoted this place, with which I, after all, am not wholly unconnected, to the cult, to the ideal worship of a woman whom you loved. So I have devoted it, Richard said. And yet I was weak enough to remain. The young man's face relaxed, but its expression remained enigmatic. And why not? he asked. Oh, because in remaining I have laid myself open to misconstruction, to all manners of pains and penalties not easy to be endured, to the odious certainty of appearing contemptible in your estimation as well as in my own. Helen patted her pretty foot upon the floor in a small frenzy of irritation. "'How can I hope to escape, since even the precious being whom you affect to worship you keep sternly at arm's length? That is among the other pleasing things you confided to me immediately upon my arrival. Less seen at close quarters she should fall below your requirements, and so you should suffer disillusion.' Oh, you are frightfully cold-blooded, repulsively inhuman. Whether you judge others by yourself, reckoning them equally devoid of natural feeling, or whether you find a vindictive relish in rejecting the friendship and affection so lavishly offered you. Is it offered lavishly? 
"'That comes as news to me,' he put in. "'Oh, but it is, and I leave you to picture the pleasing entertainment afforded the offerer in seeing you ignore the offering, or, worse still, take it, examine it, and throw it aside like a dirty rag. In one case you underline your rejection almost to the point of insult.' "'This is very instructive. I am learning a whole lot about myself,' Richard said coolly. Oh, "'But look,' Madame de Valorbe cried, "'do you not prefer exposing yourself to the probability of serious illness "'rather than remain under the same roof with me? "'The inference hits one in the face. "'To you, the pestilential exhalations, "'the unspeakable abominations of Naples Harbour "'appear less dangerous than my near neighbourhood. "'You put it more strongly than I should,' he answered, smiling. "'Yet from a certain standpoint that may very well be true.' "'For an instant Helen hesitated. "'Her intelligence, for all its alertness, "'was strained exactly to appraise the value of his words, "'neither over nor underrating it, "'and her eyes searched his with a certain boldness "'and imperiousness of gaze. "'Richard, meanwhile, folding his arms "'upon the carven and gilt frame of the sofa, "'looked back at her, smiling still, at once ironically and very sadly. Then swift assurance came to her of the brazen card she had best play. But playing it, she was constrained to avert her eyes, and set her glance pensively upon the light-visited surface of her crocus-yellow silken lap. "'I will do my best possible to accept your nightly journeys as compliment in disguise, then,' she said quite softly. "'For truly,' When I come to think of it, was she herself here, she, the woman you so religiously admire, that you take elaborate pains to avoid having anything on earth to do with her, was she herself here, you could hardly take more extensive measures to secure yourself against risk of disappointment, hardly exercise a greater range of caution. Perhaps that's just it. Perhaps you have arrived at it all at last. Perhaps she is here, he said. And he turned away, steadying himself with one hand against the jamb of the window, and shuffled out, slowly, laboriously, onto the balcony and into the night. For a quite perceptible length of time, Helen de Valorbe continued to contemplate the light-visited surface of her crocus-yellow silken lap, she followed the lines of the rich pattern, pomegranate, fruit and blossom, trailing peacock's feather, for by such mechanical employment alone could she keep the immensity of her excitement and of her triumph in check. To shout aloud, to dance, to run wildly to and fro, would have been only too possible to her just then. All that for which she had schemed, had ruled herself discreetly, had ridden a waiting race, had been hers, in fact, from the first, the prize adjudged before ever she left the starting post. She held this man in the hollow of her hand, and that by no result of cunning artifice, but by right divine of beauty and wit and the manifold seductions of her richly endowed personality. And thinking of that, she clenched her dainty fists, opened them again and again clenched them upon the yielding mattress of the sofa, given over to an ecstasy of physical enjoyment, weaving, even as with clawed and padded paws, her prototype the she-panther might. Slowly she raised her downcast eyes and looked after Richard Carmody, his figure a blackness, as of vacancy, against the elaborate wrought ironwork of the balcony. And so doing, an adorable sensation moved her, at once of hungry tenderness and of fear, fear of something unknown, in a way fundamental, incalculable, the like of which she had never experienced before. Ah, oh, indeed, of all her many loves, here was the crown and climax. Yet in the midst of her very vital rapture, she could still find time for remembrance of the little crescent-shaped scar upon her temple, and for remembrance of Catherine Carmody, 
who had unwittingly fixed that blemish upon her and had also more than once frustrated her designs. This time frustration was not possible. She was about to revenge the infliction of that little scar, and at the same time the intellectual part of her was agreeably intrigued, trying to disentangle the why and wherefore of Richard's late action and utterances, while self-love was gratified to the highest height of its ambition by the knowledge that not only in his heart had she long reigned, but that he had dedicated time and wealth and refined ingenuity to the idea of her, to her worship, to the making of this, her former dwelling-place, into a temple for her honour, a splendid witness to her victorious charm, a shrine not unfitting to contain the idol of his imagination. For a little space she rested in all this, savouring the sweetness of it as some odour of costly sacrifice. For whatever her sins and lapses, Helen de Valor had the fine aesthetic appreciations, as well as the inevitable animality, of the great courtesan. The artist was at least as present in her as the whore and it was not, therefore, until realisation of her present felicity was complete, until it had soaked into her, so to speak, to the extent of a delicious familiarity, that she was disposed to seek change of posture or of place. Then at last, softly and languidly, for indeed she was somewhat spent by the manifold emotions of the day, she rose and followed Richard into the starless, low-lying night. Her first words were very simple, yet to herself charged with far-reaching meaning, as a little key may give access to a treasure-chest containing riches of fabulous worth. Richard, is it really true, that which you have told me? What conceivable object could I have in lying? Then why have you delayed? Why wasted the precious days, oh, the precious months and years, if it comes to that? How in honour and decency could I do otherwise, circumstances being such as they are, I being that which I am? The two voices were in notable contrast. Both were low, both were penetrated by feeling, but the man's was hoarse and rasping, the woman's smooth and soft as milk. Oh, it's the old story, she said. Will you never comprehend, Dicky, that what is to you hateful in yourself may to someone else be the last word of attraction, of seduction, even. "'God forbid I should ever comprehend that,' he answered. "'When I take to glorying in my shame, pluming myself upon my abnormality, then indeed I become beyond all example loathsome. The most deplorable moment of my very inglorious career will be precisely that in which I cease to look at myself with dispassionate contempt. Helen knelt down, resting her beautiful arms upon the dark handrail of the balcony, letting her wrist droop over it into the outer dimness. The bland light from the open window dwelt on her kneeling figure and bowed head, but it was as well, perhaps, that the night dropped a veil upon her face. "'And yet so it is,' she said. "'You may repudiate the idea, but the fact remains. I do not say it would affect all women alike, affect those, for instance, whose conception of love and of the relation between man and woman is dependent upon the slightly improper and very tedious marriage service as authorised by the English Church.' Let the conventional be conventional still. So much the better if you don't appeal to them. Meagre, timid, inadequate and respectable. A generation of fashion plates with a sixpenny book of etiquette, moral and social, stuck inside them to serve for a soul. Helen's voice broke in a little spasm of laughter, and her hands began unconsciously to open and close, open and close, weaving in soft outer darkness. We may leave them out of the argument, but there remain the elect, Richard, among whom I dare count myself, and over them never doubt it, just that which you hate and which appears at first sight to separate you so cruelly from other men gives you a strange empire. 
You stimulate, you arrest, you satisfy one's imagination, as does the spectacle of some great drama. You are at once enslaved and emancipated by this thing, to you hateful and to me adorable, beyond all measure of bondage or freedom inflicted upon or enjoyed by other men. And in this, just this, lies magnificent compensation, if you would but see it. I have always known that, known that if you would put aside your arrogance and pride and yield yourself a little, it was possible to love you and give you such joy in loving as one could give to no one else on earth. Her voice sweetened yet more. She leaned forward, pressing her bosom against the rough ironwork of the balcony. I knew that from the first hour we met, in the variegated autumn sunshine, upon the greensward before the white summer-house overlooking that noble English woodland view, I saw you, and so doing I saw mysteries of joy in myself unimagined by me before. It went very hard with me then, Richard. It has gone very hard with me ever since. Madame de Valorbe's words died away in a grave and delicate whisper, but she did not turn her head, nor did Richard speak. Only there, close beside her, she heard him breathe, panting short and quick even as a dog pants, while a certain vibration seemed to run along the rough ironwork against which she leaned. And by these signs, Helen judged her speech, though unanswered, had not been wholly in vain. From below, the luscious fragrance of the garden, the chime of falling water, and the urgent voice of the painted pleasure city came up about her. Night had veiled the face of Naples, even as Helen's own. Yet lines of innumerable lights described the suave curve of the bay, climbed the heights of Posilipo, were doubled in the oily waters of the harbour, spread abroad a luring gaiety in the wide piazzas, and shone like watchful and soliciting eyes from out the darkness of narrow street, steep lane, and cut-throat alley. While above all that, high uplifted against the opacity of the starless sky, a blood-red beacon burned on the summit of Vesuvius, the sombre glow of it reflected upon the underside of the masses of downward-rolling smoke as upon the belly of some slow-crawling, monstrous serpent. Suddenly Helen spoke once again, and with apparent inconsequence. "'Richard, you must have known she could never satisfy you. Why did you try to marry Constance Quayle?' "'To escape.' "'From whom? From me?' from myself, which is much the same thing as saying from you, I suppose. And you could not escape? <laughs> so it seems. Oh, but, oh, but, dear Richard, she said plaintively, yet with very winning sweetness, why, after all, should you want so desperately to escape? Richard moved a little farther from her, I have already explained that to you, to the point of insult, so you tell me, he said. Surely it's unnecessary to go over the ground again. You carry your idealism to the verge of slight absurdity, she answered. Oh, you of altogether too little faith. How should you gauge the full flavour of the fruit till you have set your teeth in it? better, far better, be a sacramentalist like me, and embrace the idea through the act, than refuse the act in dread of imperilling the dominion of the idea. You put the cart before the horse with a vengeance, Dicky. There's such a thing as being so reverently minded towards your God that he ceases to be the very least profit or use to you. And again she heard that panting breath beside her, Again, laughter bubbled up in her fair throat, and her hands fell to weaving the soft outer darkness. "'You must perceive that it cannot end here and thus,' she said presently. "'Of course not,' he answered, and then after a moment's pause he added coldly enough, 
I foresaw that, so I gave orders yesterday that the yacht was not to be laid up, but only to coal and provision, and undergo some imperatively necessary repairs. She should be ready for sea by the end of the week. Helen turned sideways, and the bland light from the room within touched her face now, as well as her kneeling figure. "'And then? And then?' she demanded, almost violently. "'Then I shall go.' "'Richard replied. "'Where, I do not yet know, "'but as far anyhow as the coal in the yacht's bunkers will drive her. "'Distance is more important than locality just now. "'And I leave you here at the villa, Helen. "'Do not regret that you came. "'I don't.' "'He too had turned to the light, "'which revealed his face ravaged and aged by stress of emotion, revealed to the homelessness as of empty space resident in his eyes. I shall be glad to remember the place pleases and speaks to you. It has been rather a haven of rest to me during these last two years. Oh, you would have had it at my death in any case. You have it a little sooner, that's all. But Helen held out her arms. The villa? The villa? she cried. What do I want with that? Oh, God in heaven, are you utterly devoid of all sensibility, all heart? Or are you afraid, afraid even yet, oh, very chicken-livered lover, that behind the beauty of Naples you may find the filth? It is not so, Dicky. it is not so, I tell you. Look at me. What would you have more? Surely for any man my love is good enough and then hurriedly, with a rustling of silken skirts, hot with anger from head to heel, she sprang to her feet. Across the room, one of the men's servants advanced. "'The carriage is at the door, sir,' he said, and Madame de Valorbe's voice broke in with a singular lightness and nonchalance. Oh, "'Surely it's rather imprudent to go out again tonight. You told me at dinner you were not well, that you had had a touch of fever.' She held out her hand, smiling serenely. "'Be advised,' she said. "'Avoid malaria. "'I shall see you before I go tomorrow. "'Yes, an, an afternoon train, I think. "'Good night. "'We meet at breakfast as usual.' She stepped in at the window, gathered up certain small properties, a gold scent bottle, one or two books, a blotting case, as with a view to final packing and departure. Just as she reached the door, she heard Richard say curtly, "'Send the carriage round. I shall not want it tonight.' But even so, Helen did not turn back. On the contrary, she ran, light of foot as the little dancer of long ago, with blush roses in her hat, through all the suite of rooms to her own sea-blue, sea-green bedchamber, and there, sitting down before the toilet table, greeted her own radiant image in the glass. Her lips were very red, her eyes shone like pale stars on a windy night. Quick, quick, undress me, Zaley. Put me to bed. I am simply expiring of fatigue, she said. End of chapter 8 of book 5《Book Five, Chapter Nine of the History of Sir Richard Calmady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Calmady by Lucas Mallet. Book Five, Chapter Nine Concerning That Daughter of Cupid and Psyche, Whom Men Call Voluptas. The furniture, though otherwise of the customary proportions, had all been dwarfed. This had been achieved in some cases by ingenious design in its construction, in others by the simple process of cutting down, thus reducing table and chair, couch and bureau, in itself of whatever grace of style, dignity of age, or fineness of workmanship, to an equality of uncomely degradation in respect of height. The resultant effect was a false perspective, nor was this unpleasing effect lessened by the proportions of the room itself. In common with all those of the entresol, it was noticeably low in relation to its length and width, 
while the stunted vaultings of its darkly frescoed ceiling produced an impression of heaviness rather than of space bookcases dwarfed as were all the other furnishings lined the walls to within about two feet of the spring of the said vaulting made of red cedar and unpolished the cornices and uprights of them were carved with arabesques in high relief an antique persian carpet sombre in colouring and of great value covered the greater portion of the pale pink and grey mosaic pavement of the floor thick rusty red genoa velvet curtains were drawn over each low square window a fire of logs burned on the open hearth and this notwithstanding the unaccustomed warmth of the outside air did but temper the chill atmosphere of the room and serve to draw a faint aroma from the carved cedar wood it was here to his library carried downstairs by his men-servants as a helpless baby child might be that richard calmady had come when helen de valorbe departed so blithely to her bedchamber and it was here he remained though nearly two hours had elapsed since then finding sleep impossible for the wakefulness and unrest of rapidly breeding illness were upon him his senses and his will had been in very active conflict desire had licked him as with fiery tongues driving him onward honour self-contempt in face of temptation to sensual indulgence an aspiration after somewhat stoic asceticism which had come to influence his action of late held him back but now here and alone the immediately provoking cause of passion removed reaction against the strain of all that had very sensibly set in he felt strangely astray as though drifting at hazard upon the waters of an unquiet mist-blinded sea he was conscious of a deep-seated preoccupation regarding some matter which he was alike unable to forget or to define formless images perplexed his vision formless thoughts pursued one another as with the hurry of rumoured calamity through his mind a desolating apprehension of things insufficiently developed of the inconclusive the immature the unattained of things mutilated things unfinished born out of due time and incomplete oppressed his fancy even the events of the last few hours in which he had played so considerable a part took on a shadowy semblance ceased to appeal to him as realities began to merge themselves in that all-pervading apprehension of defectiveness of that which is wanting lopped off so to speak and docked it was to him as though all natural common-sense relations were in abeyance as though his own usually precise mental processes were divorced from reason and experience had got out of perspective in short even as this low wide cedar scented library of which the vaulted ceiling seemed to approach unduly close to the mosaic marble floor and all its dwarfed furnishings its squat tables and almost legless chairs had got out of perspective the alternate purposeless energy and weariful weakness of fever just as the alternate dry flush and trembling chill of it distressed him he had slipped on a smoking coat but even the weight of this thin silk garment seemed oppressive although now and again he felt as though around his middle he wore a belt of ice not without considerable exertion he rolled forward a couch wide high-backed and legless mounted upon little wheels to the vicinity of the fire he drew himself up on to it and rested among the piled-up cushions perhaps if he waited exercising patience sleep might mercifully visit him and deliver him from this intolerable confusion of mind deliver him too from that hideous apprehension of universal mutilation of maimed purposes maimed happenings of a world peopled by beings maimed as he himself was but after a more subtle and intimate fashion a fashion intellectual or moral rather than merely physical so that they had to him just now an added hatefulness of specious lying since to ordinary seeing they appeared whole while whole they truly and actually were not 
Sternly he tried to shake himself free of these morbid fancies, to bring his imagination under control, and force himself once again to join hands with reality and common sense. And to this end he turned his attention to the consideration of practical matters. He dwelt on the details of the coaling and revictualling of his yacht, upon the objective of the voyage upon which he proposed to start a few days hence. He reviewed the letters which must be written and the arrangements which must be made with a view to putting his cousin legally in possession of the villa, the rent of which he proposed still to pay to her husband. This suite of rooms he would retain for his own use. That was necessary, obligatory. Yet why must he retain it? He didn't propose to return and live here at any future time. This episode was over or rather, had it not simply failed of completion? Was it not, like all the rest, maimed, lopped off ungainly, docked? Then where came in the obligation to reserve these rooms? He couldn't remember, yet he knew he was compelled to do so, because, oh, because... And once again Richard's power of concentration broke down. Once again his thought eluded him, becoming entangled, fugitive, not to be grasped, while, like swarms of shrill squeaking bats disturbed in the recesses of some age-old cavern by sudden intrusion of voices and of lights, half-formed visions, half-formed ideas once again flapped duskily about him, torturing in their multiplicity alike to his senses and his brain. He fought with them, striving to beat them off in a madness of disgust, half suffocated by the fanning of their foul and stifling wings. And then, exhausted by the conflict, he stumbled and fell, while they closed down on him, and he, losing consciousness, slept. That unconsciousness lasted in point of fact but for a few minutes, yet to Richard those minutes were as years, as centuries. At length, Still heavy with dreamless slumber, he was aware of the stealthy turning of a key in a lock. Little padding footfalls, soft as those of some strong yet dainty cat creature, crossed the carpet. A whisper of silk came along with them, like the murmur of the breeze in an oak grove on a clear hot summer noon, or the sibilant ripple of the sea upon spaces of fine ribbed yellow sand and the impression produced upon Richard was delicious, as of one passing from a close room into the open air. Confusion and exhaustion left him, energy returned, the energy of breeding fever merely, yet to him it appeared that of refreshment, of renewed and abounding health. He was conscious, too, of a will outside himself, acting upon his will, a will self-secure, impregnable, working with triumphant daring towards a single end. It certainly was unmaimed, in its present manifestation in any case. It told, and with assurance, of completion, of attainment. Yielding himself to it, with something of the recklessness a man yields himself to the poison which yet promises relief, Richard opened his eyes. Before him, stood Helen de Valorbe. In one hand she carried a little lamp, in the other her high-heeled cloth of gold slippers. Her feet were bare. In the haste of the journey from her bedchamber upstairs, through the great rooms and down the marble stairs, the fronts of the sea-blue, sea-green dressing-gown she wore had flown apart, thus disclosing not only her delicate nightdress, but, since this last was fine to the point of transparency, all the secret loveliness of her body and her limbs. Her shining hair curled low upon her forehead, half concealed her pretty ears, and lay upon her shoulders like a little golden cape. And from out this brightness of her hair, the exultant laughter bubbling in her throat, the small lamp carried high in one hand, she looked down at Richard Carmody. I waited till the hours grew old, and you did not come to me. So I have come to you, Dicky," she said. Let what will happen to-morrow, this very certainly shall happen to-night. 
that with you and me love shall have his own way speak his own language be worshipped with the rites be found in the sacraments ordained by himself and to which all nature is and has been obedient since life on earth first began not till the grey of a rain-washed windy morning had come and naples had put off its merry sinning changing from a city of pleasure to a city of labour and too often of callously inflicted pain did helen de valorbe leave the cedar-scented library the fire of logs had burnt itself out upon the hearth and other fires perhaps had pretty thoroughly burnt themselves out likewise and then with the extinguished lamp in one hand and her high-heeled cloth of gold slippers in the other she had run swiftly barefoot up the cold marble stairs through the suite of lofty rooms her image in the bleak dimness of the wet morning given back by their tall mirrors as that of no mortal woman but some fear-driven hurrying ghost carefully closing the door of the bedchamber behind her she threw her dressing-gown aside and buried herself in the luxurious softness of the unslept-in bed and she was only just in time servants began to move to and fro the house was awake end of chapter nine of book five book five chapter ten of the history of sir richard carmody this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book 5, Chapter 10. The Abomination of Desolation. Sullenly, persistently, the rain came down. In the harbour, the wash was just sufficient to make the ravelled fruit baskets, the shredded vegetables, the crusts and offal thrown out from the galleys, heave and sway upon the oily surface of the water, while screaming gulls dropped greedily upon the floating refuse, and rising, circled over the black liquid lanes and open spaces between the hulls of the many ships. But it was insufficient to lift the yacht tied up to the southern quay of the Porto Grande she lay there inert and in somewhat sorry plight under the steady downpour for the moment all the winsome devilry of a smart sea-going craft was dead in her and she sulked ashamed through all her eight hundred tons of wood and iron copper brass and steel for she was coaling over deck and was grimy from stem to stern while arrayed in the cast clothes of all europe tattered undersized and gesticulating the human scum of naples swarmed up the steep narrow planks from the inky lighters and in over her side beastly dirty job this shan't get her paint clean under a week the first mate grumbled to his companion the second mate a dark-haired dreamy-eyed west country lad but just out of his teens the two officers in dripping oilskins stood at the gangway checking the tally of coal baskets as they came on board just now there was a pause in the black procession as an empty lighter sheered off making room for a full one to come alongside thus rendering conversation momentarily possible pity the boss couldn't have stayed on shore till we were through with it and cleaned up a bit the speaker continued makes the old man no end waxy to have anyone on board when the yacht's like she is i don't blame him she's as neat and pretty as a white daisy in a green pasture when she's away to sea and now poor little soul she's a regular slut i know i'd have stayed ashore fast enough if i was the boss the boy said half wistfully that villa of his is like a piece of poetry i keep on saying over to myself how it looks oh it's not so bad for foreign parts the senior officer replied and you're young yet and soft pemberthy you'll come of that presently england's best for houses town and country and most other things women and fights and even sunshine for when you do get sunshine at home there's no spite in it hey there 
you ganga he shouted suddenly and resentfully leaning out over the bulwarks hurry em up a bit can't you you don't suppose i mean to stand here till the second anniversary of the day of judgment watching your blithering chicken shanked macaroni suck rotten oranges do you start em up again whatever are you waiting for man start em up i say the boy's dreamy eyes full of unwritten verse dwelt with a curious indifference upon the broken procession of ascending black figures he had but lately joined and to him both the fine vessel and her owner were invested with a certain romance what was the fancy for calling the yacht the reprieve he asked presently wait till you've had the chance to take a good look at sir richard and you'll answer your question yourself the other man answered oracularly then he broke out again into sustained invective hold up there you little fool of a tightrope dancing bella napoli gorilla and don't go dropping good honest welsh steam coal overboard into your confounded stinking local sewer i don't care to see any of your blinged posturings don't flatter yourself hold up you grimacing great grandson of a lousy she-ape can't you and walk straight take him all round sir richard Carmet is the best boss i ever sailed with one of the sternest but the civilest too oh shove em along ganga will you shove em along i say he's one of the few men i've loved i'm not ashamed to say it mr pemberthy and about the only one i ever remember to have feared in my life meanwhile if the scene to seaward was cheerless that to landward offered but small improvement for the murk of low brooding cloud and falling rain blotted out the castel sant'elmo and the capo di monte and pizza falcone heights even the castello dell'ovo down on the shoreline comparatively near at hand loomed up but a denser mass of indigo grey amid the all-obtaining greyness the tall multicoloured many shuttered houses fronting the quays restaurants cafes money changers bureaus ships chandlers and slop shops looked tawdry and degraded as a clown's painted face seen by daylight thick malodorous vapours arose from the squalid streets lying back on the level and from the crowded shipping of the port these hung in the stagnant air about the forest of masts and the funnels of steamers and the noise of the place was as that of bedlam let loose the long-drawn chattering rush of the coal pitched from the baskets down the echoing iron chutes the great and scream of saws cutting through blocks of stone and marble the grind of heavy wheels upon the broken irregular flags the struggling clatter of hoofs lashing of whips and squeals of mules savage voices raised in cries and imprecations the clank and roar of machinery the repeated bellowing of a great liner blowing off steam as she took up her berth in the outer harbour the shattering rattle of the chains of a steam crane when the monster iron arm swung around seeking or depositing its burden and the crank ran out in harsh anger as it seemed and defiance and through all this as undercurrent the confused clamour of the ever-shifting ever-present crowd and the small steady drip of the rain squalid sordid brutal even the coarse actualities of her trade and poverty alike disclosed her fictions and her foulness uncondoned by reconciling sunshine naples had declined from radiant goddess to common drab it was in this character that richard carmody driving yesterday and for the first time through the streets at noon had been fated to see his so fondly idealised city it was in this character that he apprehended it again to-day waiting in his deck cabin until cessation of the rain and oncoming of the friendly dusk should render it not wholly odious to sit out on deck the hours lagged and even this bright and usually spotless apartment with its shining white walls its dark blue leather and polished mahogany fittings the cold dust penetrated 
it rhymed the edge of the books neatly ranged on the racks it smirched the charts laid out on the square locker table below it drifted in at the cabin windows along with the babel of sound and the all-pervading stench of the port this was in itself sufficiently distasteful sufficiently depressing and to richard just now the disgust of it came with the heightened sensibility of physical illness and as accompaniment to an immense private shame and immense self-condemnation a conviction of outlawry and a desolation passing speech he looked for comfort for promise of restoration and found none in things material or things intellectual in others or in himself for his mind always prone to apprehend by images rather than by words and to advance by analogy rather than by argument discovered in surrounding aspects and surrounding circumstance a rather hideously apt parable and illustration of its present state just as this seemingly fair city was proven on intimate acquaintance repulsive beyond the worst he had ever feared and earnestly refused to know of it so a certain fair woman upon whom since boyhood his best most chivalrous most unselfish affections had centred was proven oh herself moreover flagrantly contributing to that proving proven vile beyond all that rumour heard and passionately denied by him had ever ventured to whisper concerning her nor was the misery of this revelation lessened by the knowledge that his own part in it all had been very base he had sinned before he would sin again probably richard had long ceased to regard these matters from a strictly puritanic standpoint but this particular sinning was different to any that had gone before or which could come after it for it partook so at least it now appeared to him of the nature of sacrilege since he had sinned against his ideal degrading that to gross uses which he had agreed with himself to hold sacred defiling it and thereby very horribly defiling himself and this disgrace of their relation his own and hers the inherent abomination of it all and its inherent falsity had been forced home on him with a certain violence of directness just in the common course of daily happenings for among the letters brought to him along with his first breakfast yesterday after that night of secret license had been three of serious import one was from lady calmedy and that he put aside with a certain anger calling himself unwilling knowing himself unfit to read it another he tore open the handwriting was unknown to him he began reading it in bewilderment then he understood monsieur it ran you are in process of exterminating me but since i have reason to believe that no sufficient opportunity has been afforded you of realizing the enormity of your conduct i rally the profoundness and nobility which i discover within me i calm myself i go further i explain living in retirement you may not have learned that i am in naples i followed your cousin here madame de valorbe my connection with her represents the supreme passion of my passionate youth at once a frenzy and an anodyne i have found in it the inspiration of my genius in its later development this work must not be put a stop to it is too majestic it is weighted with too serious consequences to the whole of thinking france of thinking europe a less experienced woman cannot satisfy the extravagance of my desires the demands of my all-consuming imagination the reverence with which a person such as yourself must regard commanding talent the concessions he must be willing to make to its necessities are without limit this i cannot doubt that you will admit the corollary is obvious either monsieur you will immediately invite me to reside with you at your villa thereby securing for yourself daily intercourse with a nature of distinguished merit or you will restore madame de valorbe to me without hesitation or delay her devotion to me is absolute 
how could it fail to be so since i have lavished upon her the treasures of my extraordinary personality but a fear of insular prejudice on your part withholds her at this moment from full expression of that devotion she suffers as well as myself it will be your privilege to put a term to this suffering by requesting me to join her or by restoring her to me to do otherwise will be to prolong the eclipse of my genius and thereby outrage the conscience of civilised humanity which breathlessly awaits the next utterance of its chosen poet if you require the consolation of feminine society marry it would be very simple some white-souled english miss but restore to me to whom her presence is indispensable this woman of regal passions i shall present myself at your house to-day to receive your answer in person the result of a refusal on your part to receive me will be attended by calamitous consequences to yourself accept monsieur the expression of my highest consideration paul auguste destonnel for the moment richard saw red mad with rage at the insolence of the writer and then came the question was it true this which the letter implied had helen indeed lied to him and notwithstanding its insane vanity did this precious epistle give a more voracious account of her relation to the young poet than that which she had herself volunteered he tried to put the thought from him who was he to-day of all days to be nice about the conduct of another who was he to sit in judgment so he turned to his correspondence again taking another letter at random from the pile and then looking at the superscription he turned somewhat sick mon cher wrote m de valorbe my steward informs me that he has just received your draft for a quarter's rent of the villa i thank you a thousand times for your admirable punctuality decidedly you are one of those with whom it is a consolation to do business need i assure you that the advent of this money is far from inopportune since a grateful country while showering distinctions upon me with one hand with the other picks my pocket i find it not a little expensive this famous military service but then ever since i can remember i have found all that afforded me the slightest active pleasure equally that and this sport of war i promise you is the most excellent sport in which i have as yet participated it satisfies the primitive instincts more thoroughly than even your english fox hunting a battue of communards is obviously superior to a battue of pheasants <laughs> to the dignity of killing one's fellow-men is added the satisfaction of ridding oneself of vermin it becomes a matter of sanitation and self-respect and this indirectly recalls to me that report declares my wife to be with you at naples oh, mon cher je vous en fais cadeau with you at least i know that my honour is safe you may even instil into her mind some faint conception of the rudiments of morality to be frank with you she needs that a couple of months ago she did me the honour to elope temporarily of course with m paul destonnel you may have glanced one day at his crapulous verses i suppose honour demanded that i should pursue the guilty pair and account for one if not both of them but i was too busily engaged with my little communards we set these gentry up against a wall and dispose of them in batches i've had a good deal of this but as i say it has not yet become monotonous traits of individual character lend it vivacity and then putting aside the exigencies of my profession i do not know that anything is to be gained by inviting public scandal you have an english proverb to the effect that one should wash one's dirty linen at home this i have tried to do as you cannot but be aware all along if one has the misfortune to marry messalina one learns to be philosophic 
a few lovers more or less in that connection what after all does it matter indeed i begin to derive ironical consolation from the fact of their multiplicity the existence of one would have constituted a reflection upon my charms but a matter of ten fifteen twenty ceases to be in any degree personal to myself only i object to destournel he is too young too rococo he represents a descent in the scale i prefer des hommes mûrs generals ministers and princes the devil knows we've had our share of such your generosity to her has saved us from jews so far and from nouveau riche by relieving the business of commercial aspects give her some salutary advice therefore mon cher and if she becomes inconvenient forward her to paris i forgive to seventy times seven being still proud enough to struggle after an appearance of social and conjugal decency enfin it is a relief to have unburdened myself for once and you have been the good genius of my unfortunate menage for which heaven reward you yours in true cousinly regard and supreme reliance on your discretion luigi angelo francesco de valorbe that this in any case had a stamp of sincerity upon it richard could not doubt it must be admitted that he had long ceased to accept madame de valorbe's estimate of her husband with unqualified belief but be that as it might whether he were a consummate or merely an average profligate one thing was certain that this man trusted him richard calmady and that he richard calmady had very vilely betrayed that trust he stared at the letter and certain sentences in it seemed to sear him even as the branding iron used on a felon might this was a new shame different to and greater than any his deformity had ever induced in him even as evil done is different to and greater than evil suffered morality may be relative only and conventional honour for all persons of a certain standing and breeding remains absolute and it was precisely of his own honour that he had deprived himself not only in body but in character he was henceforth monstrous for a while richard had remained very still looking at this thing into which he had made himself as though it were external and physically visible to him then suddenly he had reached out his hand for his mother's letter a decision of great moment was impending he would know what she had to say before finally making that decision he wondered bitterly grimly whether her words would plunge him yet deeper in this abyss of self-hatred and self-contempt my darling she wrote i am foolishly glad to learn that you are back at naples it gives me comfort to know you are even thus much nearer home and in a country where i too have travelled and of which i retain many dear and delightful recollections you may be surprised perhaps to see the unaccustomed address upon my note-paper and may wonder what has made me guilty of deserting my post and now since the worst of it is certainly over i may tell you that my health has failed a good deal of late nothing of a really serious nature you needn't be alarmed about me but i had got into a rather weak and unworthy state from which it became very desirable i should rouse myself selfishness is insidious but none the less reprehensible because it takes the apparently innocent form of sitting in a chair with one's eyes shut however that best of men john knott brought very bracing influences to bear on me convincing me of sin in the gentlest way in the world by means of honoria st quentin and so i picked myself up dear dicky picked the whole of myself up as i hope always saving and accepting my self-indulgent inertia and came away here to ormiston at first i confess i felt very much like a dog at a fair or the proverbial mummy at a feast but they all bore with me in the plenty of their kindness and in the last week 
I have banished the mummy and trained the scared dog to altogether polite and pretty behaviour. Till I came back to it, I hardly realised how truly I loved this place. How should it be otherwise? I met your father first here after his third term at Eton. I remember he snubbed me roundly. I met him again the year before our marriage. Without vanity, I declare that then he snubbed me not one little bit. <laughs> These things are very far away, but to me, though far away, they're very vivid and very lovely. I see them as you, when you were small, so often pleaded to see a fairy landscape by looking through the large end of the golden tortoiseshell spyglass upon my writing table, all of which may seem to you somewhat childish and trivial, but I grow an old woman and have a fancy for toys and tender make-believes, such as fairy landscapes seen through the big end of a spyglass. The actual landscape at times is a trifle discouragingly rain-washed and cloudy. Roger and Mary are here. Their two boys are just gone back to school again. They're fine, courteous, fearless little fellows. Roger makes a rather superb middle-aged man. He has much of my father, your grandfather's, reticence and dignity. Indeed, he might prove slightly alarming, was one not so perfectly sure of him, dear creature. Mary remains, as of old, the most wholesome and helpful of women. Oh, yes, it is good to dwell for a time among one's own people. And I cannot but rejoice that my eldest brother has come to an arrangement by which, at his death, your Uncle William will receive a considerable sum of money in lieu of the property. This last will go direct to Roger and eventually to his boys. If your Uncle William had a son, the whole matter would be different. But I own it would hurt me that in the event of his death there would be no Ormiston at Ormiston after these many generations. In all probability the place would be sold immediately, moreover, for it is an open secret that through no fault of his own poor man william is sadly embarrassed in money matters and he has other sorrows of a rather terrible nature since they're touched with disgrace but here you will probably detect a point of prejudice so i had better stop i look out upon a grey northern sea where the white horses fume and fret under a cold grey northern sky the oaks in the park are just thickening with yellow-green buds, and there, close to my window, perched on a topmost twig, a missel-thrush is singing, facing the wind like a gentleman. You look out upon a purple sea, I suppose, beneath clear skies and over orange trees and palms. I wonder if any brave bird pipes to you as my stormcock to me. It brings up one's courage to hear his song, so strong and wild and sweet, in the very teeth of the gale, too. But now, you will have had enough of my news, and more than enough. I write to you more freely, you see, than for a long time past, being myself more free of spirit. And therefore, I dare add this, in all and every case, my darling, God keep you. And remember... Should you weary of wandering, that not only the doors of Brockhurst, but the doors of my heart, stand forever wide open to welcome you home. Yours always, K.C. Reading which gentle, yet in a sense daring words, Richard's shame took on another complexion, but one by no means calculated to mitigate the burning of it, his treachery towards de Valorbes became almost vulgar and of small moment besides his cruelty to this superbly magnanimous woman, his mother. For all these years, determinately and of set purpose, defiant of every better impulse, he had hardened his heart against her. To differ from her, to cherish that which was unsympathetic to her, to put aside every tradition in which she had nurtured him, to love that which she condemned, and to condemn that which she loved, and this, if silently yet unswervingly, had been the ruling purpose of his action. 
that which had had its origin in passionate revolt against his own unhappy disfigurement had come to be an interest and object in itself in this quarrel with her a quarrel intimate prenatal anterior to consciousness and to volition he found the justification of his every lapse his every crookedness of conduct and of thought since he could not reach almighty god and strike at the eternal first cause which he held responsible for the inalienable wrong done to him he would strike with cold-blooded persistence at the woman whom almighty god had permitted to be his instrument in the infliction of that wrong and to where had that sustained purpose of striking led him even so he judged just now to the dishonour and desolation of to-day following upon the sacrilegious licence of last night all this richard saw with the alternately groping benumbed mental vision and the glaring mental nakedness of breeding fever small wonder that looking for comfort for promise of restoration he found none in things material in things intellectual in others or in himself he felt outcasted beyond hope of redemption but not repentant hardly remorseful even only aware of all that had happened and of his own state for lady carmody's letter was to him little more as yet than a placing of facts to trade upon her magnificent generosity of affection and seek refuge in those outstretched arms now with the mark of the branding iron so sensibly upon him appeared to him of all contemptible doings the most radically contemptible obviously it was impossible to go back he must go on rather out of sight out of mind fantastic schemes of disappearing of losing himself far away in remote and nameless places among the coral islands of the pacific or the chill majesty of the antarctic seas offered themselves to his imagination the practical difficulties presented by such schemes their infeasibility did not trouble him he would sever all connection with that which had been with that which had made for good equally with that which had made for evil by his own voluntary act and choice he would become as a man dead the disgrace of his malformed body the closer and more hideous disgrace of his defiled and prostituted soul surviving in legend merely as might some ugly old-time fable useful for the frightening of unruly babies and to that end of self-obliteration he instantly applied himself with outward calm but with the mental hurry and restlessness of increasing illness his first duty was to end the whole matter of his relation to helen helen shorn of her divinity convicted liar and wanton yet mistress still for him as he feared of mighty enchantments so he wrote to her very briefly the note should be given her later in the day in it he stated that he should have left the villa before this announcement reached her left it finally and without remotest prospect of return since he could not doubt that she recognised as he did how impossible it had become that he and she should meet again he added that he would communicate with her shortly as to business arrangements that done he summoned powell his valet bidding him to pack he would go down to the yacht at once he had received information which made it imperative that he should quit naples immediately to be out of all this rid of it fairly started on the road of negation of social being negation of recognised existence infected him like a madness but even the most forceful human will must bend to stupidities of detail and of material fact unexpected delays had occurred the yacht was not ready for sea neither cold nor provisioned nor sound of certain small damages to her machinery vanstone the captain might mislay his temper and the first mate expend himself in polysyllabic invective young pemberthy ceased to dream stewards engineers carpenters cooks quartermasters seamen firemen do their most willing and urgent best nevertheless the morning of next day and even the afternoon of it still found richard carmody seated at the locker table of the white-walled deck cabin his voyage towards self-obliteration not yet begun 
charts were outspread before him, upon which at weary intervals he essayed to trace the course of his coming wanderings. But his brain was dull. He had no power of consecutive thought. That same madness of going was upon him with undiminished power. Yet he knew not where he wanted to go, hardly why he wanted to go, only that a blind obsession of going drove him. He was miserably troubled about other matters too, about that same brief letter he had written to Helen before leaving the villa. He was convinced that he had written such a letter, but struggle as he might to remember the contents of it, they remained to him a blank. He was haunted by the fear that in that letter he had committed some irremediable folly, had bound himself to some absurdly unworthy course of action. But what it might be escaped him, and in escaping tortured him. And then, oh, this surely was Friday, and Morabita sang at the San Carlo tonight, and surely he had promised to be there, and to meet the famous prima donna, and sup with her after the performance, as in former days at Vienna. He had not always been quite kind to her, poor, dear, fat, good-natured, silly soul. He couldn't fail her now. And then he went back to a chart of the South Pacific again. Only he couldn't see it plainly, but saw instead of it the great folio of copper-plate engravings lying on the broad window-seat of the eastern bay of the long gallery at home. He was sitting there to watch for the racehorses coming back from exercise, Tom Chiffney pricking along beside them on his handsome cob, and the long-ago boyish desperation of longing for wholeness, for freedom, brought a moistness to his eyes and a lump into his throat. And all the while the coal dust drifted in at each smallest crevice and aperture, and the air was vibrant with rasping, jarring uproar, and nauseous with the stale, heavy odours of the city and the port. And steadily, ceaselessly, the descending rain drummed upon the roofing overhead. At length a stupor took him. His head sunk upon his arms, folded upon those outspread charts, while the noise of all the rude activities surrounding him subtly transformed itself into that of a great orchestra. And above this, superior to, yet nobly supported by it, Morabita's voice rose in the suave and passionate phrases of the glorious Cavatina. Ernani, Ernani, involami alla borito amplesso. Yes, her voice was as good as ever. Richard drew a long breath of relief. Here at least was something true to itself, and amid so much of change, so much of spoiling, still unspoilt. He raised his head and listened, for something must have happened, something of serious moment. The orchestra, for some unaccountable reason, had suddenly broken down. Yes, it must be the orchestra which disaster had overtaken, for a voice very certainly continued. No, not a voice, but voices. Those of Vanstone, the captain, and Price, the first mate, and old Billy Tin, the boatswain, loud, imperative, violently remonstrant, but swept under and swamped at moments by cries and volleys of foulest Neapolitan argo from hoarse Neapolitan throats. And that abruptly silenced orchestra? Richard came back to himself, came back to actualities of environment and prosaic fact. An infinitely weariful despair seized him, for the sound that had reached so suddenly a termination was not that of cunningly attuned musical instruments, but the long-drawn, chattering rush of the coal pitched from the baskets down the echoing iron chutes. The cabin door opened discreetly, and Powell, incarnation of decorous punctualities, even amid existing tumultuously discomposing circumstances, entered. "'From the villa, sir,' he said, depositing letters and newspapers upon the table. Richard put out his hand and turned them over mechanically. For again, somehow, notwithstanding the babel without, that exquisite invitation, Ernani, Ernani, involami, assailed his ears. The valet waited a little, quiet and deferential in bearing, yet observing his master with a certain keenness and anxiety. 
"'I saw Mr. Bates as you desired, sir,' he said at last. Richard looked up at him vaguely, and it struck him that while Powell was on shore today he had undoubtedly had his hair cut. This interested him, though why he would have found it difficult to say. "'Mr. Bates thought you should be informed that a gentleman called early yesterday afternoon, as he said, by appointment.' "'Yes, certainly Powell had had his hair cut.' "'Um, did the gentleman give his name?' Uh, "'Yes, sir, Monsieur Paul Destournelles.' Powell spoke slowly, getting his tongue carefully round the foreign syllables, and for all the confusion of his hearer's mind the name went home. Vagueness passed from Richard's glance. "'He was refused, of course.' Oh, her ladyship had given orders that should any person of that name call, he was to be admitted. Powell spoke with evident reluctance. Consequently, Mr. Bates was uncertain how to act, having received contrary orders from you, sir, the day before yesterday. He explained this to her ladyship, but she insisted. Richard's mind had become perfectly lucid. Very well, he said coldly. Mr. Bates also thought you should know, sir, that after Monsieur Destournelles' visit, her ladyship announced she should not remain at the villa. She left about five o'clock, taking her maid. Charles followed with all the baggage. The valet paused. Richard's manner was decidedly discouraging, yet something further must at least be intimated. Her ladyship gave no address to Mr. Bates for the forwarding of her letters. But here the cabin door, left slightly ajar by Powell, was opened wide, and that with none of the calm and discretion displayed by the functionary in question. A long perspective of grimy deck behind him, his oilskins shiny from the wet, with trim black beard, square-made, bold-eyed and hot-tempered, warm-hearted, alert and humorous, typical West countryman as his gentle, dreamy cousin Pemberthy, the second mate, though of a very different type, stood Captain Vanston. His easily ruffled temper suffered from the after-effects of what is commonly known as a jolly row, and his speech was curt in consequence thereof. "'Sorry to disturb you, Sir Richard,' he said, "'and still more sorry to disappoint you, but it can't be helped.' Richard turned upon him so strangely drawn and haggard a countenance that Vanston with difficulty repressed an exclamation. He looked in quick inquiry at the valet, who so far departed from his usual decorum as to nod his head in assent to the silent questioning. "'What's wrong now?' Richard said. "'Why, these beggarly rascals have knocked off. Price offered them a higher scale of pay. I'd empowered him to do so, but they won't budge. The rain's washed the heart out of them. We've tried persuasion and we've tried threats. It's no earthly use.' Not a basket more coal will they put on board before five tomorrow morning. And can't we sail with what we've got? Not enough to carry us to Port Said. What will be the extent of the delay this time? Richard asked. His tone had an edge to it. Again Captain Vanston glanced at the valet. With luck we may get off tomorrow or about midnight. He stepped back and shook himself like a big dog, scattering the water off his oilskins in a shower upon the slippery deck. Then he came inside the cabin and stood near Richard. His expression was very kindly, tender almost. "'You must excuse me, sir,' he said. "'I know it don't come within my province to give you advice. But you do look pretty ill, Sir Richard. Everyone's remarking that.' "'And you are ill, sir. You know it, and I know it, and Mr. Powell here knows it. "'You ought to see a doctor, sir, and if you'll pardon plain language, "'this beastly cesspit of a harbour is not a fit place for you to sleep in.' "'And poor Dicky, after an instant of sharp annoyance, "'touched by the man's honest humanity, smiled upon him, "'a smile of utter weariness, utter homelessness.' "'Perfectly true. Get me out to sea, then, Vanston. I shall be better there than anywhere else,' he said. Whereupon the kindly sailorman turned away, swearing gently into his trim black beard. But the valet remained, impassive in manner, 
actively anxious at heart. "'Have you any orders for the carriage, sir?' he asked. "'Garcia drove me down. I told him to wait until I had inquired." Richard was long in replying. His brain was all confused and clouded again, while again he heard the voice of the famous soprano. Ernani, Ernani, involani. Yes, yes, he said at last. Tell Garcia to be here in good time to drive me to the San Carlo. I have an appointment at the opera tonight. End of chapter 10 of book 5《Book Five, Chapter Eleven of the History of Sir Richard Comedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Comedy by Lucas Mallet. Book Five, Chapter Eleven, in which Dicky goes to the end of the world and looks over the wall. The opera box, which Richard Carmody had rented along with the Villa Valorbe, was fifth from the stage on the third tier, to the right of the vast horseshoe. Thus situated, it commanded a very comprehensive view of the interior of the house. The parterre, its somewhat comfortless seats rising as on iron stilts as they recede row by row from the proscenium, was packed, while since the aristocratic world had not yet left town, the boxes, piled tier above tier, without break of dress circle or gallery right up to the lofty roof, were well filled. And it was the effect of these last that affected Richard oddly, displeasingly, as, helped by Powell and Andrews, the first footman who acted as his table steward on board the reprieve, he made his way slowly down to the chair placed on the left at the front of the box for the accepted aspects and relations of things seen were remote to him. He perceived effects, shapes and associations of colour divorced from their habitual significance. It was as though he looked at the written characters of a language unknown to him, observing the form of them but attaching no intelligible meaning to that form. And so it happened that those many superimposed tiers of boxes were to him as the waxen cells of a gigantic honeycomb, against the angular darknesses of which little figures seen to the waist took the light, the blonde face, neck and arms of some woman, the fair colours of her dress, and they showed up with perplexing insistence. For they were all peopled, these cells of the honeycomb, and so it seemed to him, with larvae, bright-hued, unworking, indolent, and full-fed. Down there upon the parterre, in the close-packed ranks of students, of men and women of the middle class, soberly attired in walking costume, he recognised the working bees of this giant hive. By their unremitting labour, the dainty waxen cells were actually built up, and those larvae were so amply, so luxuriously fed. And the working bees, oh, there were so many, so very many of them. What if they became mutinous, rebelled against labour, plundered and destroyed the indolent, succulent larvae, of which he, yes, he, Richard Carmody, was unquestionably and conspicuously one? He leaned back in his chair, pulled forward the velvet drapery so as to shut out the view of the house, and fixed his eyes upon the heads of the musicians in the orchestra. The overture was nearly over. The curtain would soon go up. Then he observed that Powell still stood near him. The man was strangely officious today, he thought. Could that be connected in any way with the fact that he'd had his hair cut? For a moment the notion appeared to Dicky quite extravagantly amusing. But he kept his amusement, as so much else, to himself. And again the working bees down in the parterre attracted his attention. They were buzzing, buzzing angrily, displeased with the full-fed larvae in the boxes, because these last were altogether too social, talked too loud and too continuously, drowning the softer passages of the overture. Those dull-coloured insects had expended store of hard-earned leery upon the queer seats they occupied, mounted as upon iron stilts. 
they meant to have the whole of that which they had paid for and hear every note if they swarmed now swarmed upward clung along the edges of those many tiers of boxes punished inconsiderate insolence with stings it would hardly be unjust but there was powell still clad in sober garments he belonged to the working bees and richard became aware of a singular diffidence and embarrassment in thinking of that if they should swarm those workers he would rather the valet did not see it somehow he was a good fellow a faithful servant a man of nice feeling and such an incident would place him in an awkward position he ought to be spared that carefully dicky reasoned it all out uh, you need not stay here any longer powell he said uh, when shall i return sir the curtain went up a roll of drums a chorus of men's voices somewhat truculent in the drinking song at the end of the performance of course but the valet hesitated oh, you might require to send some message sir richard stared at the chorus the opera being performed but this once economy prevailed costumiers had ransacked their stock for discovery of garments not unpardonably inappropriate the result showed a fine superiority to details of time and place one spanish bandit a portly basso figured in a surprising variety of highland dress designed and that locally for a chieftain in the opera of lucia de lammermoor his acquaintance with the eccentricities of a kilt being of the slightest consequences ensued broadly humorous again dicky experienced great amusement but that message had he really one to send Oh, probably he had he couldn't remember and this annoyed him possibly he might remember later he turned to powell forgetting his amusement forgetting the two intimate personal revelations of the unhappy basso oh yes well come back at the end of the second act then he said if the bees swarmed it would be over by that time he supposed so powell's return wouldn't matter much one way or the other a persuasion of something momentous about to be accomplished deepened in him the madness of going which had so pushed him earlier in the day fell dead before it for this concourse of living creatures must be gathered together to witness some event commensurate in importance with the greatness of their number he felt sure of that yes before long they would swarm incontestably they would swarm again he drew aside the velvet drapery and looked down curiously upon the arena and its occupants for a new idea had come to him regarding these last they still presented the effect of a throng of busy angry insects but richard knew better he had penetrated their disguise a disguise assumed to ensure their ultimate purpose with the greater certainty he knew them to be human he knew their purpose to be a moral one and looking upon them recognizing the spirit which animated them he was taken with a reverence and sympathy for average toiling humanity unfelt by him before for he saw that by these the workers the final issues are inevitably decided by these the final verdict is pronounced individually they may be contemptible but in their corporate intelligence corporate strength they are little short of majestic of art letters practical civilization even religion even in a degree nature herself they are alike architects and judges it must be so it always has been so time out of mind in point of fact and then he wondered why they were so patient of constraint why had they not risen long ago and obliterated the pretensions of those arrogant indolent larvae peopling the angular apertures of the honey cells those larvae of whom by birth and wealth sinfulness and uselessness he was himself so conspicuous an example but then still clearer understanding of this whole strange matter came to him they like all else mighty though they are in their corporate intention are obedient to fate 
they can only act when the time is ripe. And then he understood yet more clearly. Their purpose in congregating here, whether they were conscious of it or not, was retributive. They were present to witness and to accomplish an act of foreordained justice. Richard paused a moment, struggling with his own thought, and then he saw quite plainly that he himself was the object of that act of foreordained justice. He himself was the centre of that dimly apprehended approaching event. His punishment, his deliverance by means of that punishment, was that which had brought this great multitude together here to-night. He was awed, and yet with that awe came thankfulness and gratitude, an immense sense of relief. He need not seek self-obliteration, losing himself in far-away tropic islands or the ice-bound regions of the uttermost south. He could stay here, sit quite still even, and that was well, for he was horribly tired and spent. He need only wait. When the time was ripe, they would do all the rest, do it for him by doing it to him. How finely simple it all was! Incidentally, he wondered if it would hurt very much. Oh, not that it mattered, for beyond lay peace. Only he hoped they would get to work pretty soon, so that it might be over before the end of the second act, when Powell, the valet, would come back. Richard's face had grown very youthful and eager. His eyes were unnaturally bright. And still he gazed down at that great company. His heart went out to it. He loved it, loved each and every member of it, as he had never conceived of loving heretofore. He would like to have gone down among them and become part of them, one with them in purpose, a partaker of their corporate strength. But that was forbidden. They were his preordained executioners. Yet in that capacity they were not the less, but the more lovable. They were welcome to exact full justice. He longed after them, longed after the pain it was their mission to inflict. And they were getting ready. Surely they were getting ready. There was a sensible movement among them. They turned pale faces away from the brilliantly lighted stage and towards the great horseshoe of waxen cells enclosing them. They were busy, dull-coloured insects again, and they buzzed. Resentfully, angrily, they buzzed. Yet even while Dicky noted all this, greatly moved by it, appreciating its inner meaning, its profound relation to himself and the drama of his own existence, he was not wholly unmindful of the progress of the opera and the charm of the graceful and fluent music which saluted his ears. He was aware of the entrance of the hero, of his greeting by his motley-clad followers. He felt kindly, just off the surface of his emotions, so to speak, towards this impersonator of Ernani. The young actor's appearance was attractive, his voice fresh and sympathetic, his bearing modest. But the aristocratic occupants of the boxes treated him cavalierly. The famous Milanese tenor, whose name was on the programme, having failed to arrive, this local and comparatively inexperienced artist had been called upon to fill his part. Therefore, the smart world talked more loudly than before, while the democratic occupants of the parterre, jealous for the reputation of their fellow citizen, broke forth in stormy protest. And Richard could have found it in his heart to protest also. For it was a waste of energy, this senseless conflict. It was unworthy of the dignity of that dull-coloured multitude on whom his hopes were so strangely set, of the men in whose hands are the final rewards and punishments, by whose voice the final judgment is pronounced. It pained him to see these ministers of the eternal justice thus led away by trivial happenings, and their attention distracted from the main issue. For what in God's name did he and his sentimental love carolings amount to, this pretty fellow of a player, this fictitious hero of the modern Neapolitan operatic stage? Weighed in the balances, he and his whole occupation and calling were lighter, surely, than vanity itself. 
rightly considered, he and his singing were but as a spangle, as some glittering trifle of tinsel upon the veil still hiding the awful yet benign countenance of that tremendous and so surely approaching event. Let him sing away, then, sing in peace, for the sound of his singing might help to lighten the weariness of the hours until the supreme hour should strike, and the glittering veil be torn asunder, and the countenance it covered be at last and wholly revealed. Reasoning thus, Richard raised his opera glasses and swept those many superimposed ranges of waxen cells, and the aspect of them was to him very sinister, for everywhere he seemed to encounter soft, voluptuous, brainless faces, violences of hot colour and costly clothing, cunningly devised to heighten the physical allurements of womanhood. Everywhere, beside and behind these, he seemed to encounter the faces of men, gluttonous of pleasure, hungering for those generously discovered material charms. They were veritable antechambers of vice, those angular-mouthed waxen cells. And therefore, very fittingly, as he reflected, he had his place in one of them, since he was infected by the vices, active partaker in the sensuality of his class. Oh, that the bees would swarm, swarm and make short work of it all, inflict completeness of punishment, and thereby cleanse him and set him free. In its intensity, his longing came near taking the form of articulate prayer. And then his thought shifted once more, attaching itself curiously, speculatively, to individual objects. For his survey of the house had just now brought a box into view, situated on the grand tier and almost immediately opposite his own. It was occupied by a party of six persons, with four of those persons Richard was aware he had nothing to do, but with the remaining two persons, a woman fashioned as it appeared of ivory and gold, and a young man standing almost directly behind her, he had much, everything in fact, to do. It was incomprehensible to him that he had not observed these two persons sooner, since they were as necessary to the accomplishment of that terrible yet beneficent approaching event as he himself was. The woman he knew, actually and intimately, though as yet he could give her no name, nor recall in what his knowledge of her consisted. The young man he knew inferentially, and Dicky was sensible of regarding him with instinctive repulsion since his appearance presented a living and grossly ribald caricature of a figure august, worshipful and holy. Long and closely Richard studied these two persons, studied them, forgetful of all else, straining his memory to place them, and all the while they talked. But at last the woman fashioned of ivory and gold ceased talking. She folded her arms upon the velvet cushion of the front of the box and gazed right out into the theatre. There was a splendid arrogance in the pose of her head and in the droop of her eyelids. Then she looked up and across, straight at Richard. He saw her drooping eyelids raised, her eyes open wide and remain fixed as in amazement. A something alert and very fierce came into her expression, she seemed to think carefully for a brief space. She threw back her head, and he saw uncontrollable laughter convulse her beautiful throat, and at that same moment a mighty outburst of applause and of welcome shook the great theatre from floor to ceiling, and as it died away, the voice of the famous soprano, rich and compelling as of old, swelled out and made vibrant with passionate sweetness the whole atmosphere and Richard hailed that glorious voice, not that in itself it moved him greatly, but because in it he recognised the beginning of the end. It came as prelude to catastrophe, which was also salvation. Very soon the bees would swarm now. He rallied his patience. He had not much longer to wait. Meanwhile, he looked back at that box on the grand tier, striving to unriddle the mystery of his knowledge of those two persons. He needed glasses no longer. 
his sight had become preternaturally keen. Again the two were talking, and about him that was somehow evident. And as they talked, he beheld a being, exquisitely formed, perfect in every part, step forth from between the lips of the woman fashioned of ivory and gold. It knelt upon one knee. Over the heads of the vast, dull-coloured multitude of workers, those witnesses of and participators in the execution of eternal justice, it gazed at him, Richard Carmody, and at him alone, and its gaze enfolded and held him like an embrace. It wooed him, extending its arms in invitation. It was naked and unashamed. It was black black as the reeking liquid lanes beneath the hulls of the many ships over which the screaming gulls circled seeking foul provender down in Naples harbour. And he knew the fair woman it came forth from for Helen de Valorbe herself in her crocus yellow gown sewn with seed pearls. And he knew it for the immortal soul of her and he perceived moreover as it smiled on and beckoned him with lascivious gestures that its hands and its lips were bloody, since it had broken the hearts of living women and torn and devoured the honour of living men. Enani, enani, in volami. Still the air was vibrant with that glorious voice. But the love of which it was the exponent, the flight which it counselled, had ceased to Richard's hearing to bear relation to that which is earthly, concrete, and of the senses, the passion and promise of it were alike turned to nobler and more permanent uses, presaging the quick coming of expiation and of reconciliation contained in that supreme event. For he knew that in a little moment Helen must arise and follow the soul which had gone forth from her, the soul of which in all its admirable perfection of outward form and blackness of intimate lies and lust was close to him, though he no longer actually beheld it, here beside him, laying subtle siege to him even yet. Where it went, there of necessity she who owned it must shortly follow, since soul and body cannot remain apart save for the briefest space until death effect their final divorce. Therefore Helen would come speedily. It could not be otherwise, or oh, so at least he argued, and her coming meant the culmination. Then, time being fully ripe, the bees would swarm, swarm at last, labour revenging itself upon sloth, hunger upon gluttony, want upon wealth, obscurity upon privilege, justice being thus meted out, and he, Richard, cleansed and delivered from the disgrace of deformity now so hideously infecting both his spirit and his flesh. Of this he was so well assured that disregarding the felt though unseen presence of that errant soul, disdaining to do battle with it, he leaned forward once more, looking down into the close-packed arena of the great theatre. All those brilliant figures, members of his own class, here present, were matter of indifference to him. In this moment of conscious and supreme farewell, it was to the dull-coloured multitude he turned. They still moved him to sympathy. Unconsciously, they had enlightened him concerning matters of infinite moment. At their hands, he would receive penance and absolution. Before they dealt more closely with him, since that dealing must involve suffering which might temporarily cloud his friendship for them, he wanted to bid them farewell and assure them of his conviction of the righteousness of their corporate action. So, silently, he blessed them, taking leave of them in peace. Then he found there were other farewells to be said, farewell to earthly life as he had known it, the struggle and very frequent anguish of it, its many frustrated purposes, fair illusions and unfulfilled hopes. He must bid farewell, moreover, to art as he had relished it, to learning as he had all too intermittently pursued it, to travel as he had found solace in it, to the inexhaustible interest, the inextinguishable humour and pathos, in brief, of things seen. 
and reviewing all this, a profound nostalgia of all those minor happinesses which are the natural inheritance of the average man, arose in him. Happiness of healthy, light-hearted activities, not only of the athlete and the fighting man, but of the playing field and the ballroom and the river, happinesses to him inevitably denied. With an almost boyish passion of longing, he cried out for these just for one day to have lived with the ease and freedom with which the vast majority of men habitually live, just for one day to have been neither dwarf nor cripple, but to have taken his place and his chance with the rest, before it was all over and the tale told. But very soon Richard put these thoughts from him, deeming it unworthy to dwell upon them at this juncture, the call was to go forward, not to go back. So he settled himself in his chair once more, pulling the velvet drapery forward so as to shut out the sight of the house. Bitterness should have no part in him. When that happened, which was appointed to happen, it must find him not only acquiescent, but serene and undisturbed. He composed himself, therefore, with a decent and even lofty pride. Then he turned his eyes upon the narrow door, there in the semi-obscurity of the back of the box, and waited. And all the while, royally, triumphantly, Moribita sang. During that period of waiting, whether in itself brief or prolonged he knew not, sensation and thought alike were curiously in abeyance. Richard neither slept nor woke. He knew that he existed, but all active relation to being had ceased, and it was with painful effort he in a measure returned to more ordinary correspondence with fact, aroused by the sound of low-toned emphatic speech close at hand, and by a scratching as of some animal denied and seeking admittance. Then he perceived that the door yielded, letting in a spread of yellow brightness from the corridor, and in the midst of that brightness part and parcel of it thanks to the lustre of her crocus yellow dress her honey-coloured hair her fair skin and softly gleaming ornaments stood helen de valorb behind her momentarily richard caught sight of the young man whose face had impressed him as a ribald travesty of that of some being altogether worshipful and holy the face peered at him with, as it seemed, malicious curiosity over the rounded shoulder of the woman of ivory and gold. The effect was very hateful, and with a sense of thankfulness Richard saw Helen close the door and come alone down the two steps leading from the back of the box. As she passed from the dimness into the clearer light, he watched her, quiescent yet with absorbing interest, for he perceived that the hands of the clock had been put back somehow. Intervening years and the many events of them had ceased to obtain, so that of all the many Helens, enchanting or evil, whom he had come to know, he saw now only one, and that the first and earliest. A little dancer, with blush roses in her hat, dainty as a toy, finished to her rosy fingertips and the toes of her pretty shoes, merry and merciless as she had pirouetted round him mocking his shuffling uncertain progress across the chapel room at brockhurst fifteen years ago ah oh, so you have come back he exclaimed almost involuntarily madame de valorbe pushed a chair from the front of the box into the shadow of the velvet draperies beside richard it is unnecessary that all naples should take part in our interview she said she sat down, turning to him, leaning a little towards him. "'You do not deserve that I should come back, you know, Dickie,' she continued. "'You both deserted and deceived me. "'That's hardly chivalrous, hardly just indeed, after taking all a woman has to give. "'You led me to suppose you had departed for good and all. "'Why should you deceive me?' Well, "'The yacht was not ready for sea,' Richard said simply. "'Then you might in common charity have let me know that. "'You were bound to give me an opportunity of speaking to you once again, I think.' "'In his present state of detachment from all worldly considerations, "'absolute truthfulness compelled Richard. 
the event was so certain the swarming of the bees so very near that small diplomacies and small evasions seemed absurdly out of place i didn't want to hear you speak he said but doesn't it strike you that was rather dastardly in face of what had taken place between us do you know that you appear in a new and far from becoming light denial seemed to richard futile he remained silent for a moment helen looked towards the stage when she spoke again it was as with reluctance i was desperately unhappy i went all over the villa in the vain hope of finding you i went back to that room of yours in which we parted i wanted to see it again helen paused her speech was low-toned soft as milk it was rather dreadful dicky for the place was all in disarray littered with signs of your hasty departure damp and cheerless the rain beating against the windows and i hate rain i found there not you whom i so sorely wanted but something very much else a letter to you from de Valorbe. once more she paused i excuse you of anything worse than negligence in omitting to destroy it misery knows no law and i was miserable i read it richard had listened with the same detachment yet the same absorbed interest with which he had watched her entrance she was a wonderful creature in her adroitness in her handling of means to serve her own ends but he could not pay her back in her own coin the time was too short for anything but simple truth he felt strangely tired these reiterated delays became harassing if the bees would swarm only swarm then it would be over and he could sleep he clasped his hands behind his head and looked at madame de valorbe her soul kneeled on her lap its delicate arms were clasped about her neck black against the lustrous white of her skin and all those twisted ropes of seed pearls it pressed its breasts against hers amorously it loved her and she it and he understood that in the whole scope of nature there was but it alone it only that she ever had loved or did or could love and understanding this he was filled with a great compassion for her and answering her his expression was gentle and pitiful still he needs must speak the truth perhaps it was as well that you should read luigi's letter he said she turned upon him fiercely and scornfully yet even as she did so her soul fell to beckoning him soliciting him with evilly alluring gestures my congratulations to you she exclaimed upon your praiseworthy candour i am to gather then that you believe that which my husband advises himself to tell you under the circumstances it is exceedingly convenient to you to do so no doubt how can i avoid believing it richard asked quite sweet-temperedly surely we need not waste the little time which remains in argument as to that you must admit helen that luigi's letter fits in it supplies just the piece of the puzzle which was missing it tallies with all the rest all the rest uh, yes it is part of the whole precisely that part both of you and of naples which i knew and tried so hard not to know from the first but it's worse than useless to practise such refusals the whole and nothing less than the whole is bound to get one in the end it is contrary to the nature of things that any integral portion of the whole should submit to permanent denial richard's voice deepened he spoke with a subdued enthusiasm thinking of the dull-coloured multitude there in the arena and the act of retributive justice on the eve by them of accomplishment it seems to me the radical weakness of all human institutions of all systems of thought resides in exactly that effort to select and reject to exalt one part as against another part and so build not upon the rock of unity and completeness but upon the sand of partiality and division 
and sooner or later the whole revenges itself and the fine fanciful fabric crumbles to ruin just for the lack of that which in our short-sighted over-niceness we have taken such mighty great pains to miss out this has happened times out of number in respect of religions and philosophies and the constitution of kingdoms and in that of fair romances which promised to stand firm to all eternity and now now in these last few days since laws which rule the general also rule the individual life it has happened in respect of you helen to my seeing and in respect of naples richard smiled upon her sadly and very sweetly i am sorry he said yes indeed horribly sorry it is a bitter thing to see the last of one's gods go overboard but there is no remedy sorry or not so it is madame de valorbe looked at him keenly her attitude was strained her face sombre with thought my god my god she exclaimed that i should sit and listen to all this and yet you were never more attractive there's an unnatural force unnatural beauty about you you're ill richard you look and you speak as a man might who was about to join hands with death but dicky's attention had wandered again he pulled the velvet drapery aside somewhat and gazed down into the crowded house they lingered strangely in the performance of their mission that dull-coloured multitude of workers just then came another mighty outburst of applause cries vivas the famous soprano's name called aloud the sound was stimulating as the shout of a victorious army richard hailed it as a sign of speedy deliverance and sank back into his place oh yes he said civilly and lightly i fancy i am pretty bad i'm a bit sick of this continued delay you see i suppose they know their own business best but they do seem most infernally slow in getting under way i was ready hours ago however they must be nearly through with preliminaries now and when once we're fairly into it i shall be all right you mean when the yacht sails madame de valorbe asked still she looked at him intently he turned to her smiling and she observed that his eyes had ceased to be as windows opening back onto an empty space they were luminous with a certain gay content <laughs> yes of course when the yacht sails if you like to put it that way he answered and when will that be the shout of the arena grew louder in the recall it surged up to the roof and quivered along the lath and plaster partitions of the boxes oh very soon now immediately i think please god he said but why should she make him speak thus foolishly in riddles of a surety she must read the signs of the approach of that momentous and beneficent event as clearly as he himself was she not equally with himself involved in it was she not like himself to be cleansed and set free by it therefore it came as a painful bewilderment and shock to him when she drew closer to him leaned forward and laid her hand lightly upon his thigh richard she said very softly i forgive all i am not satisfied with loving i will come with you i will stay with you i will be faithful to you yes yes even that your loving is quite unlike any other it is unique as you yourself are unique i want more of it oh but you must know that it's too late to go back on that now he said reasoning with her greatly perplexed and distressed by her determined ignoring of to him self-evident fact all that side of things for us is over and done with her lips parted in naughty laughter and then not without a shrinking of quick horror richard beheld the soul of her that being of lovely proportions exquisitely formed in every part yet black as the foul liquid lanes between the hulls of the many ships in naples harbour step delicately in between those parted lips returning whence it came 
and beholding this, instinctively he raised her hand from where it rested upon his thigh and put it from him, put it upon her glistering crocus-yellow lap, where her soul had so lately kneeled. "'Let us say no more, Helen,' he entreated, "'lest we both forfeit our remaining chance and become involved in hopeless and final condemnation.' But Madame de Valorbe's anger rose to overwhelming height. She slapped her hands together. "'Oh, you despise me!' she cried. "'But let me assure you that in any case this assumption of virtue becomes you singularly ill. It really is a little bit too cheap, a work of supererogation in the matter of hypocrisy. Have the courage of your vices. Be honest. You can be so to the point of insult when it serves your purpose.' Own that you are capricious. Own that you have lighted upon some woman who provokes your appetite more than I do. I have been too tender of you, too lenient with you. I have loved too much and been weakly desirous to please. Own that you are tired of me, that you no longer care for me. And he answered sadly enough, Yes, that last is true. Having seen the whole... That has happened which I always dreaded might happen. The last of my self-made gods has indeed gone overboard. I care for you no longer. Helen sprang up from her chair, ran to the door and flung it open. The first act of the opera was concluded. The curtain had come down. The house below and around, the corridor without, were full of confused noise and movement. Paul, Monsieur Destonel, come here! she cried, and at once. But Richard was more than ever tired. The strain of waiting had been too prolonged. Lights, draperies, figures, the crowded arena, the vast honeycomb of boxes, tier above tier, swam before his eyes, blurred, indistinct and vague, shifting, colossal in height and giddy in depth. The bees were swarming, at last, swarming upward through seas of iridescent mist. But he had no longer empire over his own attitude and thoughts. He had hoped to meet the supreme moment in full consciousness, with clear vision and thankfulness of heart. But he was too tired to do so, tired in brain and body alike. And so it happened that a dogged endurance grew on him, simply a setting of the teeth and bracing of himself to suffer silently even stupidly all that might be in store for the bees were close upon him now countless in number angry grudging and violent but they no longer appeared as insects they were human save for their velvet-like expressionless eyes and all those eyes were fixed upon him and him alone he was the centre towards which in thought and action all turned nor were the dull-coloured occupants of the parterre alone in their attack for those gay-coloured larvae the men and women of his own class indolent licentious and full-fed hung out of the angular mouths of the waxen cells above the crimson and gold of their cushions pointing at him claiming and yet denouncing him and in the attitude of these, the democratic and the aristocratic sections, he detected a difference. The former swarmed to inflict punishment for his selfishness and uselessness and sensuality, but the latter jeered and mocked at his bodily infirmity, deriding his deformity, making merry over his shortened limbs and shuffling walk. And against this background, against this all-enclosing tapestry of faces which encircled him, two persons and the atmosphere and aroma of them so to speak were clearly defined they were close to him here within the narrow limits of the opera box then a great humiliation overtook richard perceiving that they and not the people the workers august in their corporate power and strength were to be his executioners no no he wasn't worth that and for all his present dullness of sensation, a sob rose in his throat. Madame de Valorbe, resplendent in crocus yellow brocade, costly lace and seed pearls, the young man, her companion, 
the young man of the light forked beard domed skull vain eyes and peevish mouth the young man of holy and dissolute aspect were good enough instruments for the eternal justice to employ in respect of him richard calmady look monsieur d'estournel helen said very quietly this is my cousin of whom i have already spoken to you but i wish to spare him if possible and give him room for self-justification so i did not tell you all richard this is my friend monsieur d'estournel to whom my honour and happiness are not wholly indifferent dicky looked up he did not speak vaguely he prayed it might all soon be over paul d'estournel looked down he raised his eyeglass and bowed himself examining richard's mutilated legs and strangely shod feet he broke into a little bleating goat-like laugh oh mais c'est étonnant he observed reflectively i was in his house helen continued i was there unprotected having absolute faith in his loyalty she paused a moment he seduced me richard can you deny that can i monsieur d'estournel murmured he drew a pair of gloves through his hands holding them by the fingertips the metal buttons of them were large three on each wrist these gloves arrested richard's attention oddly i do not deny it dicky said and having thus outraged he deserted me do you deny that no dicky said again for it was true that which she asserted true though penetrated by subtle falsehood impossible as it seemed to him to combat no i do not deny it you hear helen exclaimed now do what you think fit still d'estournel drew the gloves through his hands holding them by the fingertips under other circumstances i might feel myself compelled to do you the honour of sending you a challenge monsieur he said but a man of sensibility like myself cannot do such violence to his moral and artistic code as to fight with an outcast of nature an abortion such as yourself the sword and the pistol i necessarily reserve for my equals the deformed person the cripple whose very existence is an offence to the eye and to every delicacy of sense must be condescended to and if chastised at all must be chastised without ceremony chastise as one would chastise a dog and with that he struck richard again and again across the face with those metal buttoned gloves mad with rage blinded and sick with pain dicky essayed to fling himself upon his assailant but d'estournel was too adroit for him he skipped aside with his little bleating goat-like laugh and richard fell heavily full length his forehead coming in contact with the lower step of the descent from the back of the box he lay there too weak to raise himself paul d'estournel bent down and again examined him curiously c'est étonnant he repeated he gave the prostrate body a contemptuous kick dear madame are you sufficiently avenged is it enough he inquired sneeringly and vaguely as from some incalculable distance richard heard helen de valorbe's voice yes it is a little affair of honour which dates from my childhood it has taken many years in adjusting i thank you mon cher a thousand times now let us go quickly it is enough then came darkness silence and rest end of chapter 11 end of book 5book 6 chapter 1 of the history of sir richard calmady this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book 6. The New Heaven and the New Earth. Chapter 1. 
in which Miss St. Quentin bears witness to the faith that is in her. Honoria divested herself of her travelling cap, thrust her hands into the pockets of her frieze ulster, and thus, bareheaded, a tall, supple, solitary figure, paced the railway platform in the dusk. Above the gentle undulations of the western horizon, splendours of rose-crimson sunset were outspread, veiled as they flamed upward by indigo cloud of the texture and tenuity of finer scores. And those same rose-crimson splendours found repetition upon the narrow, polished surface of the many lines of rails, causing them to stand out as though of red-hot metal from the undeterminate grey drab of the track where it curved away southeastward across the darkening country towards the Savoy Alps. And from out the fastnesses of these last, quick with the bleak purity of snow, came a breathing of evening wind. To Honoria it brought refreshing emphasis of silence and of immunity from things human and things mechanical. It spoke to her of virgin and unvisited spaces, ignorant of mankind and of obligation to his so many and so insistent needs. And there being in Honoria herself a kindred defiance of subjection, a determination, so to speak, of physical and emotional chastity, she welcomed these intimations of the essential inviolability of nature, finding in them justification and support of her own mental attitude, of the entire wisdom of which she had, it must be owned, grown slightly suspicious of late. And this was the more grateful to her, not only as contrast to the noise and dust of a lengthy and hurriedly undertaken journey, but because that same journey had been suddenly, and in a sense violently, imposed upon one whom she held in highest regard, by another whom she had long since agreed with herself to hold in no sort of regard at all. Since the highly regarded one set forth, she, Honoria, of course set forth likewise, and yet in good truth the whole affair rubbed her not a little the wrong way. She recognised in it a particularly flagrant example of masculine aggression. Some persons, as she reflected, are permitted an amount of elbow room altogether disproportionate to their deserts. Be sufficiently selfish, sufficiently odious, and everybody becomes your humble servant, hat in hand. That is unfair. It is indeed quite extensively exasperating to the dispassionate onlooker. And in Miss St. Quentin's case, exasperation was by no means lessened by the fact that candour compelled her to admit doubt not only as to the actuality of her own dispassionateness, but as has already been stated, to the wisdom of her mental attitude generally. She wanted to think and feel one way. She was more than half afraid that she was much disposed to think and feel quite another way. This was worrying. And therefore it came about that Honoria hailed the present interval of silence and solitude, striving to put from her remembrance both the origin and object of her journey, while filling her lungs with the snow-fed purity of the mountain wind, and yielding her spirit to the somewhat serious influences of surrounding nature. All too soon the great Paris Express would thunder into the station, the heavy horse-box-like sleeping car, now standing on the Coulos Geneva Baal siding, would be coupled to the rear of it. Then the roar and rush would begin again, from dark to dawn and on through the long bright hours to dark once more, by mountain gorge and stifling tunnel and broken woodland and smiling coastline and fertile plain past Chambéry and Turin and Bologna and mighty Rome herself, until the journey was ended and distant Naples reached at last. But Miss St. Quentin's communings with nature were destined to speedy interruption. Ludovic Quayle's elongated person, clothed to the heels in a check travelling coat, detached itself from the company of waiting passengers and blue linen-clad porters upon the central platform before the main block of station buildings, and made its light and active way across the intervening lines of crimson-stained metals. "'If I'm a nuisance, mention that chastening fact without hesitation,' 
he said, standing on the railway track and looking up at her with his air of very urbane intelligence. "'Present circumstances permit us the privilege, or otherwise, of laying aside restraints of speech, along with other small proprieties of behaviour commonly observed by the polite. So don't spare my feelings, dear Miss St. Quentin. If I'm a bore, tell me so, and I will return.' and that without any lurking venom in my breast, whence I came. "'Oh, do anything you please,' Honoria replied, "'except be run over by the Paris train.' Oh, "'The Paris train, so I have just learned, is an hour late. Consequently, its arrival hardly enters into the question. But since you are graciously pleased to bid me do as I like, I stay,' Mr. Quayle returned, stepping on to the platform and turning to pace beside her. What a jail delivery it is to get into the open! That last engine of ours threw ashes to a truly penitential extent. My mouth and throat still claim unpleasantly close relation to a neglected kitchen grate. And if our much-vaunted wagon-lit is the last word of civilization in connection with travel, then all I can say is that in my humble opinion civilization has yet a most exceedingly long way to go. It really is a miraculously uncomfortable vehicle. And how Lady Carmody contrives to endure its eccentricities of climate and of motion, I'm sure I don't know. In her case, the end would make any sort of means supportable, Honoria answered. Her pacings had brought her to the extreme end of the platform, where it sloped to the level of the track. She stood there a moment, her head thrown back, snuffing the wind as a hind-breaking covert stands and snuffs it. A spirit of questioning possessed her, though not, as in the hind's case, of things concrete and material. It is true she could have dispensed with Mr. Quayle's society. She did not want him. But he had shown himself so full of resource, so considerate and helpful, ever since the news of Sir Richard Carmody's desperate state had broken up the peace of the little party at Ormiston Castle, now five days ago, that she forgave him even his preciousness of speech, even his slightly irritating superiority of manner. She had ceased to be on her guard with him during these days of travel, had come to take his presence for granted, and to treat him with the comfortable indifference of honest good fellowship. So it followed that now, speaking with him, she continued to follow out her existing train of thought. "'I'm by no means off my head about poor Dicky Carmody,' she said presently, "'especially where Cousin Catherine is concerned. "'I couldn't go on caring about anybody, irrespective of their conduct, just because they were they. "'And yet I can't help seeing it must be tremendously satisfying to feel like that.' "'A thousand pardons,' Ludovic murmured. "'But like what?' "'Why, as Cousin Catherine feels, just wholeheartedly, without analysis and without alloy, to feel that no distance, no fatigue, no nothing in short matters, so long as she gets to him in time. I don't approve of such a state of mind, and yet—' Honoria wheeled round, facing the glory of colour dying all the west. And yet I'm untrue enough to my own principles rather to envy it. She sighed, and that sigh her companion noted and filed for reference. Indeed, an unusually expansive cheerfulness became perceptible in Mr. Quayle. Oh, by the by, is there any further news? she inquired. General Ormiston has just had a telegram. Anything fresh? Still unconscious, strength fairly maintained. Oh, we know that by heart, Honoria said. We do, and we know the consequences of it, the sweet little seesaw of hope and fear, productive of unlimited discussion and anxiety. No weak letting one stand at ease about that telegram. It keeps one's nose hard down on the grindstone. Oh, if he dies, Honoria said slowly, if he dies, oh, poor dear Cousin Catherine, when can we hear again? At Turin, Mr. Quayle replied. Then they both fell silent until the far end of the platform was reached. 
and there once more Honoria paused, her small head carried high, her serious eyes fixed upon the sunset. The rosy light falling upon her failed to disguise the paleness of her face or its slight angularity of line. She was a little worn and travel-stained, a little dishevelled even, yet to her companion she had rarely appeared more charming. She might be tired, she might even be somewhat untidy, but her innate distinction remained, nay, gained, so he judged, by suggestion of rough usage endured. Her absolute absence of affectation, her unself-consciousness, her indifference to adventitious prettiness of toilet, her transparent sincerity, were very entirely approved by Ludovic Quayle. Yes, that seesaw of hope and fear must be an awful ordeal, feeling as she does, Miss St. Quentin said presently. And yet, even so, I am uncertain. I can't help wondering which really is best. Again, a thousand pardons, the young man put in, but I venture to remind you that I was not cradled in the forecourt of the Temple of the Pythian Apollo but only in the nursery of a conspicuously philistine English country house. For the first time during their conversation, Honoria looked full at him. Her glance was very friendly, yet it remained meditative, even a trifle sad. Oh, I know I'm fearfully inconsequent, she said, but my head is simply rattled to pieces by that beastly wagon lit I had gone back to what I was thinking about before you joined me, and to what we were saying just now about Cousin Catherine. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, Ludovic put in tentatively. She was going to give herself away, he was sure of it, and such giving away might make for opportunity. In spirit, the young man proceeded to take his shoes from off his feet. The ground on which he stood might prove to be holy. Moreover, Miss St. Quentin's direct acts of self-revelation were few and far between. He was horribly afraid those same shoes of his might creak, so to speak, thereby startling her into watchfulness, making her draw back. But Honoria did not draw back. She was too much absorbed by her own thought. She continued to contemplate the glory of the flaming West, her expression touched by a grave and noble enthusiasm. I suppose one can't help worrying a little at times. It's laid hold of me very much during the last month or two as to what is really the finest way to take life. One wants to arrive at that fairly early, not by a process of involuntary elimination on the burnt child fears the fire sort of principle, when the show's more than half over, as so many people do. One wants to get hold of the stick by the right end now, while one's still comparatively young, and then work straight along. I want my reason to be the backbone of my action, don't you know, instead of merely the push of society and friendship and superficial odds and ends of so-called obligation to other people. Ah, oh, yes, Mr Quayle put in again. Now it seems to me that, Honoria extended one hand towards the sunset, is Cousin Catherine's outlook on life and humanity, full of colour, full of warmth. It burns with a certain prodigality of beauty, a superb absence of economy in giving. And that, with a little shrug of her shoulders, she turned towards the severe and sombre eastern landscape, that, it strikes me, comes a good deal nearer my own. Which is best? Mr. Quayle congratulated himself upon the removal of his shoes. The ground was holy, holy to the point of embarrassment even to so unabashable and ready-tongued a gentleman as himself. He answered with an unusual degree of diffidence. Well, an indeterminate position is neither wholly inconceivable nor wholly untenable, perhaps. And you occupy it? Oh, yes, you are very neatly balanced. But then, do you really get anywhere? Is that not rather a knavish speech, dear Miss St. Quentin? The young man inquired mildly. I don't know, she answered. I wish to goodness I did. 
now was here god-given opportunity or merely a cunningly devised snare for the taking of the unwary ludovic pondered the matter he gently kicked a little pebble from the dingy grey drab of the asphalt on to the permanent way it struck one of the metals with a sharp click a blue linen-clad porter short of stature and heavy of build lighted the gas lamps along the platform the flame of these wavered at first and flickered showing thin and will-o'-the-wisp like against the great outspread of darkening country across which the wind came with a certain effect of harshness and barrenness the inevitable concomitant of its inherent purity and the said wind treated miss st quentin somewhat discourteously buffeting her and obliging her to put up both hands to push back stray locks of hair also the keen breath of it pierced her making her shiver a little both of which things her companion noting took heart of grace is it permitted to renew a certain petition he asked in a low voice honoria shook her head oh, better not i think she said and yet dear miss st quentin pulverized though i am by the weight of my own unworthiness i protest that petition is not wholly foreign to the question you did me the honour to ask me just now oh dear me you always contrive to bring it round to that she exclaimed not without a hint of petulance oh, far from it the young man returned for a good solid eighteen months now i have displayed the accumulated patience of innumerable asses oh of course i see what you're driving at she continued hastily but it is not original it's just every man's stock argument if it bears the hallmark of hoary antiquity so much the better i entertain a reverence for precedent and honestly as common sense goes i am not ashamed of that of my sex miss st quentin resumed her walk you really think it stands in one's way she said reflectively you really think it a disadvantage to be a woman oh good lord mr quayle ejaculated softly yet with an air so humorously aghast that it could leave no doubt as to the nature of his sentiments then he cursed himself for a fool his shoes indeed had made a mighty creaking he expected an explosion of scornful wrath he admitted he deserved it it did not come miss st quentin looked at him for a moment almost piteously he fancied her mouth quivered and that her eyes filled with tears then she turned and swung away with her long easy even stride mentally the young man took himself by the throat conscience-stricken at having humiliated her at having caused her to fall even momentarily from the height of her serene maidenly dignity for once he became absolutely uncritical careless of appearances he fairly ran after her along the platform oh dear miss st quentin he called to her in tones of most persuasive apology but honoria's moment of piteousness was past she had recovered all her habitual lazy and gallant grace when he came up with her no no she said hear me i began this rather foolish conversation i laid myself open to well to a snubbing i got one anyhow oh in mercy don't rub it in mr quayle murmured contritely oh but i did honoria returned now it's over and i'm going to pick up the pieces and put them back in their places just where they were before oh but i protest i hailed a new combination i discover in myself no wild anxiety to have the pieces put back just where they were before oh yes you do honoria declared at least you certainly will when i explain it to you she paused you see she said it's like this living with and watching cousin catherine i've come to know all that side of things at its very finest oh, forgive me uh, it what may i recall to you the fact of the philistine nursery the young lady's delicate face straightened 
"'You know perfectly well what I mean,' she said. "'That which we all think about so constantly, "'and yet affect to speak of as a joke or a slight impropriety. "'Love, marriage, motherhood.' "'Yes, Lady Carmody is a past master in those arts,' Mr. Quayle replied. "'Again the ground was holy. "'He was conscious his pulse quickened. "'The beauty of it all, as one sees it in her case, "'breaks one up a little. "'There is no laugh left in one about those things. "'One sees that to her they are of the nature of religion, "'a religion pure and undefiled, "'a new way of knowing God "'and of bringing oneself into line "'with the truth as it is in him. "'But having once seen that, "'one can decline upon no lower level. "'One grows ambitious. "'One will have it that way or not at all.' Honoria paused again. The bleak wind buffeted her, but she was no longer troubled or chilled by it. Rather did it brace her to greater fearlessness of resolve and of speech. "'You are contemptuous of women,' she said. "'Oh, I have betrayed characteristics of the ass, other than its patience,' Ludovic lamented. "'Oh, I didn't mean that,' Honoria returned, smiling in friendliest fashion upon him. "'Every man worth the name really feels as you do, I imagine. "'I don't blame you. "'Possibly I am growing a trifle shaky as to feminine superiority "'and woman spelled with a capital letter myself. "'I'm awfully afraid she is safest, for herself and others, "'under slight restraint, in a state of mild subjection. "'She's not quite to be trusted, either intellectually or emotionally. "'At least the majority of her isn't.' If she got her head, I've a dreadful suspicion she'd make a worse hash of creation generally than you men have made of it already. And that... Honoria's eyes narrowed, her upper lip shortened, and her smile shone out again delightfully. That's saying a very great deal, you know. Oh, my spirits rise to giddy heights, Mr. Quayle exclaimed. I endorse those sentiments. But... When so, dear lady, this change of front? Oh, wait a minute. We've not got to the end of my contention yet. Well, the Paris train is late. There is time, and this is all excellent hearing. I'm not quite so sure of that, Honoria said. For, you see, just in proportion as I give up the fiction of her superiority and admit that woman already has her political, domestic and social deserts, I feel a chivalry towards her, poor dear thing, which I never felt before. I even feel a chivalry towards the woman in myself. She claims my pity and my care in a quite new way. So much the better, Mr Quayle observed, outwardly discreetly urbane, inwardly almost riotously jubilant. "'Oh, wait a minute,' she repeated, her tone changed and sobered. "'I don't want to spread myself, but you know I can meet men pretty well on their own ground. I could shoot and fish as well as most of you, only that I don't think it right to take life except to provide food or in self-defence. "'There's not so much happiness going that one's justified in cutting any of it short. "'Even a jack-snipe may have his little affairs of the heart, and a cock-salmon his gamble. "'But I can ride as straight as you can. "'I can break any horse to harness you choose to put me behind. "'I can sail a boat and handle an axe. "'I can turn my hand to most practical things, except a needle.' I own I always have hated a needle worse, well, worse than the devil. <laughs> and I can organise and can speak fairly well and manage business affairs tidily. And have I not even been known, low be it spoken, to beat you at lawn tennis and Lord Shotover at billiards? Oh, and to overthrow my most Socratic father in argument and out with my sister Louisa in diplomacy. Vide our poor, dear Dickie Carmody's broken engagement, and the excellent scatterbrain Dacia's marriage. Oh, but Lady Constance is happy, Honoria put in hastily. Blissful, positively blissful, 
and with twins, too. Think of it. Dacia is blissful also. His sense of humour has deteriorated since his marriage, from constant association with good little Connie, who was never distinguished for ready perception of a joke. He regards those small, simultaneous replicas of himself with unqualified complacency, which shows his appreciation of comedy must be a bit blunted. "'I wonder if it does,' Miss St. Quentin observed reflectively. Whereat Mr. Quayle permitted himself a sound as nearly approaching a chuckle as was possible to so superior a person. Oh, "'A thousand pardons,' he murmured. "'But really, dear lady, you are so very much off on the other tack.' "'Am I?' Miss St. Quentin said. "'Well, you see, to go back to my demonstration, "'I've none of the quarrel with your side of things that most women have, "'because I'm not shut out from it.' and so I don't envy you. I can amuse and interest myself on your lines, and therefore I can afford to be very considerate and tender of the woman in me. I grow more and more resolved that she shall have the very finest going, or that she shall have nothing, in respect of all which belongs to her special province, in regard to love and marriage." In them she shall have what Cousin Catherine has had, and find what Cousin Catherine has found, or all that shall be a shut book to her for ever. Even if discipline and denial make her a little unhappy, poor thing, that's far better than letting her decline upon the second best. Honoria's voice was full and sweet. She spoke from out the deep places of her thought. Her whole aspect was instinct with a calm and seasoned enthusiasm. And looking upon her, it became Ludovic Quayle's turn to find the evening wind somewhat bleak and barren. It struck chill, and he turned away and moved westwards towards the sunset. But the rose-crimson splendours had become faint and frail, while the indigo cloud had gathered into long horizontal lines as of dusky smoke, so that the remaining brightness was seen as through prison bars. A sadness, indeed, seemed to hold the West, even greater than that which held the East, since it was a sadness not of beauty unborn, but of beauty dead. And this struck home to the young man. He did not care to speak. Miss St. Quentin walked beside him in silence for a time. When at last she spoke, it was very gently. "'Please don't be angry with me,' she pleaded. "'I like you so much that oh, that I'd give a great deal "'to be able to think less of my duty to the tiresome woman in me.' "'I would give a great deal, too,' he declared, regardless of grammar. Oh, "'But I'm not the only woman in the world, dear Mr. Quayle,' she protested presently. "'But I, unfortunately, have no use for any other,' he returned." "'Oh, you distress me!' Honoria cried. "'Well, I don't know that you make me superabundantly cheerful,' he answered. Just then the faraway shriek of a locomotive and the dull thunder of an approaching train was heard. Mr Quayle looked once more towards the western horizon. "'Oh, here's the Paris Express,' he said. "'We must be off if we mean to get round before our horse box is shunted.' He jumped down on to the permanent way. Miss St. Quentin followed him, and the two ran helter-skelter across the many lines of metal in the direction of the Coulos Geneva Bale siding. That somewhat childish and undignified proceeding ministered to the restoration of good fellowship. "'Great passions are rare,' Mr. Quayle said, laughing a little. His circulation was agreeably quickened. How surprisingly fast this nymph-like creature could get over the ground, and that gracefully, moreover, rather in the style of a lissom, long-limbed youth than in that of a woman. "'Rare? I know it,' she answered, the words coming short and sharply. "'But I accept the risk. A thousand to one, the book remains shut for ever. "'And I, meanwhile, am not too proud to pass the time of day with the second best.' and take refuge in the accumulated patience of innumerable asses. And behind them the express train thundered into the station. End of chapter 1 of Book 6
Book Six, Chapter Two of the History of Sir Richard Carmody. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book Six, Chapter Two. Telling How Once Again Catherine Carmody Looked on Her Son. The bulletin received at Turin was sufficiently disquieting. Richard had had a relapse. And when at Bologna, just as the train was starting, General Ormiston entered the compartment occupied by the two ladies, there was that in his manner which made Miss St. Quentin lay aside the magazine she was reading, and rising silently from her place opposite Lady Carmody, go out on to the narrow passageway of the long sleeping car. She was very close to the elder woman in the bonds of a dear and intimate friendship, yet hardly close enough, so she judged, to intrude her presence if evil tidings were to be told. A man going into battle might look, so she thought, as Roger Ormiston looked now, very stern and strained. It was more fitting to leave the brother and sister alone together for a little space. At the far end of the passageway the servants were grouped. Clara, comely of face and of person, neat, notwithstanding the demoralisation of feminine attire incident to prolonged travel. Winter, the Brockhurst butler, clean-shaven and grey-headed, suggestive of a distinguished Anglican ecclesiastic in mufti. Miss St. Quentin's lady's maid, Fallstick by name, a North Country woman, angular of person and of bearing, and loyal of heart and Zimmermann, the colossal German-Swiss courier, with his square yellow beard and hair en brosse. An air of discouragement pervaded the party, involving even the polyglot conductor of the wagon lit a small, quick, sandy-complexioned young fellow of uncertain nationality, with a gold band round his peaked cap. He respected this family, which could afford to take a private railway carriage half across Europe, he shared their anxieties, and these were evidently great. Clara wept, the old butler's mouth twitched, and his slightly pendulous cheeks quivered. The door at the extreme end of the car was set wide open. Ludovic Quayle stood upon the little iron balcony, smoking. His feet were planted far apart, yet his tall figure swayed and curtsied queerly as the heavy carriage bumped and rattled across the points. High walls, overtopped by the dark spires of cypresses, overhung by radiant wealth of lilac wisteria, and of roses, red, yellow, and white, reeled away in the keen sunshine to the left and right. Then, clearing the outskirts of the town, the train roared southward across the fair Italian landscape, beneath the pellucid blue vault of the fair Italian sky and to Honoria there was something of heartlessness in all that fair outward prospect. Here, in Italy, the ancient gods reign still, surely, the gods who are careless of human woe. Is there bad news, Winter? she asked. Mr. Bates telegraphed to the general that it would be well her ladyship should be prepared for the worst. Oh, it'll kill my lady, for certain sure it'll kill her. She never could be expected to stand up against that, and just as she was getting round from her own illness so nicely too. Audibly, Clara wept. Her tears so affected the sandy-complexioned polyglot conductor that he retired into his little pantry and made a most unholy clattering among the plates and knives and forks. Honoria put her hand upon the sobbing woman's shoulder and drew her into the comparative privacy of the adjoining compartment, rendered not a little inaccessible by a multiplicity of rugs, travelling bags and hand luggage. "'Come, sit down, Clara,' she said. "'Have your cry out, and then pull yourself together. "'Remember, Lady Carmody will want just all you can do for her "'if Sir Richard, if—' and Honoria was aware somehow of a sharp catch in her throat, if he does not live. And meanwhile, Roger Ormiston, now in sober and dignified middle age, found himself called upon to repeat that rather sinister experience of his hot and rackety youth, and as he put it bitterly, 
act hangman to his own sister. For, as he approached her, Catherine, leaning back against the piled-up cushions in the corner of the railway carriage, suddenly sat bolt upright, stretching out her hands in swift fear and entreaty, as in the state bedroom at Brockhurst nine and twenty years ago. "'Oh, Roger, Roger!' she cried. "'Tell me, what is it?' "'Oh, nothing final as yet, thank God,' he answered. "'But it would be cruel to keep the truth from you, Kitty, "'and let you buoy yourself up with false hopes.' "'He is worse,' Catherine said. "'Yes, he is worse. "'He is a good deal weaker. "'I'm afraid the state of affairs has become very grave. "'Evidently they are apprehensive as to what turn the fever may take "'in the course of the next twelve hours.' Catherine bowed herself together as though smitten by sharp pain. Then she looked at him hurriedly, fresh alarms assaulting her. "'You're not trying to soften the blow to me? You're not keeping anything back?' Oh "'No, no, no, my dear Kitty. There, see, read it for yourself. I telegraphed twice so as to have the latest news. Here's the last reply.' Ormiston unfolded the blue paper, crossed by white strips of printed matter, and laid it upon her lap. And as he did so, it struck him, aggravating his sense of sinister repetition, that she had on the same rings and bracelets as on that former occasion, and that she wore stone-grey silk too, a long travelling sack, lined and bordered with soft fur. It rustled as she moved. A coif of black lace covered her upturned hair, framed her sweet face, and was tied soberly under her chin. And looking upon her, Ormiston yearned in spirit over this beautiful woman who had borne such grievous sorrows, and who, as he feared, had sorrow yet more grievous still to bear. "'For ten to one the boy won't pull through. He won't pull through,' he said to himself. "'Poor dear fellow!' He's got nothing left to fall back on. He's lived too hard. And then he took himself remorsefully to task, asking himself whether, among the pleasures and ambitions and successes of his own career, he had been quite faithful to the dead and quite watchful enough over the now dying Richard Carmody. He reproached himself, for when death stands at the gate, Conscience grows very sensitive regarding any lapses, real or imagined, of duty towards those for whom that dread ambassador waits. Twice Catherine read the telegram, weighing each word of it. Then she gave the blue paper back to her brother. "'I will ask you all to let me be alone for a little while, dear Roger,' she said. "'Tell Honoria, tell Ludovic, and tell my good Clara.' I must turn my face to the wall for a time, so that when I turn it upon you dear people again it may not be too unlovely. And Ormiston bent his head and kissed her hand, and went out, closing the door behind him, while the train roared southward through the afternoon sunshine, southward towards Chiusi and Rome. And Catherine Carmody sat quietly, amid the noise and violent on-rushing movement, making up accounts with her own motherhood. That she might never see Dicky again, she herself dying, was an idea which had grown not unfamiliar to her during these last sad years. But that she should survive only to see Dicky dead was a new idea, and one which joined hands with despair, since it constituted a conclusion big with the anguish of failure to the tragedy of their relation, hers and his, her whole sense of justice, of fitness, rebelled under it, rebelled against it. She implored a space, however brief, of reconciliation and reunion before the supreme farewell was said. But it had become natural to Catherine's mind, so unsparingly self-trained in humble obedience to the divine ordering, not to stay in the destructive, but to pass on to the constructive stage. She would not indulge herself in rebellion, but rather fashion her thought without delay to that which should make for inward peace. 
and so now turning her eyes in thought from the present she went back on the baby love the child love which notwithstanding the abiding smart of richard's deformity had been so very exquisite to her upon the happier side of all that she had not dared to dwell during this prolonged period of estrangement it was too poignant too deep-seated in the springs of her physical being to dwell on it enervated and unnerved her but now richard the grown man dying she gave herself back to richard the little child it solaced her to do so then he had been wholly hers and he was wholly hers still in respect of that early time the man she had lost so it seemed how far through fault of her own she could not tell and just now she refused to analyse all that upon all which strengthened endurance upon gracious memories engendering thankfulness could her mind alone profitably be fixed and so as the train roared southward and the sun declined and the swift dusk spread its mantle over the face of the classic landscape catherine cradled a phantom baby on her knee and sat in the oriel window of the chapel room at brockhurst with the phantom of her boy beside her while she told him old-time legends of war and of high endeavour and of gallant adventure watching the light dance in his eyes as her words awoke in him emulation of those masters of noble deeds whose exploits she recounted and in this she found comfort and a chastened calm so that when at length general ormiston incited thereto by the faithful clara who protested that her ladyship must and should dine returned to her he found her storm-tossed no longer but tranquil in expression and solicitous for the comfort of others she had conquered nature by grace conquered in that she had compelled herself to unqualified submission if this cup might not pass from her still would she praise almighty god and bless his holy name asking not that her own but his will be done it followed that the evening spent in that strangely noisy oscillating onward rushing dwelling place of a railway carriage was not without a certain subdued brightness of intercourse and conversation catherine was neither preoccupied nor distrait nor unamused even by the small accidents and absurdities of travel later while preparations were being made by the servants for the coming night she went out with the two gentlemen and honoria st quentin on to the iron platform at the rear of the swaying car and stood there under the stars the mystery of these last and of the dimly discerned and sleeping land offered penetrating contrast to the sleeplessness of the hurrying train with its long sinuous line of lighted windows and to the sleeplessness of her own heart the fret of human life is but as a little island in the great ocean of eternal peace so she told herself and then bade that sleepless heart of hers both still its passionate beating and take courage and when at length she was alone and lay down in her narrow berth peace and thankfulness remained with catherine the care and affection of brother friends and servants was very grateful to her so that she composed herself to rest whether slumber was granted her or not the event was in the hands of god that surely was enough and in the dawn reaching rome the news was so far better that it was not worse richard lived and when some seven hours later the train steamed into naples station and bates the house steward the marks of haste and keen anxiety upon him pushed his way up to the carriage door he could report there was this amount of hope even yet that richard still lived though his strength was as that of an infant and whether it would wax or wane wholly none as yet could say oh then we are in time bates lady carmody had asked desiring further assurance i hope so my lady but i would advise your coming as quickly as possible is he conscious he knew captain vanstone this morning my lady just before i left 
The manservant shouldered the crowd aside unceremoniously so as to force a passage for Lady Carmody. "'Her ladyship should go up to the villa at once, sir,' he said to General Ormiston. "'I had better accompany her. I will leave Andrews to make all arrangements here. The carriage is waiting.' Then, Honoria beside her, Catherine was aware of the hot glare and hard shadow, the grind and clatter, the violent colour, the strident vivacity of the Neapolitan streets, as with voice and whip, Garcia sprung the handsome long-tailed black horses up the steep ascent. This followed by the impression of a cool, spacious and lofty interior, of mild diffused light, of pale marble floors and stairways, of rich hangings and distinguished objects of art, of the soft green gloom of ilex and myrtle, the languid drip of fountains. And this last served to mark, as with raised finger, the hush, bland yet very imperative, which held all the place. After the ceaseless jar and tumult of that many days' journey, here, up at the villa, it seemed as though urgency were absurd, hot haste of affection a little vulgar, a little contemptible. All was so composed, so urbane. And that urbanity, so bland, so in a way supercilious, affected Honoria St. Quentin unpleasantly. She was taken with unreasoning dislike of the place, finding something malign, trenching on cruelty even, in its exalted serenity, its unchanging, inaccessible, mask-like smile. Very certainly the ancient gods held court here yet, the gods who are careless of human tears, heedless of human woe. And she looked anxiously at Lady Carmody, penetrated by fear that the latter was about to be exposed to some insidious danger, to come into conflict with influences antagonistic and subtly evil. Wicked deeds had been committed in this fair place, wicked designs nourished and brought to fruition here, she was convinced of that, was convinced further that those designs had connection with and had been directed against Lady Carmody. The thought of Helen de Valorbe, exquisite and vicious, as she now reluctantly admitted her to be, was very present to her. As far as she knew, it was quite a number of years since Helen had set foot in the villa, yet it spoke of her, spoke of the more dangerous aspects of her nature. Honoria sighed over her friend. Helen had gone latterly very much to the bad, she feared. And as all this passed rapidly through her mind, it aroused all her night errantry, raising a strongly protective spirit in her. She questioned just how much active care she might take of Lady Carmody, without indiscretion of over-forwardness. But even while she thus debated, opportunity of action was lost. Quietly, a great simplicity and singleness of purpose in her demeanour, without word spoken, without looking back, Catherine followed the house-steward across the cool, spacious hall, through a doorway, and out of sight. And that singleness of purpose, so discernible in her outward demeanour, possessed Catherine's being throughout. She was as one who walks in sleep, pushed by blind impulse. She was not conscious of herself, not conscious of joy or fear or any emotion. She moved forward dumbly and without volition towards the event. Her senses were confused by this transition to stillness from noise, by the immobility of all surrounding objects after the reeling landscape on either hand the swaying train, by the bland and tempered light after the harsh contrasts of glare and darkness so constantly offered to her vision of late. She was dazed and faint, moreover, so that her knees trembled, her sensibility, her powers of realisation and of sympathy, for the time being, atrophied. The house-steward ushered her into a large square room. The low, darkly painted, vaulted ceiling of it produced a cavernous effect. An orderly disorder prevailed, and a somewhat mournful dimness of closed green-slatted shutters and half-drawn curtains. The furniture, costly in fact, but dwarfed, in some cases actually legless, was ranged against the squat carven bookcases that lined the walls, 
leaving the middle of the room vacant save for a low, narrow camp bed. The bed stood at right angles to the door by which Catherine entered, the head of it towards the shuttered, heavily draped windows, the foot towards the inside wall of the room. At the bedside a man knelt on one knee, and his appearance aroused in a degree Catherine's dormant powers of observation. He had a short, crisp black beard and crisp black hair. He was alert and energetic of face and figure, a man of daredevil, humorous yet kindly eyes. He wore a blue serge suit with brass buttons to it. He was in his stocking feet. The wristbands and turn-down collar of his white shirt were immaculate. Catherine, lost, trembling, the support of the habitual taken from her, a stranger in a strange land, liked the man. He appeared so admirable an example of physical health. He inspired her with confidence, his presence seeming to carry with it assurance of that which is wholesome, normal and sane. He glanced at her sharply, not without hint of criticism and of command. Authoritatively, he signed to her to remain silent, to stand at the head of the bed and well clear of it, out of sight. Catherine did not resent this. She obeyed. And standing thus, rallying her will to conscious effort, she looked steadily, for the first time, at the bed and that which lay upon it. And so doing, she could hardly save herself from falling, since she saw there precisely that which the shape of the room and the disarray of it, along with vacant space and the low camp bed in the centre of that space, had foretold. For all her dumbness of feeling, deadness of sympathy, she must assuredly see. All these last four and twenty hours she had solaced herself with the phantom society of Dicky the baby child, of Dicky the eager boy, curious of many things. But here was one different from both these. Different, too, from the young man, tremendous in arrogance and in revolt against the indignity put on him by fate, from whom she had parted in such anguish of spirit nearly five years back. For in good truth, she saw now not Richard Carmody, her son, her anxious charge, whose debtor, in that she had brought him into life disabled, she held herself eternally to be, but Richard Carmody, her husband, the desire of her eyes, the glory of her youth, saw him, worn by suffering, disfigured by unsightly growth of beard, pallid, racked by mortal weakness, the sheet expressing the broad curve of his chest, the sheet and light blanket disclosing the fact of that hideous maiming he had sustained, saw him now as on the night he died. Captain Vanstone, meanwhile reassured as to the newcomer's discretion and docility, applied his mind to his patient. "'See here, sir,' he said, banteringly yet tenderly, "'we were just getting along first rate with these uncommonly mixed liquors.' "'You mustn't cry off again, Sir Richard.' He slipped his arm under the pillows, dexterously raising the young man's head, and held the cup to his lips. Oh, "'My dear good fellow, I wish you would let me be,' Dicky murmured. He spoke courteously, yet there were tears in his voice for very weakness. And hearing him, it was as though something stirred within Catherine which had long been bound by bitterness of heavy frost. Vanstone shook his head. "'Very sorry, Sir Richard,' he replied. "'Don't let you off. I've got my orders, you see.' The bold and kindly eyes had a certain magnetic efficacy of compulsion in them. The sick man drank, swallowed with difficulty, yet drank again. Then he lay back for a while, his eyes closed, resting. And Catherine stood at the head of the bed, out of sight, waiting till her time should come. She folded her hands high upon her bosom. Her thought remained inarticulate, yet she began to understand that which she had striven so sternly to uproot, that which she had supposed she had extirpated, still remained with her. Once more, with a terror of joyful amazement, she began to scale the height and sound the depth of human love. Presently, the voice, whether that of husband or of son she did not stay to discriminate, it gripped her very vitals, reached her from the bed. 
she fancied it rang a little stronger. It is contemptibly futile, and therefore conspicuously in keeping with the rest, to have taken all this trouble about dying, only in the end to sneak back. Oh, well, sir, after all, you're not so very far on the return voyage yet, Vanstone put in consolingly. Richard opened his eyes. Catherine's vision was blurred. She could not see very clearly, but she fancied he smiled. "'Yes, with luck I may still give you all the slip,' he said. "'Now a little more, sir, please. "'Yes, you can if you try. Oh, "'But I tell you I don't care about this business of sneaking back. "'I don't want to live. "'Very likely not. "'But I'm very much mistaken if you want to die like a cat in a cupboard here ashore.' mend enough to get away on board the yacht to sea there'll be time enough then to argue the question out sir half a mile of blue water under your feet sends up the value of life most considerably as he spoke the sailor looked at catherine carmody his glance enjoined caution yet conveyed encouragement here take down the rest of it sir richard he said persuasively then i swear i won't plague you any more for a good hour Again he raised the sick man dexterously, and as he did so, Catherine observed that a purple scar, as of a but newly healed wound, ran right across Dicky's cheek, from below the left eye to the turn of the lower jaw, and the sight of it moved her strangely, loosening that last binding as of frost. A swift madness of anger against whoso had inflicted that ugly hurt arose in Catherine, while her studied resignation, her strained passivity of mental attitude, went down before a passion of fierce and primitive emotion. The spirit of battle became dominant in her, along with an immense necessity of loving and of being loved. Tender phantoms of past joy ceased to solace. The actual, the concrete, the immediate compelled her with a certain splendour of demand. Catherine appeared to grow taller, more regal of presence. The noble energy of youth and its limitless generosity returned to her. Instinctively, she unfastened her pelisse at the throat, took the lace coif from her head, letting it fall to the ground, and moved nearer. Richard pushed the cup away from his lips. "'There's someone in the room, Vanstone,' he said, his voice harsh with anger. "'Some woman. I heard her dress.' I told you all, whatever happened, I would have no woman here. But Catherine, undismayed, came straight on to the bedside. She loved. She would not be gainsaid. With the whole force of her nature, she refused denial of that love. For a brief space, Richard looked at her, his face ghastly and rigid as that of a corpse. Then he raised himself in the bed, stretching out both arms, with a hoarse cry that tore at his throat and shuddered through all his frame. And as he would have fallen forward, exhausted by the effort to reach her and the lovely shelter of her, Catherine caught and kneeling held him, his poor hands clutching impotently at her shoulders, his head sinking upon her breast. While in that embrace not only all the motherhood in her leapt up to claim the sonship in him, but all the womanhood in her leapt up to claim the manhood in him, thereby making the broken circle of her being once more wholly perfect and complete, so that carrying the whole dear burden of his fever-wasted body in her encircling arms and upon her breast, even as she had carried long since that dear fruit of love, the unborn babe, within her womb, Catherine was taken with a very ecstasy and rapture of content. "'My beloved is mine, is mine!' she cried. "'And I am his!' Captain Vanstone was on his feet and halfway across the room. "'Man alive, but it hurts like merry hell,' he said, as he softly closed the door. End of chapter 2 of Book 6
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book 6, Chapter 3, Concerning a Spirit in Prison. Upon those moments of rapture followed days of trembling, during which the sands of Richard Carmody's life ran very low, and his brain wandered in delirium, and he spoke unwittingly of many matters of which it was unprofitable to hear. Periods of unconsciousness, when he lay as one dead, periods of incessant utterance, now violent in unavailing repudiation, now harsh with unavailing remorse, alternated. And at this juncture, much of Lady Carmody's former very valiant pride asserted itself. In tender jealousy for the honour of her beloved one, she shut the door of that sick room of sinister aspect against brother and friend, and even against the faithful Clara. None should see or hear Richard in his present alienation and abjection, save herself and those who had hitherto ministered to him. He should regain a measure at least of his old distinction and beauty before any beyond these looked on his face. And so his own men-servants, Captain Vanstone, capable, humorous and alert, and Price, the red-headed Welsh first mate, a varied and voluminous gift of invective, continued to nurse him. These men loved him. They would be loyal in silence, since whatever his lapses, Dicky was and always had been, as Catherine reflected, among the number of those happily endowed persons who triumphantly give the lie to the cynical saying that no man is a hero to his valet de chambre. To herself, Catherine reserved the right to enter that sinister sick room whenever she pleased, and to sit by the bedside, waiting for the moment, should it ever come, when Richard would again recognise her and give himself to her again. And those vigils proved a searching enough experience, notwithstanding her long apprenticeship to service of sorrow, which was also the service of her son. For in the mental and moral nudity of delirium he made strange revelation, not only of acts committed, but of inherent tendencies of character and of thought. He spoke, with bewildering inconsequence and intimacy, of incidents and of persons with whom she was unacquainted, causing her to follow him, a rather brutal pilgrimage, into regions where the feet of women, bred and nurtured like herself, but seldom tread. He spoke of persons with whom she was well acquainted also, and whose names arrested her attention with pathetic significance, offering for the moment secure standing ground amid the shifting quicksand of his but half-comprehended words. He spoke of Morabita, the famous prima donna, and of gentle Mrs. Chiffney down at the Brockhurst racing stables. He grew heated in discussion with Lord Fallowfield. He petted little Lady Constance Quayle. He called Camp, coaxed and chaffed the dog merrily, whereat Lady Carmody rose from her place by the bedside and stood at one of the dim, shuttered windows for a while. He spoke of places, too, and of happenings in them, from West Church to Constantinople, from a notch at Singapore to a country fair at Farley Row. But recurrent through all his wanderings were allusions, unsparing in revolt and in self-abasement, to a woman whom he had loved and who had dealt very vilely with him, putting some unpardonable shame upon him, and to a man whom he himself had very basely wronged. The name, neither of man nor woman, did Catherine learn. Madame de Valorbe's name, for which she could not but listen, he never mentioned, nor did he mention her own. And recurrent also, running as a black thread through all his speech, was lament, not unmanly, but very terrible to hear, the lament of a creature captive, maimed, imprisoned, perpetually striving, perpetually frustrated in the effort to escape. And noting all this, Catherine not only divined very dark and evil pages in the history of her beloved one, but a struggle so continuous and a sorrow so abiding, that in her estimation at all events, they cancelled and expiated the darkness and evil of those same pages. 
while the mystery both of wrong done and sorrow suffered so wrought upon her that having in the first ecstasy of recovered human love deserted and depreciated the god would love a little she now ran back imploring assurance and renewal of that last in all penitence and humility lest deprived of the counsel and sure support of it she should fail to read the present and deal with the future aright if indeed any future still remained for that beloved one other than the yawning void of death and inscrutable silence of the grave the better part of a week passed thus and then one fair morning winter bringing her breakfast to the anteroom of that same sea-blue sea-green bedchamber some time tenanted by helen de valorbe disclosed a beaming countenance mr powell wishes me to inform your ladyship that sir richard has passed a very good night he has come to himself my lady and has asked for you the butler's hands shook as he set down the tray i hope your ladyship will take something to eat before you go downstairs he added mr powell told sir richard that it was still early and he desired that on no consideration should you be hurried which little word of thoughtfulness on dicky's part brought a roundness to catherine's cheek and a soft shining into her sweet eyes so that honoria st quentin sauntering into the room just then with her habitual lazy grace stood still a moment in pleased surprise noting the change in her friend's appearance why dear cousin catherine she asked what's happened all's right with the world yes catherine answered god's very much in his heaven to-day and all's right with all the world because things are a little more right with one man in it that is the woman's creed always has been i suppose and i rather hope always will be it is frankly personal and individualistic i know possibly it is contemptibly narrow-minded still i doubt if she will readily find another one which makes for greater happiness or fullness of life you don't agree dearest i know nevertheless pour out my tea for me will you i want to dispose of this necessary evil of breakfast with all possible despatch richard has sent for me he has slept and is awake and as miss st quentin served her dear friend she pondered this speech curiously saying to herself yes i did write though i never liked ludovic quayle better than now and never liked any other man as well as i like ludovic quayle but that's not enough i'm getting hold of the appearance of the thing but i haven't got hold of the thing itself and so the woman in me must continue to be kept in the back attic she shall be denied all further development she shall have nothing unless she can have the whole of it and repeat cousin catherine's creed from her heart richard did not speak when lady carmody crossed the room and sat down at the bedside he barely raised his eyelids but he felt out for her hand across the surface of the sheet and she took the proffered hand in both hers and fell to stroking the palm of it with her fingertips and this silent greeting and confiding contact of hand with hand was to her exquisitely healing it gave an assurance of nearness and acknowledged ownership more satisfying and convincing than many eloquent phrases of welcome and so she too remained silent only indeed permitting herself for a little while to look at him lest so doing she should make further demand upon his poor quantity of strength a folding screen in stamped leather of which age had tempered the ruby and gold to a sober harmony of tone had been placed round the head of the bed throwing this last into clear quiet shadow the bed linen was fresh and smooth richard had made a little toilet his silk shirt open at the throat was also fresh and smooth he was clean shaven his hair cropped into that closely fitting bright brown cap of curls catherine perceived that his beauty had begun to return to him though his face was distressingly worn and emaciated and the long purplish line of that unexplained scar still disfigured his cheek his hands were little more than skin and bone indeed he was fragile she feared as any person could be who yet had life in him and she wondered rather fearfully 
if it was yet possible to build up that life again into any joy of energy and of activity. But she put such fears from her as unworthy, for were they not together, he and she, actually and consciously reunited? That was sufficient. The rest could wait. And today, as though lending encouragement to gracious hopes, the usually gloomy and cavernous room had taken to itself a quite generous plenishing of air and light. The heavy curtains were drawn aside, the casements of one of the square squat windows were thrown widely open. The slatted shutters without were partially opened likewise. A shaft of strong sunshine slanted in and lay like a bright highway across the rich colours of the Persian carpet. The air was hot but nimble and of a vivacious and stimulating quality. It fluttered some loose papers on the writing table near the open window. It fluttered the delicate laces and fine muslin frills of Lady Carmody's morning gown. There was a sprightly mirthfulness in the touch of it, not unpleasing to her, for it seemed to speak of the ever-obtaining youth, the incalculable power of recuperation, the immense reconstructive energy resident in nature and the physical domain. And there was comfort in that thought. She turned her eyes from the bed and its somewhat sorrowful burden, the handsome head, the broad though angular shoulders, the face, immobile and mask-like, with closed eyelids and unsmiling lips, reposing upon the whiteness of the pillows, and fixed them upon that radiant space of outer world, visible between the dark framing of the half-open shutters. Beyond the dazzling black-and-white chequer of the terrace and balustrade, they rested on the cool green of the formal garden, the glistering dome and slender columns of the pavilion set in the angle of the terminal wall, and this last reminded her quaintly of that other pavilion, embroidered with industry of innumerable stitches upon the curtains of the state bed at home. That pavilion, set for rest and refreshment in the midst of the tangled ways of the forest of this life, where the heart may breathe in security, fearless of care the pursuing leopard which follows all too close behind. Owing to her position and the sharp drop of the hillside, Naples itself, the great painted city, its fine buildings and crowded shipping, was unseen. But far away, the lofty promontory of Sorrento sketched itself in palest lilac upon the azure of the sea and the sky. And, as Catherine reasoned, if this fair prospect, after so many ages of tumultuous history and the shock of calamitous events, after battle, famine, terror of earthquake and fire, devastation by foul disease, could still recover and present such an effect of triumphant youthfulness, such at once august and mirthful charm, might not her beloved one, lying here broken in health and in spirit, likewise regain the glory of his manhood and the delight of it, notwithstanding present weakness and mournful eclipse? Yes, it would come right, come right, Catherine told herself, thereby making one of those magnificent acts of faith which go so far to produce just that which they prophesy. God could not have created so complex and beautiful a creature, and permitted it so to suffer, save to the fulfilment of some clear purpose, which would very surely be made manifest at last. God Almighty should be justified of his strange handiwork, and she of her love, before the whole of the story was told. And stirred by these thoughts, and by the fervour of her own pious confidence, Catherine's fingertips travelled more rapidly over the palm of that outstretched and passive hand. Then on a sudden she became aware that Richard was looking fixedly at her. She turned her head proudly, the exaltation of a living faith very present in her smile. "'You are the same,' he said slowly. His voice was low, toneless, and singularly devoid of emotion. "'Deliciously the same. You are just as lovely.' You still have your pretty colour. You are hardly a day older. He paused, still regarding her fixedly. I'm glad you've got on one of those white frilly things you used to wear. I always liked them. Catherine could not speak just then. This sudden and complete intimacy unnerved her. 
It was so long since any one had spoken to her thus. It was very dear to her, yet the toneless voice gave a strange unreality to the tender words. "'It's a matter for congratulation that you are the same,' Richard went on, "'since everything else, it appears, is destined to continue the same. "'One should have one thing it is agreeable to contemplate in that connection, "'considering the vast number of things altogether the reverse of agreeable, "'which one fondly hoped one was rid of for ever, and which intrude themselves.' "'He shifted himself feebly on the pillows, and the flicker of a smile crossed his face. "'Poor dear mother,' he said, you see again, without delay, the old bad habit of grumbling. Oh, grumble on, grumble on, my best beloved, Catherine murmured, while her fingertips travelled softly over his palm. Verily and indeed you are the same, Richard rejoined. Once more he lay looking full at her, until she became almost abashed by that unswerving scrutiny. It came over her that the plane of their relation had changed. Richard was, as never heretofore, her equal, a man grown. Suddenly he spoke. Can you forgive me? And so far had Catherine's thought journeyed from the past, so absorbed was it in the present, that she answered, surprised, My dearest, forgive what? Injustice, ingratitude, desertion, Richard said, neglect systematic cruelty. There is plenty to swell the list. All I boasted I would do, I have done, and more. His voice, until now so even and emotionless, faltered a little. I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Catherine's hand closed down on his firmly. All that, as far as I am concerned, is as though it was not and never had been, she answered. So much for judgment on earth, dearest. While in heaven, thank God, we know there is more joy over the one sinner who repents than over the ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. And you really believe that? Richard said, speaking half indulgently and half ironically, as if to a child. Assuredly I believe it. But supposing the sinner is not repentant, but merely cowed, Richard straightened his head on the pillows and closed his eyes. You gave me leave to grumble. Well, then, I am so horribly disappointed. Here have life and death been sitting on either side of me for the past month and throwing with dice for me. I saw them as plainly as I can see you. The queer thing was they were exactly alike, yet I knew them apart from the first. Day and night I heard the rattle of the dice. It became hideously monotonous, and felt the mouth of the dice-box on my chest when they threw. I backed death heavily. It seemed to me there were ways of loading the dice. I loaded them. But it wasn't to be, mother. Life always threw the highest numbers and life had the last throw. I praise God for that, Catherine said very softly. I don't, unfortunately, he answered. I hoped for a neat little execution, a little pain, perhaps a little shedding of blood, without which there is no remission of sins. But I suppose that would have been letting me off too easy. He drew away his hand and covered his eyes. When I had seen you, I seemed to have made my final peace. I understood why I had been kept waiting till then. Having seen you, I flattered myself I might decently get free at last. But I am branded afresh, that's all, and sent back to the galleys. Lady Carmody's eyes sought the radiant prospect, the green of the garden, the slender columns of the airy pavilion, the lilac land set in the azure of sea and sky. No words of hers could give comfort as yet, so she would remain silent. Her trust was in the amiable ministry of time, which may bring solace to the tormented human soul, even as it reclothes the mountainside swept by the lava stream, or cleanses and renders gladly habitable the plague-devastated city. 
but there was movement upon the bed. Richard had turned on his side. He had recovered his self-control, and once more looked fixedly at her. "'Mother,' he said calmly, "'is your love great enough to take me back, and give yourself to me again, though I am not fit so much as to kiss the hem of your garment?' "'There's neither giving nor taking, my beloved,' she answered, smiling upon him. "'In the truth of things, you have never left me, neither have I ever let you go.' "'Oh, but consider these last four years and their record,' he rejoined. "'I am not the same man that I was. There's no getting away from fact, from deeds actually done or words actually said, for that matter.' I have kept my singularly repulsive infirmity of body, and to it I have added a mind festering with foul memories. I have been a brute to you, a traitor to a friend who trusted me. I have been a sensualist, an adulterer, and I am hopelessly broken in pride and self-respect. The conceit, the pluck even, has been licked right out of me. Richard paused, steadying his voice, which faltered again. "'I only want, since it seems I've got to go on living, to slink away somewhere out of sight and hide myself and my wretchedness and shame from everyone I know. Can you bear with me, soured and invalided as I am, mother? Can you put up with my temper and my silence and my grumbling, useless log as I must continue to be?' "'Oh, yes, everlastingly, yes,' Catherine answered. Richard threw himself flat on his back again. "'Oh, how I hate myself! Oh, my God, how I hate myself!' he exclaimed. "'And how, beyond all worlds, I love you,' Catherine put in quietly. He felt out for her hand across the sheet, found and held it. There were footsteps upon the terrace to the right, the scent of a cigar, Ludovic Quayle's voice in question, and Aurea St. Quentin's in answer, both with enforced discretion and lowness of tone. General Ormiston joined them. Miss St. Quentin laughed gently. The sound was musical and sweet. Footsteps and voices died away. A clang of bells and the hooting of an outward-bound liner came up from the city and the port. Richard's calm had returned. His expression had softened. "'Will those two marry?' he asked presently. Lady Carmody paused before speaking. "'I hope so, for Ludovic's sake,' she said. "'He has served, if not quite Jacob's seven years, yet a full five for his love.' "'If for Ludovic's sake, why not for hers?' Dicky asked. Oh, "'Because two halves don't always make a whole in marriage,' Catherine said. "'You're as great an idealist as ever.' He paused, and then raised himself, sitting upright, speaking with a certain passion. "'Mother, will you take me away, away from everyone, at once, just as soon as possible? I never want to see this room or this house or Naples again. The climax was reached here of disillusion and of iniquity and of degradation. Don't ask what it was, I couldn't tell you. And mercifully... Only one person whose lips are sealed in self-defence knows exactly what took place besides myself. But I want to get away, away alone with you, who are perfectly unsullied and compassionate, and who has forgiven me, and who still can love. Will you come? Will you take me? The yacht is all ready for sea. Oh, yes, Catherine said. I asked this morning who was here with you, and Powell told me. I can't see them, mother. Simply I can't. I haven't the nerve. I haven't the face. Can you send them away? Oh, yes, Catherine said. Richard's eyes had grown dangerously bright. A spot of colour burned on either cheek. Catherine leaned over him. My dearest, she declared, you have talked enough. Yes, they're beginning to play again. I can hear the rattle of the dice. Oh, mother, take me away. Take me out to sea, away from this dreadful place. Oh, you poor darling, how horribly selfish I am. But let me get out to sea, and then later take me home, to Brockhurst. 
the house is big nobody need see me no no catherine said laying him back with tender force upon the pillows no one has seen you no one shall see you we will be alone you and i just as long as you wish with me my beloved you are very safe End of chapter 3 of book 6book six chapter four of the history of sir richard carmody this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by anne fletcher richmond tasmania two thousand and twenty the history of sir richard carmody by lucas mallet book six chapter four dealing with matters of hearsay and matters of sport one raw foggy evening early in the following december the house at newlands presented an unusually animated scene on the gravel of the carriage sweep without grooms walked breathed and sweating horses the steam from whose bodies and nostrils showed white in the chill dusk slowly up and down in the hall within a number of gentlemen more or less mud bespattered regaled themselves with cheerful conversation with strong waters of unexceptionable quality, and with their host, Mr. Cathcart's, very excellent cigars. They moved stiffly, and stood in attitudes more professional than elegant. The long, clear-coloured drawing-room beyond offered a perspective of much amiable comfort. The glazed surfaces of its flowery patterned chintzes gave back the brightness of candles and shaded lamps, while drawn curtains shut out the somewhat mournful prospect of sodden garden, bare trees, and grey enshrouding mists. At the tea-table, large, mild, reposeful, clothed in a wealth of black silk and black lace, was Mrs. Cathcart. Lord Fallowfield, his handsome infantile countenance beaming with good nature and good health above his blue and white bird's-eye stock and scarlet hunting coat sat by her discoursing with great affability and at great length mary ormiston stood near them an expression of kindly diversion upon her face her figure had grown somewhat matronly in these days and there were lines in her forehead and about the corners of her rather large mouth but her crisp hair was still untouched by grey, her bright, gypsy-like complexion had retained its freshness. She possessed the same effect of wholesomeness and good sense as of old, while her honest brown eyes were soft with satisfied mother-love, as they met those of the slender, black-headed boy at her side. Godfrey Ormiston was in his second term at Eton, and had come to Newlands to-day for his exeat. The little party was completed by Lord Shotover, who stood before the fire, warming that part of his person which, by the lay mind, unversed in such mysteries, might have been judged to be already more than sufficiently warmed by the saddle. His feet planted far apart, and a long glass of brandy and soda in his hand. For this last he had offered good-tempered apology. "'I know I have no business to bring it in here, Mrs. Cathcart,' he said, "'and make your drawing-room smell like a pothouse. "'But you see there was a positive stampede for the hearth-rug in the hall. "'A modest man such as myself hasn't a chance. "'There's a regular rampart, half the county, in fact, before that fire. "'So I thought I'd just slope in here, don't you know? "'It looked awfully warm and inviting.' and then i wanted to pay my respects to mrs ormiston too and talk to this young chap about eton in peace whereat godfrey flushed up to the roots of his hair being very sensibly exalted since what young male creature who knew anything really worth knowing that was godfrey's way of putting it at least did not know that lord shotover had been a mighty sportsman from his youth up and upon a certain famous occasion had won the grand national on his own horse only tea for me mrs cathcart lord fallowfield was saying capital thing tea never touch spirits in the daytime never have no reflection upon other men's habits he turned an admiring fatherly glance upon the tall well-made shotover other men know their own business best always have been a great advocate for believing every man knows his own business best still stick to my own habits like to be consistent very steadying sobering thing to be consistent very strengthening to the character 
always have told all my children that as you begin so you shall go on always have tried to begin as i was going on i haven't always succeeded but have made an honest effort and it is something you know to make an honest effort try to bear that in mind you young gentleman this genially to godfrey ormiston not half a bad rule to start in life with to go on as you begin you know oh always provided you start right you know my dear fellow shotover observed patting the boy's shoulder with his disengaged hand and looking at the boy's mother with a humorous suggestion of self-depreciation now as formerly he entertained the very friendliest sentiments towards all good women yet maintained an expensively extensive acquaintance with women to whom that adjective is not generically applicable but lord fallowfield was fairly under way words flowed from him careless of comment or of interruption he was innocently and conspicuously happy he had enjoyed a fine day's sport in company with his favourite son whose financial embarrassments were not it may be added just now in a critical condition and then access of material prosperity had recently come to lord fallowfield in the shape of a considerable coal-producing property in the north of midlandshire the income derived from this amounting to from ten to twelve thousand a year was payable to him during his lifetime with remainder on trust in equal shares to all his children there were good horses in the Whitney stables now, and no question of making shift to let the house in Belgrave Square for the season, while the amiable nobleman's banking account showed a far from despicable balance. And consciousness of this last fact formed an agreeable undercurrent to his every thought. Therefore was he even more than usually garrulous, according to his own kindly and innocent fashion very hospitable and friendly of you and cathcart to be sure he continued to throw open your house in this way kindness alike to man and beast man and beast for which my son and i are naturally very grateful lord shotover looked at mary again smiling little mix that statement isn't it he said unless we take it for granted that i'm the beast <laughs> i was a good deal perplexed i own mrs cathcart as to how we should get home without giving the horses a rest and having them gruelled fourteen miles a precious long fourteen too put in shotover oh so it is his father agreed a long fourteen and my horse was pumped regularly pumped i can't bear to see a horse as done as that it distresses me downright distresses me hate to overpress a horse hate to overpress anything that can't stand up to you and take its revenge on you always feel ashamed of myself if i've overpressed a horse but i hadn't reckoned on the distance the pace was too hot to inquire quoted shotover so it was meeting at grimshrop you see we very rarely kill so far on this side of the country breaking just where he did i'd have bet on that fox doubling back under tailpenny wood and making across the vale for the earths in the big brockhurst warren lord shotover declared oh, would you though said his father a very reasonable forecast very reasonable indeed quite the likeliest thing for him to do only he didn't do it don't believe that fox belonged to this side of the country at all don't understand his tactics if it had been in my poor friend denier's time i might have suspected him of being a bagman lord fallowfield chuckled a little ran too straight for a bagman shotover remarked well he gave us a rattling good spin whose ever fox he was oh didn't he though said lord fallowfield genially he turned sideways in his chair threw one shapely leg across the other and addressed himself more exclusively to his hostess haven't had such a day for years he continued and a very pleasant thing to have such a day just when my son's down with me very pleasant indeed it reminds me of my poor dear friend hennica's time good fellow hennica i liked hennica 
never had a better master than tom hennecker very tactful nice-feeling man and had such an excellent manner with the farmers ah here's cathcart and not how do you do not always glad to see you very pleasant meeting such a number of friends very pleasant ending to a pleasant day hey shot of her mrs cathcart and i were just speaking of poor tom hennecker you used to hunt then cathcart uh, do you remember a run just about this time of year it may have been a little earlier i tell you why it was the second time the hounds met after my poor friend alborough's funeral lord alborough died on the twenty seventh of october john knott said the doctor limped in walking he suffered a sharp twinge of sciatica and his face lent itself to astonishing contortions plain man not lord fallowfield commented inwardly monstrously able fellow but uncommonly plain oh, so's cathcart for that matter well dressed man and very well preserved as to figure but remarkably like an orangutan now his eyes are sunk and his eyebrows have grown so tufty then he glanced anxiously at lord shotover to assure himself of the entire absence of simian approximations in the case of his own family uh, oh uh, uh, yes he remarked aloud and somewhat vaguely quite right not then of course it was earlier record run for that season seldom had a better we found a fox in the grimshot gorse and ran to water end without a check oh and lemuel image got into the tilney brook mary ormiston said laughing a little oh, so he did though lord fallowfield rejoined beaming and then suddenly his complacency suffered eclipse for looking at the speaker he became disagreeably aware of having on some occasion said something highly inconvenient concerning this lady to one of her near relations he rushed into speech again loud-voiced blustering kind of feller image never have liked image extraordinary marriage that of his with a connection of poor alborough's never have understood how her people could allow it oh money'll buy pretty well everything in this world except brains and a sound liver dr knott said as he lowered himself cautiously on to the seat of the highest chair available or a good conscience mrs cathcart observed with mild dogmatism i'm not altogether so sure about that the doctor answered i have known the doubling of a few charitable subscriptions work extensive cures under that head depend upon it there's an immense deal more conscience money paid every year than ever finds its way into the coffers of the chancellor of the exchequer so there is though said lord fallowfield with an air of regretful conviction never put it as clearly as that myself not but must own i am afraid there is mr cathcart who had joined lord shot over on the hearthrug here intervened he had a tendency to air local grievances especially in the presence of his existing noble guest whom he regarded not wholly without reason as somewhat lukewarm and dilatory in questions of reform i own to sharing your dislike of image he remarked he behaved in anything but straightforward manner about the site for the new cottage hospital at parsons holt oh, did he though said lord fallowfield yes i supposed it had been brought to your notice lord fallowfield fidgeted a little hmm, rather too downright cathcart he said to himself gets you into a corner and fixes you not fair not at all fair in general society uh, oh uh, 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 cottage hospital uh, yes he added aloud very tiresome vexatious business about that hospital i felt it very much at the time it was a regular job mr cathcart continued oh no not a job not a job my dear fellow unpleasant word job oh, nothing approaching a job only an oversight at most an unfortunate error of judgment lord fallowfield protested he glanced at his son inviting support but that gentleman was engaged in kindly conversation with bright-eyed little godfrey ormiston 
he glanced at mary remembered suddenly that his unfortunate remark regarding that lady had been connected with her resemblance to her father and the latter's striking defect of personal beauty he glanced at the doctor but john nott sat all hunched together watching him with an expression rather sardonic than sympathetic there was culpable negligence somewhere in any case his persecutor mr cathcart went on it was obvious image pressed that bit of land at water's end on the committee simply because no one would buy it for building purposes his affectation of generosity as to price was a piece of transparent hypocrisy i suppose it was lord fallowfield agreed mildly a certain anonymous donor had promised a second five hundred pounds if the hospital was built on high ground with a subsoil of gravel it is on gravel put in lord fallowfield anxiously saw it myself distinctly remember seeing gravel when the heather had been pared before digging the foundations bright yellow gravel oh yes and with a ten-foot bed of blue clay underneath most dangerous soil going this from dr knott grimly oh is it though lord fallowfield inquired with an amiable effort to welcome unpalatable geological information not a doubt of it the surface water and generally the sewage for we are very far yet from having discovered a drain pipe which is impeccable in respect of leakage soak through the porous cap down to the clay and lie there to rise again not at the last day by any means but on the evening of the very first one that's been hot enough to cause evaporation do they though said lord fallowfield he was greatly impressed capable fellow not wonderful thing science he commented inwardly and with praiseworthy humility but mr cathcart returned to the charge the hospital was disastrously the loser in any case he remarked as a matter of course the conditions having been disregarded lady carmody withdrew her promise of a second donation oh lady carmody really the simple-minded nobleman exclaimed very interesting piece of news and very generous intention no doubt on the part of lady carmody but give you my word cathcart that until this moment i had no notion that the anonymous donor of whom we heard so much from one or two members of the committee heard too much i thought for i dislike mysteries foolish unprofitable things mysteries always turn out to be nothing at all in the finish oh uh, yes well that the anonymous donor was lady carmody and thereupon he shifted his position with as much assumption of hauteur as his inherent amiability permitted he turned his chair sideways presenting an excellently flat if somewhat broad scarlet clad back to his persecutor upon the hearthrug sorry to set a man down in his own house he said to himself but cathcart's a little wanting in taste sometimes he presses a subject home too closely and if i was bamboozled by image it really isn't cathcart's place to remind me of it he turned a worried and puckered countenance upon his hostess upon dr knott upon the drawing-room door in the hall beyond one or two guests still lingered a lady had just joined them notably straight and tall and lazily graceful of movement lord fallowfield knew her but could not remember her name oh uh, shot over he said over his shoulder i don't want to hurry you my dear boy but perhaps it would be as well if you'd just go round to the stables and take a look at the horses and then as the gentleman addressed moved away escorted by his host and followed in admiring silence by godfrey ormiston he repeated almost querulously foolish things mysteries nothing in them as a rule when you thrash them out mare's nest generally and that reminds me i hear young um, lord fallowfield's air of worry became accentuated young carmody's got home again at last yes mrs cathcart said richard and his mother have been at brockhurst nearly a month have they though exclaimed lord fallowfield he fidgeted it's a painful subject to refer to but i should be glad to know the truth of these nasty uncomfortable rumours about young carmody 
you see there was that question of his and my youngest daughter's marriage i never approved shot over back me up in it he didn't approve either and in the end comedy behaved in a very high-minded straightforward manner came to me himself and exhibited very good sense and very proper feeling did carmody admitted his own disabilities with extraordinary frankness too much frankness i was inclined to think at the time it struck me as a trifle callous don't you know but afterwards when he left home in that singular manner and went abroad and we all lost sight of him and heard how reckless he had become and all that it weighed on me i give you my word mrs cathcart it weighed very much on me i've seldom been more upset by anything in my life than i was by the whole affair of that wedding i am afraid it was a great mistake throughout mrs cathcart said she folded her plump white hands upon her ample lap and sighed gently mm, wasn't it though so i told everybody from the start you know commented lord fallowfield it caused a great deal of unhappiness oh, so it did so it did the good man said quite humbly he looked crestfallen his kindly and well-favoured countenance being overspread by an expression of disarmingly innocent penitence it weighed on me i should be glad to be able to forget it but now it's all cropping up again you see there are these rumours that poor young carmody's gone under very much one way and another that his health's broken up altogether and that he's shut up in two rooms at brockhurst and because well, it's a terribly distressing thing to mention but that's the common talk you know because he's a little touched here the speaker tapped his smooth and very candid forehead a little wrong here horrible thing insanity he repeated at this point dr knott who had been watching first one person present and then another from under his shaggy eyebrows with an air of somewhat harsh amusement roused himself pardon me all a pack of lies my lord he said and stupid ones into the bargain sir richard calmed is as sane as you are yourself oh is he though the other exclaimed brightening sensibly thank you not it is a very great relief to me to hear that only a man with a remarkably sound constitution could have pulled round i quite own he's been very hard hit and no wonder typhoid and complications oh complications inquired lord fallowfield who rarely let slip an opportunity of acquiring information of a pathological description yes complications of the sort that are most difficult to deal with emotional and moral beginning with his engagement to lady constance oh dear me this piteously from that lady's father an ending his satanic majesty knows where i don't it's no concern of mine nor of anyone else's in my opinion he has paid his footing every man has to pay it sooner or later to life and experience and personal acquaintance with the thou shalt not which for cause unknown goes for so almighty much in this very queer business of human existence he has had a rough time never doubt that with his high strung arrogant sensitive nature and the dirty trick played on him by that heartless jade dame fortune before his birth for the time this illness had knocked the wind out of him if he sulks for a bit small blame to him but he'll come round he is coming round day by day as he finished speaking the doctor got on to his feet somewhat awkwardly his subject had affected him more deeply than he quite cared either to own to himself or to have others see Ooh, that plaguy sciatic nerve again he growled lord fallowfield had risen also capable man not but rather rough at times rather too didactic he said to himself as he turned to greet miss st quentin she had strolled in from the hall her charming face was full of merriment there was something altogether gallant in the carriage of her small head i was so awfully glad to see lord shotover she said as she gave her hand to that gentleman's father 
it's an age since he and i have met a very pleasant hearing my dear young lady for shot over if he was here to hear it <laughs> lucky fellow shot over the kindly nobleman beamed upon her he was nothing if not chivalrous mentally all the same he was much perplexed of course i remember who she is but i understood it was ludovic he said to himself made sure it was ludovic uncommonly attractive high-bred woman very striking-looking pair she and shot over can't fancy shot over settled though say she's a lot of money wonder whether it is shot over a uncommonly fine run best run we've had for years he added aloud pity you weren't out miss st quentin well good-bye mrs cathcart i must be going i'm extremely grateful for all your kindness and hospitality it is seldom i have the chance of meeting so many friends this side of the country good day to you not good-bye miss st quentin wonder if i'd better ask her to whitney he thought on the chance of its being shot over oh, better sound him first though never let a man in for a woman unless you've very good reason to suppose he wants her <laughs> honoria meanwhile thrusting her hands into the pockets of her long fur-lined tan cloth driving coat sat down on the arm of mary ormiston's flowery patterned chintz covered chair i left you all in a state of holy peace and quiet she said smiling and a fine show you got on hand by the time i come back they ran across the ten-acre field and killed in the shrubbery mrs ormiston put in john knott limped forward he stood with his hands behind him looking down at the two ladies some months had elapsed since he and miss st quentin had met he was very fond of the young lady it interested him to meet her again Honoria glanced up at him, smiling. "'Have you been out, too?' she asked. "'Not a bit of it. I'm too busy mending other people's brittle anatomy to have time to risk breaking any part of my own. I'm ugly enough already. No need to make me uglier. I came here for the express purpose of calling on you.' Uh, "'You saw Catherine?' Mary asked. "'Oh, yes, I saw Cousin Catherine. How is she?' an embodiment of faith hope and charity as usual but with just that pinch of malice thrown in which gives the compound a flavour in short she is enchanting and then she looks so admirably well that six months at sea was a great restorative mary remarked yet it really is rather wonderful when you consider the state she was in before we went to you at ormiston and how frightened we were at her undertaking the journey to naples her affections are satisfied dr knott said and his loose lips worked into a smile half sneering half tender i'm an old man and i've had a good lot to do with women at second hand feed their hearts and the rest of the mechanism runs easy enough anything short of organic disease can be cured by that sort of nourishment even organic disease can be arrested by it and what's more i have known disease develop in an apparently perfectly healthy subject simply because the heart was starved oh i tell you you're marvellous beings and yet you know i feel so abominably sold honoria declared when i consider the way in which we all roger mr quayle and i acted bodyguard attended cousin catherine to naples wrapped her in cotton wool dear thing sternly determined to protect her at all cost and all hazards from well i am ashamed to say i had no name bad enough at the time for richard carmody and then this very person whom we regarded as her probable destruction proves to be her absolute salvation while she proceeds to turn the tables upon us in the smartest fashion imaginable she showed us the door and entreated us in the most beguiling manner to return whence we came and leave her wholly at the mercy of the enemy i was furious miss st quentin laughed downright furious and roger's temper for all his high mightiness was a thing to swear at rather than swear by the morning he and i left naples 
with the greatest difficulty we persuaded her even to keep clara she had a rage dear thing for getting rid of the lot of us oh we had a royal skirmish and no mistake so roger told me honoria stretched herself a little lolled against the back of the chair steadying herself by laying one hand affectionately on the other woman's shoulder and john knott observing her noted not only her nonchalant and almost boyish grace but a swift change in her humour from light-hearted laughter to a certain and as he fancied half unwilling enthusiasm but to-day she went on when cousin catherine told me about it i confess the whole situation laid hold of me i could not help seeing it must have been finely romantic to go off like that those two alone caring as she cares and after the long separation it sounds like a thing in some elizabethan ballad there's a rhythm in it all which stirs one's blood she says the yacht's crew were delightful to her and treated her as a queen one can fancy that the stately lovely queen mother and that strange only son they called in at the north african ports and at jib and madeira and the cape de verde and then ran straight for rio then they steamed up the coast to pernambuco and on to the west indies richard never went ashore and cousin catherine only once or twice but they squatted about in the everlasting summer of tropic harbours fringed with palms and low dim red roof tropic houses just sampled it all the colour and light and beauty and far awayness of it and then when the fancy took them got up steam and slipped out again to sea and the name of the yacht is the reprieve that's in the picture isn't it honoria paused she leaned forward her chin in her hands her elbows on her knees she looked up at john knott and there was a singular expression in her clear and serious eyes i used to pity cousin catherine she said i used to break my heart over her and now now upon my word i believe i envy her and see here dr knott she has asked me to go on to brockhurst from here it seems that though richard refuses to see any one except you of course and julius march he fusses at his mother being so much alone what ought i to do i feel rather uncertain i have fought him i own i have we have never been friends he and i he doesn't like me he's no reason to like me anything but what do you say shall i refuse or shall i go and the doctor reflected a little drawing his great square hand down over his mouth and heavy bristly chin yes go he answered go and chance it your being at brockhurst may work out in more of good than we now know End of chapter 4 of book 6book six chapter five of the history of sir richard carmody this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by anne fletcher richmond tasmania two thousand and twenty the history of sir richard carmody by lucas mallet book six chapter five telling how dicky came to untie a certain tag of rusty black ribbon yet as those grey midwinter weeks went on to christmas and the coming of the new year it became undeniable there was that in the aspect of affairs at brockhurst which might very well provoke curious comment for the rigour of richard carmody's self-imposed seclusion to which miss st quentin had made allusion in her conversation with dr knott was not relaxed rather indeed did it threaten to pass from the accident of a first return after long absence and illness into a matter of fixed and accepted habit for those years of lonely wandering and spasmodic rage of living finding their climax in deepening disappointment disillusion and the shock of rudely inflicted insult and disgrace had produced in richard a profound sense of alienation from society and from the amenities of ordinary intercourse since he was apparently doomed to survive he would go home but go home very much as some trapped or wounded beast crawls back to hide in its lair 
he was master in his own house at least and safe from intrusion there the place offered the silent sympathy of things familiar and therefore in a sense uncritical it is restful to look on that upon which one has already looked a thousand times and so after his reconciliation with his mother followed in natural sequence his reconciliation with brockhurst here he would see only those who loved him well enough in their several stations and degrees to respect his humour to ask no questions to leave him to himself richard was gentle in manner at this period courteous humorous even but a great discouragement was upon him it seemed as though some string had snapped leaving half his nature broken unresponsive and dumb he had no ambitions no desires of activities sport and business were as little to his mind as society more than this at first the excuse of fatigue had served him but very soon it came to be a tacitly admitted fact that richard did not leave the house surely it was large enough he said to afford space for all the exercise he needed refusing to occupy his old suite of rooms on the ground floor he had sent orders before his arrival that the smaller library adjoining the long gallery should be converted into a bedchamber for him it had been richard's practice when on board ship to steady his uncertain footsteps on the slippery or slanting plane of the deck by the use of crutches and this practice he in great measure retained it increased his poor powers of locomotion it rendered him more independent sometimes when secure that lady carmody would not receive visitors he would make his way by the large library the state drawing-room and stairhead to the chapel room and sit with her there but more often his days were spent exclusively in the long gallery he had brought home many curious and beautiful objects from his wanderings he would add these to the existing collection he would examine the books too procure such volumes as were needed to complete any imperfect series and in the departments both of science literature and travel bring the library up to date he would devote his leisure to the study of various subjects especially natural science regarding which he was conscious of a knowledge deficient or merely empirical i really am perfectly contented mother he said to lady carmody more than once look at the length and breadth of the gallery it is as a city of magnificent distances after the deck of the dear old yacht and my twelve-foot cabin and i am not a man calculated to occupy so very much space after all let me potter about here with my books and my bibelot don't worry about me i shall keep quite well i promise you let me hibernate peacefully until spring anyhow i have plenty of occupation julius is going to amend the library catalogue with me and there are those chests of deeds and order books and diaries which really ought to be looked over as it appears pretty certain i shall be the last of the race it would be only civil i think to bestow a little of my ample leisure upon my forefathers and set down some more or less comprehensive account of them and their doings they appear to have been given to rather dramatic adventures oh don't you worry you dear sweet as i say let me hibernate until the birds of passage come and the young leaves are green in the spring then when the days grow long and bright the sea will begin to call again and when it calls you and i will pack and go and catherine yielded being convinced that richard could treat his own case best if healing complete and radical was to be effected it must come from within and not from without her wisdom was to wait in faith there was much that had never been told and never would be told much which had not been explained and never would be explained for notwithstanding the very gracious relation existing between herself and richard catherine realised that there were blank spaces not only in her knowledge of his past action but in her knowledge of the sentiments which now animated him as from a far country his mind she perceived often travelled to meet hers there was a door to which she found no key 
but Catherine, happily, could respect the individuality even of her best beloved. Unlike the majority of her sex, she was incapable of intrusion, and did not make affection an excuse for familiarity. Love, in her opinion, enjoins obligation of service rather than confers rights of examination and direction. She had learned the condition in which his servants had found Richard, in the opera box of the great theatre at Naples, lying upon the floor unconscious, his face disfigured, cut and bleeding. But what had produced this condition, whether accident or act of violence, she had not learned. She had also learned that her niece, Helen de Valorbe, had stayed at the villa just before the commencement of Richard's illness, he merely passing his days there and spending his nights on board the yacht in the harbour, where, no doubt, that same illness had been contracted. But she resisted the inclination to attempt further discovery. She even resisted the inclination to speculate regarding all this. What Richard might elect to tell her, that and that only would she know, lest, seeking further, bitter and vindictive thoughts should arise in her and mar the calm, pathetic sweetness of the present and her deep abiding joy in the recovery of her so long lost delight. She refused to go behind the fact, the glad fact, that Richard once more was with her, that her eyes beheld him, her ears heard his voice, her hands met his. Every little act of thoughtful care, every pretty word of half-playful affection, confirmed her thankfulness and made the present blessed. Even this somewhat morbid tendency of his to shut himself away from the observation of all acquaintance, conferred on her such sweetly exclusive rights of intercourse that she could not greatly quarrel with his secluded way of life. As to the business of the estate and household, this had become so much a matter of course to her that it caused her but small labour. If she could deal with it when Richard was estranged and far away, very surely she could deal with it now, when she had but to open the door of that vast silvery-tinted, pensively fragrant, many-windowed room, and entering, among its many strange and costly treasures, find him, a treasure as strange and, if counted by her past suffering, as costly as ever ravished and tortured a woman's heart. And so it came about, that to such few friends as she received, Catherine could show a serene countenance. Shortly before Christmas, Miss St. Quentin came to Brockhurst, and coming, stayed, adapting herself with ready tact to the altered conditions of life there. Catherine found not only pleasure but support in the younger woman's presence, in her devoted yet unexacting affection, in her practical ability, and in the sight of so graceful a creature going to and fro. She installed her guest in the gun-room suite, and, by insensible degrees, permitted Honoria to return to many of her former avocations in connection with the estate, so that the young lady took over much of the outdoor business, riding forth almost daily, by herself or in company with Julius March, to superintend matters of building or repairing, of road-mending, hedging, copsing or forestry, and not infrequently cheering Chiffney, a somewhat sour-minded man just now and prickly-tempered, since Richard asked no word of him nor of his horses, by visits to the racing stables. "'I had better step down and have a crack with the poor old dear, Cousin Catherine,' she would say, "'or those unlucky little wretches of boys will catch it double tides.' which really is rather superfluous. And all the while, amid her very varied interests and occupations, remembrance of that hidden twilight life going forward upstairs in the well-known rooms which she now never entered, came to Honoria as some perpetually recurrent and mournful harmony in an otherwise not ungladsome piece of music might have come. It exercised a certain dominion over her mind, so that Richard Calmady, though never actually seen by her, was never wholly absent from her thought. All the orderly routine of the great house, all the day's work and the sentiment of it, was subtly influenced by awareness of the actuality of his invisible presence. And this affected her strongly, 
causing her hours of repulsion and annoyance and again hours of abounding if reluctant pity when the unnatural situation of this man young as herself endowed with a fine intelligence and aptitude for affairs the craving for amusement common to his age and class and the pathos inherent in that situation haunted her imagination his self-inflicted imprisonment appeared a reflection upon in a sense a reproach to her own freedom of soul and pleasant liberty of movement and this troubled her it touched her pride somehow it produced in her a false conscience as though she were guilty of an unkindness a lack of considerateness and perfect delicacy whether he behaves well or ill whether he is good or bad richard carmody invariably takes up altogether too much room she would tell herself half angrily to find herself within half an hour under plea of usefulness to his mother warmly interested in some practical matter from which richard carmody would derive at least indirectly distinct advantage and benefit this then was the state of affairs one saturday afternoon at the beginning of february with poor dicky himself the day had been marked by abundant discouragement he was well in body the restfulness of one quiet uneventful week following another had steadied his nerves repaired the waste of fever and restored his physical strength but along with this return of health had come a growing necessity to lay hold of some idea to discover some basis of thought some incentive to action which should make life less purposeless and unprofitable richard in short was beginning to generate more energy than he could place the old order had passed away and no new order had as yet effectively disclosed itself he had not formulated all this or even consciously recognised the modification of his own attitude nevertheless he felt the gnawing ache of inward emptiness it effectually broke up the torpor which had held him it made him very restless it reawoke in him an inclination to speculation and experiment snow had fallen during the earlier hours of the day and the surface of the ground being frost-bound it though by no means deep remained unmelted the whiteness of it given back by the ceiling and pale panelling of walls of the long gallery notwithstanding the generous fires burning in the two ornate high-ranging chimney-places produced as the day waned an effect of rather stark cheerlessness in the great room this was at once in unison with richard's somewhat bleak humour and calculated to increase the famine of it all day long he had tried to stifle the cry of that same famine that same hunger of unplaced energy by industrious work he had examined noted here and there transcribed passages from deeds letters order books and diaries offering first-hand information regarding former generations of carmodies it happened that studies he had recently made in contemporary science especially in obtaining theories of biology had brought home to him what tremendous factors in the development and fate of the individual are both evolution and heredity at first idly and as a mere pastime and then with increasing eagerness in the vague hope his researches might throw light on matter of moment to himself and of personal application he had tried to trace out tastes and strains of tendency common to his ancestors but under this head he had failed to make any very notable discoveries for these courtiers soldiers and sportsmen were united merely by the obvious characteristics of a high-spirited free-living race they were raised above the average of the country gentry perhaps by a greater appreciation than is altogether common of literature and art but as richard soon perceived it was less any persistent peculiarity of mental and physical constitution than a similarity of outward event united them the perpetually repeated chronicle of violence and accidents which he read in connection with his people intrigued his reason and called for explanation was it possible he began to ask himself that a certain heredity in incident in external happening may not cling to a race that these may not by some strange process be transmissible 
as are traits of character, temperament and stature, colouring, feature and face. And if this, as matter of speculation merely, was the case, must there not exist some antecedent cause to which could be referred such persistent effect? Might not an hereditary fate in external events take its rise in some supreme moral or spiritual catastrophe, some violation of law? The Greek dramatist held it was so. The writers of the Old Testament held it was so, too. Sitting at the low writing table near the blazing fire, that stark whiteness reflected from off the snow-covered land all around him, Richard debated this point with himself. He admitted the theory was not scientific, according to the reasoning of modern physical science. It approached an outlook theological rather than rationalistic, yet he could not deny the conception, admission. The vision of a doomed family arose before him, starting in each successive generation with brilliant prospects and high hope, only to find speedy extinction in some more or less brutal form of death. A race dwindling, moreover, in numbers as the years passed, until it found representation in a single individual, and that individual maimed and incomplete. Heredity of accident, heredity of disaster, finding final expression in himself, this confronted Richard. He had reckoned himself heretofore a solitary example of ill fortune, but mastering the contents of these records, he found himself far from solitary. He merely participated, though under a novel form, in the unlucky fate of all the men of his race. And then arose the question, to him under existing circumstances of vital importance, what stood behind all that? Blind chance, cynical indifference, wanton and arbitrary cruelty? or some august, far-reaching necessity of as yet unsatisfied justice. Richard pushed the crackling, stiffly folded parchments, the letters frayed and yellow with age, the broken-backed, discoloured diaries and order-books, away from him, and sat, his elbows on the table, his chin in his hands, thinking. And the travail of his spirit was great, as it needs must be at times, with every human being, who dares live at first, not merely at second hand, who dares attempt a real and not merely a nominal ascent, who dares deal with earthly existence, the amazing problems and complexities of it immediately, refusing to accept with indolent timidity, tradition, custom, hearsay and convenience as his guides. Oh, for some sure answering, some unimpeachable assurance, some revelation not relative and symbolic, but absolute, some declaration above all suspicion of cunningly devised opportunism concerning the dealings of the unknown force man calls God with the animal man calls man. And then Richard turned upon himself contemptuously, for it was childish to cry out thus, the heavens were dumb above him as the snow-bound earth was dumb beneath. There was no sign never had been, never would be, save in the fond imaginations of religious enthusiasts, crazed by superstition, by austerities and hysteria, duped by ignorance, by hypocrites and quacks. With long-armed adroitness he reached down and picked up those light-made, stunted crutches, slipped from his chair and adjusted them. For a long while he had used them as a matter of course, without criticism or thought, but now they produced in him a swift disgust. His hands, grasping the lowest crossbar of them, were in such disproportionate proximity to the floor. For the moment he was disposed to fling them aside. Then again he turned upon himself with scathing contempt. For this too was childish. What did the use of them matter, since, used or not, the fact of his crippled condition remained? And so, with a renewal of bitterness and active rebellion lately unknown to him, he moved away down the great room, past bronze athlete and marble goddess, past oriental jars tall as himself, uplifted on the squat carven ebony stands, past strangely painted, half-fearful lacquer cabinets, past porcelain bowls filled with the faint sweetness of dried rose leaves, bay, lavender and spice, 
surpassed trophies of savage warfare and hardly less savage civilized sport he moved towards the wide mullion window of the eastern bay but just before reaching it he came opposite to a picture by velasquez set on an easel across the corner of the room it represented a hideous and misshapen dwarf holding a couple of graceful greyhounds in a leash an unhappy creature who had made sport for the household of some castilian grandee and whose gorgeous garments of scarlet and gold were ingeniously designed so as to emphasize the physical degradation of its contorted person richard had come of late to take a sombre pleasure in the contemplation of this picture the desolate eyes looking out of the marred and brutal face met his own with a certain claim of kinship there existed a tragic freemasonry between himself and this outcast being begotten of a common knowledge a common experience as a boy richard hated this picture studiously avoided the sight of it it had suggested comparisons which wounded his self-respect too shrewdly and endangered his self-security he hated it no longer finding grim solace indeed in its sad society and it was thus in silent parley with this rather dreadful companion as the blear february twilight descended upon the bare black trees and snow-clad land without and upon the very miscellaneous furnishings of the many-windowed gallery within that julius march now discovered richard carmody he had returned across the park from one of the quaint brick and timber cottages just without the last park gate at the end of sandyfield church lane a labourer's wife was dying painfully enough of cancer and he had administered the blessed sacrament to her there in her humble bedchamber the august promises and adorable consolations of that mysterious rite remained very sensibly present to him on his homeward way his spirit was uplifted by the confirmation of the divine compassion therein perpetually renewed perpetually made evident and it followed that coming now upon richard carmody alone here in the stark unnatural pallor of the winter dusk holding silent communion with that long ago victim of merciless practices and depraved tastes not only caused him a painful shock but also moved him with fervid desire to offer comfort and render help yet what to say how to approach richard without risk of seeming officiousness and consequent offence he could not tell the young man's experiences and his own were so conspicuously far apart for a moment he stood uncertain and silent and then he said that picture always fills me with self-reproach richard looked round with a certain lofty courtesy by no means encouraging and as he did so julius march was conscious of receiving a further and not less painful impression for richard's face was very still not with the stillness of repose but with that of fierce emotion held resolutely in check while in his eyes was a desolation rivalling that of the eyes portrayed by the great spanish artist upon the canvas close at hand when i first came to brockhurst that picture used to hang in the study he continued by way of explanation oh i see and you turned it out richard observed not without an inflection of irony oh, yes in those days i am afraid i did not discriminate very justly between refinement of taste and self-indulgent fastidiousness while pluming myself upon an exalted standard of sensibility and sentiment i rather basely spared myself acquaintance with that both in nature and art which might cause me distress or disturbance of thought i was a mental valetudinarian in short i am ashamed of my defect of moral courage and charity in relation to that picture richard shifted his position slightly looked fixedly at the canvas and then down at his own hands in such disproportionate proximity to the floor oh you were not to blame he said it's obviously a thing to laugh at or run from unless you happen to have received a peculiar mental and physical training anyhow the poor devil has found his way home now and come into port safely enough at last 
he glanced back at the picture over his shoulder as he moved across the room. Perhaps he's even found a trifle of genuine sympathy. So don't vex your righteous soul over your repudiation of him, my dear Julius. The lapses of the virtuous may make indirectly for good, and your instinct, after all, was both the healthy and the artistic one. Velasquez ought to have been incapable of putting his talent to such vile uses, and the first comer with a spark of true philanthropy in him ought to have knocked that poor little monstrosity on the head. Richard came to the writing table, glanced at the papers which encumbered it, made for an armchair drawn up beside the fire. "'Sit down, Julius,' he said. "'There's something quite else about which I want to speak to you. "'I have been working through all these documents, "'and they give rise to speculations neither strictly scientific nor strictly orthodox, "'yet interesting all the same. "'You are a dealer in ethical problems. "'I wonder if you can offer any solution of this one, "'of which the basis conceivably is ethical.' As to these various owners of Brockhurst, Sir Denzil, the builder of the house, is a delightful person, and appears to have prospered mightily in his undertakings, as so liberal-minded and ingenious a gentleman had every right to prosper. But after him, from the time at least of his grandson Thomas, everything seems to have gone to rather howling grief here. We have nothing but battle, murder, and sudden death— these become positively monotonous in the pertinacity of their repetition. Of course, one may argue that adventurous persons expose themselves to an uncommon number of dangers, and consequently pay an uncommon number of forfeits. I dare say that is the reasonable explanation. Only the persistence of the thing gets hold of one, rather. The manner of their dying is very varied, yet there are two constant quantities in each successive narrative— namely violence and comparative youth. Richard's speech had become rapid and imperative. Now he paused. Think of my father's death, for instance, he said. His narrow black figure crouched together, Julius March knelt on one knee before the fire. He held his thin hands outspread so as to keep the glow of the burning logs from his face. He was deeply moved, debating a certain matter with himself. To all questions supremely worth having answered, there is no answer. I take that for granted, the young man continued. And yet one is so made that it is impossible not to go on asking. I can't help wanting to get at the root of this queer recurrence of accident and all the rest of it, which clings to my people. I can't help wanting to make out whether there was any psychological moment which determined the future and started them definitely on the downgrade. What happened? That's what I want to arrive at. What happened at that moment? Had it any reasonable and legitimate connection with all which has followed? As he held them outspread between his face and the glowing fire, Julius March's hands trembled. He found himself confronted by a situation which he had long foreseen, long and earnestly prayed to avoid. The responsibility was so great of either giving or withholding the answer, as he knew it, to that question of Dickie's. A way of rendering possible help opened before him, but it was a way beset with difficulties, a way at once fantastic and coarsely realistic, a way along which the sublime and the ridiculous jostled each other with somewhat undignified closeness of association, a way demanding childlike faith, not to say childish credulity, coupled with a great fearlessness and self-abnegation before ever a man's steps could be profitably set in it. If presented to Richard, would he not turn angrily from it as an insult offered to his intellect and his breeding alike? Indeed, the hope of effecting good showed very thin. The danger of provoking evil bulked very big. What was his duty? He suffered an agony of indecision, and again with a slight inflection of mockery in his tone, Richard spoke. All blind chance, Julius. I declare I get a little weary of this deity of yours. He neglects his business so flagrantly. 
he really is rather scandalously much of an absentee and he would be so welcome if he would condescend to deal a trifle more openly with one and satisfy one's intelligence and moral sense if for instance he would afford me some information regarding this same psychological moment which i need so badly just now as a peg to hang a theory of casualty upon i am ambitious as much in the interests of his reputation as in those of my own curiosity to get at the logic of the affair to get at the why and wherefore of it and lay my finger on the spot where differentiation sets in julius march stood upright richard's scorn hurt him it also terminated his indecision for a little space he looked out into the stark whiteness of the snowy dusk and then down at the young man leaning back in the low chair there close before him to Julius's short-sighted eyes in the uncertain light, Dicky's face bore compelling resemblance to Lady Carmody's. This touched him with the memory of much, and he went back on the thought of the divine compassion perpetually renewed, perpetually made evident in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Man may rail, yet God is strong and faithful to bless. Perhaps that way was neither too fantastic nor too humble, after all, for Richard to walk in. "'Has no knowledge of the received legend about this subject ever reached you?' "'No, never, not a word. "'I became acquainted with it accidentally, long ago, before your birth. "'It is inadmissible, according to modern canons of thought, "'as such legends usually are, "'and events subsequent to my acquaintance with it conferred on it so singular and painful a significance that i kept my knowledge to myself perhaps when you grew up i ought to have put you in possession of the facts they touch you very nearly richard raised his eyebrows indeed he said coldly but a fitting opportunity at least so i judged being i own backward and reluctant in the matter never presented itself in this as in much else i fear i have betrayed my trust and proved an unprofitable servant if so may god forgive me oh, it would have gone hard with brockhurst without you julius richard said a sudden softening in his tone i will bring you the documents the last thing to-night when when your mother has left you they are best read perhaps in silence and alone end of book 5 of chapter 6book 6 chapter 6 of the history of sir richard carmody this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by anne fletcher richmond tasmania two thousand and twenty the history of sir richard carmody by lucas mallet book six chapter six a litany of the sacred heart richard drew himself up onto the wide cushioned bench below the oriel window the february day was windless and very bright and although in sheltered low-lying places where the frost held the snow still lingered in the open it had already disappeared and that without unsightliness of slush shrinking and vanishing cleanly burned up and absorbed by the genial heat a sabbath day restfulness held the whole land there was no movement of labour either of man or beast and a kindred restfulness pervaded the house the rooms were vacant none passed to and fro for it so happened that good mr carroll's successor the now rector of sandyfield had been called away to deliver certain charity sermons at west church and that to-day julius march officiated in his stead therefore lady carmody and miss st quentin and a major part of the brockhurst household had repaired by carriage or on foot to the little squat red brick georgian church whose two bells rang out so friendly and fussy an admonition to the faithful to gather within its walls. Richard had the house to himself, and this accentuation of solitude, 
combined with wider space wherein he could range without fear of observation, was far from unwelcome to him. Last night he had untied the tag of rusty black ribbon binding together the packet of tattered, dog-eared little chapbooks, which for so long had reposed in the locked drawer of Julius March's study table beneath the guardianship of the bronze Pieta. With very conflicting feelings he had mastered the contents of those same untidy little volumes, and learned the sordid and probably fabulous tale set forth in them in meanest vehicle of jingling verse, vulgarly told to catch the vulgar ear, pandering to the popular superstitions of a somewhat ignoble age, it proved repugnant enough, as Julius had anticipated, both to Richard's reason and to his taste. The critical faculty rejected it as an explanation absurdly inadequate. The cause was wholly disproportionate to the effect, as though a mouse should spring forth a mountain instead of a mountain a mouse. At least that was how the matter struck Richard at first, for the story was, after all, as he told himself, but a commonplace of life in every civilised community. Many a man sins thus, and many a woman suffers, and many bastards are yearly born into the world without, perhaps unfortunately, subsequent manifestation of the divine wrath and signal chastisement of the sinner or of his legitimate heirs, male or female. Affiliation orders are as well known to magistrates' clerks as are death certificates of children bearing the maiden name of their mother to those of the registrar. All that Richard could dispose of, if with a decent deploring of the frequency of it, yet composedly enough. But there remained that other part of it, and this he could not dispose of so cursorily. His own unhappy deformity, it was true, was amply accounted for on lines quite other than the fulfilment of prophecy, offering, as it did, example of a class of prenatal accidents, which, if rare, is still admittedly recurrent in the annals of obstetrics and embryology. Nevertheless, the foretelling of that strange child of promise, whose outward aspect and the circumstances of whose birth, as set forth in the sorry rhyme of the chapbook, bore such startling resemblance to his own, impressed him deeply. It astonished, it, in a sense, appalled him, for it came so very near, it looked him so insistently in the face, it laid strong hands on him from out the long past, claiming him, associating itself imperatively with him, asserting, whether he would or no, the actuality and inalienability of its relation to himself. Science might pour scorn on that relation, exposing the absurdity of it both from the moral and physical point of view, but sentiment held other language, and so did that nobler morality which takes its rise in considerations spiritual rather than social and economic, and finds the origins and ultimates alike not in things seen and temporal, but in things unseen and eternal, things which, though they tarry long for accomplishment, can neither change nor be denied, nor, short of accomplishment, can pass away. And it was this aspect of the whole strange matter, the thought, namely, of that same child of promise, who, predestined to bear the last and heaviest stroke of retributive justice, should, bearing it rightly, bring salvation to his race, which obtained with Dicky on the fair Sunday morning in question. It refused to quit him. It affected him through all his being. It appealed to the poetry, the idealism of his nature, a poetry and idealism not dead, as he had bitterly reckoned them, though sorely wounded by ill-living and the disastrous issues of his passion for Helen de Valorbe. He seemed to apprehend the approach of some fruitful, far-ranging, profoundly reconciling and beneficent event, as in the theatre at Naples, when Morabita sang, and to his fever-stricken, brain-sick fancy, the dull-coloured multitude in the parterre murmured, buzzing remonstrant as angry swarming bees, so now a certain exaltation of feeling, exaltation of hope, came upon him. Yet, having grown, through determined rebellion and unlovely experience, not a little distrustful of all promise of good, he turned on himself bitterly enough, 
asking if he would never learn to profit by hardly bought practical knowledge, if he would never contrive to cast the simpleton wholly out of him. He had been fooled many times, fooled there at Naples to the point of unpardonable insult and degradation. What so probable as that he would be fooled again, now? And so, in effort to shake off both the dominion of unfounded hope and the gnawing ache of inward emptiness which made that hope at once so cruel and so dear, as the sound of wheels dying away along the Lime Avenue assured him that the goodly company of church-goers had verily and indeed departed, he set forth on a pilgrimage through the great silent house. Passing through the two libraries, the antechamber and state drawing-room, with its gilded furniture, fine pictures and tapestries, he reached the open corridor at the stairhead. Here the polished oak floor, the massive balusters and tall carven newel posts, each topped by a guardian griffin, long of tail, ferocious of beak and sharp of claw, showed with a certain sober cheerfulness in the pleasant light. For through all the great windows of the eastern front the sun slanted in obliquely while in the chapel-room beyond, situated in the angle of the house and thus enjoying a southern as well as eastern aspect, Richard found a veritable carnival of misty brightness, so that he moved across to the oriel window, whose grey stone mullions and carved transoms showed delicately mellow of tone between the glittering leaded panes, in a glory of welcoming warmth and sunlight. Frost and snow might linger in the hollows, but here in the open, on the upland, spring surely had already come. With the help of a brass ring riveted by a stanchion into the space of panelling below the stone window sill, placed there long ago when he was a little lad to serve him in such case as the present, Richard drew himself up on to the cushioned bench. He unfastened one of the narrow, curved, iron-framed casements, and leaning his elbows on the sill, looked out. The air was mild, the smell of the earth was sweet, with a cleanly, wholesome sweetness. The sunshine covered him, and somehow, whether he would or no, hope reasserted its dominion, and that exaltation of feeling entered into possession of him once again, as he rested, gazing away over the familiar home scene, over this land, which, as far as sight carried, had belonged to his people these many generations, and was now his own. Directly below, at the foot of the descending steps of the main entrance, lay the square, red-walled space of gravel and of turf. He looked at it curiously, for there, with the maiming and death of Thomas Calmady's bastard, if legend said truly, all this tragic history of disaster had begun. There, too, the clown, racehorse of merry name and mournful memory, had paid the penalty of wholly involuntary transgression just thirty years ago. That last was a rather horrible incident, of which Richard never cared to think. Chiffney had told him about it once, in connection with the parentage of Verdigree, had told him just by chance. To think of it, even now, made a lump rise in his throat. Across the turf, offering quaint contrast to those somewhat bloody memories, the peacocks, in all their bravery of royal blue-purple, living green and gold, led forth their sober-clad mates. They had come out from the pepper-pot summer-houses to sun themselves. They stepped mincingly with a worldly and disdainful grace, and reaching the gravel, their resplendent trains swept the rounded pebbles, making a small, dry, rattling sound, which, so deep was the surrounding quiet, asserted itself to the extent of saluting Dicky's ears. Beyond the red wall, the parallel lines of the Elm Avenue swept down to the blue and silver levels of the long water, the alder copses bordering which showed black-purple, and the reed beds rusty as a fox against thin stretches of still unmelted snow. The avenue climbed the farther ascent to the wide archway of the red and grey gatehouse, just short of the top of the long ridge of bare moorland. 
The grass slopes of the park to the left were backed by the dark, saw-like edge of the fir forest, and a soft gloom of oak woods, grey-brown and mottled as a lizard's belly and back, closed the end of the valley eastward. On the right, the terraced gardens, with their ranges of glittering conservatories, fell away to the sombre pond in the valley, home of loudly discoursing companies of ducks. The gentle hillside above was clothed by plantations and a grove of ancient beech trees, whose pale, smooth boles stood out from among undergrowth of lustrous hollies and the warm russet of fallen leaves. And over it all brooded the restfulness of the Sabbath and the gladness of a fair and equal light. And the charm of the scene worked upon Richard, not with any heat of excitement, but with a temperate and reasonable grace. For the spirit of it all was a spirit of temperance, of moderation, of secure tranquillity, a spirit stoic rather than epicurean, ascetic rather than hedonic, yet generous, spacious, nobly reasonable, giving ample scope for very sincere, if soberly clad, pleasures, and for activities by no means despicable or unmanly, though of a modest, unostentatious sort. Dicky had tried not a few desperate adventures, had conformed his thought and action to not a few glaring patterns, rushing to violences of extreme colour, extreme white and black. All that had proved pre-eminently unsuccessful, a most poisonous harvest of Dead Sea fruit. What, he began to ask himself, if he made an effort to conform it to the pattern actually presented to him? Mellow, sun-visited, with the brave red of weather-stained masonry in it, blue and silver of water and sky, lustre of sturdy hollies, as well as the solemnity of leafless woods, finger of frost in the hollows and bleakness of snow. And as he sat meditating thus, breathing the clear air, feeling the tempered yet genial sun-heat, many questions began to resolve themselves. He seemed to look, as down a long, cloudy vista, beyond the tumult and unruly clamour, the wayward resistance and defiant sinning, the craven complainings, the ever-repeated suspicions and misapprehensions of man, away into the patient, unalterable purposes of God. And looking for the moment into those purposes, he saw this also, namely, that sorrow, pain and death are sweet to whosoever dares, instead of fighting with or flying from them, to draw near, to examine closely, to inquire humbly into their nature and their function. He began to perceive that these three reputed enemies, hated and feared of all men, are after all the fashioners and teachers of humanity, to whom it is given to keep hearts pure, godly and compassionate, to purge away the dross of pride, hardness and arrogance, to break the iron bands of ambition, self-love and vanity, to purify by endurance and by charity, welding together, as with the cunning strokes of the master craftsman's hammer, the innumerable individual atoms into a corporate whole, of fair form, of supreme excellence of proportion, the image and example of a perfect brotherhood, of a republic more firmly based and more beneficent than even that pictured by the divine Plato himself, since that was consolidated by exclusion, this by inclusion and pacification of those things which men most dread. He perceived that without the guiding and chastening of these three lovely terrors, humanity would indeed wax wanton, and this world become the merriest court of hell. Lust and corruption have it all their own foul way, the flesh triumph, and all bestial things come forth to flaunt themselves gaudily, greedily, without remonstrance and without shame in the light of day. Perceived in these three a trinity of holy spirits, bearing for ever the message of the divine mercy and forgiveness, perceived how of necessity only the man of sorrows can truly be the son of God. And perceiving all this, Richard's attitude towards his own unhappy deformity began to suffer modification. 
the sordid yet extravagant chapbook legend no longer outraged either his moral or his scientific sense he recalled his emotions in the theatre at naples when morabita sang remembering how wholly welcome had then been to him that imagined approaching act of retributive justice he recalled too the going forth of love towards his supposed executioners which he had experienced his reverence for and yearning towards the dull-coloured working bees of the parterre how he had longed to be at one with them partaker of their corporate action and corporate strength how he had rejoiced in the conviction that the final issues are subject to their ruling that the claims of want are stronger than those of wealth that labour is more honourable than sloth intelligence than privilege liberty more abiding than tyranny the idea of equality of fellowship more excellent than the aristocratic idea that of born master and born serf and both that welcome of the accomplishment of a signal act of justice and that desire to participate in the eternal strength of the children of labour as against the ephemeral and fictitious strength of the children of idleness and wealth found strange confirmation in the chapbook legend for it seemed to richard that taking all that singular matter both of prophecy and of cure simply as believers take some half miraculous scripture tale he had already in his own person in right of the physical uncomeliness of it paid part at all events of the price demanded by the eternal justice for his ancestors sinning and for his own it was not needful that the bees should swarm and the dull-coloured multitude revenge itself on the indolent full-fed larvae peopling the angular honey-cells as far as he richard calmady was concerned that revenge had been taken long ago in a mysterious and rather terrible manner before his very birth while in the stern denunciation the adhering curse of the outrage and so soon to be childless mother he found the just and age-old protest the patient faith of the eventual triumph of the proletariat of the defenceless poor as against the callous self-seeking and sensuality of the securely guarded rich by the fact of his deformity he was emancipated from the delusions of his class was made one in right of the suffering and humiliation of it with the dull-coloured multitudes whose corporate voice declares the ultimate verdict who are the architects and judges of civilization of art even of religion even in a degree of nature herself salvation according to the sorry yet inspiring rhyme of the chapbook was contingent upon precisely this recognition of brotherhood with and practice of willing service towards all maimed and sorrowful creatures his america was here or nowhere his vocation clearly indicated his work immediate and close at hand how the eternal justice might see fit to deal with other souls why he had been singled out for so peculiar and conspicuous a fate richard did not pretend to say all that had become curiously unimportant to him for he had ceased to call that fate a cruel one it had changed its aspect it had come suddenly to satisfy both his conscience and his imagination with a movement at once of wonder and of deep-seated thankfulness he for the first time held out his hands to it accepting it as a comrade pledging himself to use rather than to spurn it he looked at it steadfastly and so looking found it no longer abhorrent but of mysterious virtue and efficacy endued with power to open the gates of a way closed to most men into the heart of humanity which in a sense is nothing less than the heart of almighty god himself it was as though like the saint of old daring to kiss the scabs and sores of the leper he found himself gazing on the divine lineaments of the risen christ and this brought to him a sense of almost awed repose it released him from the vicious circle of self of sharp-toothed disappointment and leaden heavy discouragement in which he had so long fruitlessly turned 
he seemed consciously to slough off the foul and ragged garment of the past and all its base unprofitable memories, as the snake sloughs off her old skin in the warm May weather, and glides forth glittering in a coat of untarnished silver mail. The whole complexion of his thought regarding his personal disfigurement was changed. Not that he flattered himself the discomfort, the daily vexation and impediment of it had passed away. On the contrary, these very actually remained, and would remain to the end, and the consequences they entailed remained also, the restrictions and deprivations they inflicted. They put many things, dear to every sane and healthy-minded man, hopelessly out of his reach, very much upon the shelf. Love and marriage were shelved thus, in his opinion, let alone lesser and more ephemeral joys. Only the ungrudging acceptance of the denial of those joys, whether small or great, was a vital part of that idea to the evolution of which he now dedicated himself that whole which in process of its evolution would make for a sober and temperate well-being formed on the pattern sober yet nobly spacious cleanly and wholesome of the sun-visited landscape there without he had just got to discipline himself into the harmony with the idea newly revealed to him and that as he told himself not without a sense of the humour of the situation in certain aspects meant in more than one department plenty of work, and he had to spend himself and go on through good report and ill, through gratitude, and, if needs be, through abuse and detraction, still spending himself, actively, untiringly, in the effort to make some one person, it hardly mattered whom, but for choice those who like himself had been treated unhandsomely by nature or by accident, just a trifle happier day by day. But while Richard rested thus in the quiet sunshine, he lost count of time. High noon came and passed, finding and leaving him in absorbed contemplation of his own thought. At last a barking of dogs and the sound of wheels away on the north side of the house broke up the silence. Then a faint echo of voices, a boy's laughter in the great hall below, then footsteps, which he took to be Lady Carmody's, coming lightly up the grand staircase. At the stairhead those footsteps paused for a little space, as though in indecision whither to turn, and Richard, pushed by an impulse of considerateness somewhat, it must be owned new to him, called, "'Mother, is that you? Do you want me? I'm in here.' Whereat the footsteps came forward, in at the open door, and through the soft glory of the all-pervading sunshine, with an effect of gentle urgency and haste. Catherine's grey silk pelisse was unfastened, showing the grey silk gown, its floating ribbons, pretty frills and flounces beneath. Every detail of her dress was very fresh and very finished, a demure daintiness in it, from the topmost grey plume and upstanding velvet bow of her bonnet to the pretty shoes upon her feet. Along with a lace handkerchief and her church books, she carried a bunch of long stalked violets. Her face was delicately flushed, a great surprise touching upon anxiety, tempering the quick pleasure of her expression. "'My dearest,' she said, "'this is as delightful as it is unexpected. What brings you here?' and Richard smiled at her without reserve, no longer as though putting a force upon himself or of set purpose, but naturally, spontaneously, as one who entertains pleasant thoughts. He took her hand and kissed it with a certain courtliness and reverent fervour. "'I came to look for something here,' he said, "'which I have looked for at many times and in very various places, yet never somehow managed to find.' But Catherine, at once tenderly charmed and rendered yet more anxious by a quality in his manner and in his speech unfamiliar to her, the purport of which she failed at once to gauge, answered him literally. "'My dearest, why didn't you tell me? I would have looked for it before I went to church and saved you the trouble of the journey from the gallery here.' "'Oh, the journey wasn't bad for me. I rather enjoyed it,' Dicky said. And then— to tell you the truth, 
you've spent the better part of your dear life in looking for that same something which i could never manage to find poor sweet mother no thanks to me so far that you haven't utterly worn yourself out in the search for it he paused and gazed away out of the open casement but i have a good hope that all's over and done with now and that at last i've found the thing myself and catherine still charmed still anxious looked down at him wondering for there was a perceptible undercurrent of emotion beneath the lightness of his speech however all that will keep he continued how did you enjoy your church did dear old julius distinguish himself how did he preach and catherine still wondering again answered literally oh, very beautifully she said with an unusual force and pathos he took the congregation not a little by storm he fairly carried us away he was eloquent and that with a simplicity which made one question whether he did not speak out of some pressing personal experience catherine's manner was touched by a pretty edge of pique really i believed i knew all about julius and his doings by this time but it seems i don't i think i must find out it would vex me that anything should happen in which he needed sympathy and that i did not offer it his subject was the answer to prayer and the fulfilment of prophecy and how both come come surely and directly yet often in so different a form to that which in our narrowness of vision and dullness of sense we anticipate that we fail to recognize either the answer or the fulfilment and so miss the blessing they must needs bring and which is so richly so preciously ours if we had but the wit to understand and lay hold of it whereupon richard smiled again yes he said very probably julius did speak out of personal experience or rather vicarious experience however i don't think he need worry this time at least i hope not the answer to prayer and fulfilment of prophecy when they're good enough to come along don't always get the cold shoulder then his expression changed hardened a little his lips growing thin and his jaw set look here mother he added i think perhaps i have been rather playing the fool lately since we came home i propose to take to the ordinary habits of civilized christian man again if it doesn't bother you would you kindly let the servants know that i am coming down to luncheon oh my dearest how stupid of me i am so grieved catherine cried she sat down beside him on the cushioned bench dropping service books handkerchiefs and violets in the extremity of her gentle and apologetic distress it never occurred to me that you might like to come down the newlands people came over to church and i brought mary and the two boys back godfrey is over from eton for the sunday and little dick has had a cold and has not gone back to school yet oh, what can we do it would be lovely to have you and yet i don't quite know how i can send them away again oh, but why on earth should they be sent away richard said touched and amused by her earnestness mary's always a dear and i've been thinking lately i shouldn't mind seeing something of that younger boy he is my godson isn't he and not tells me he is curiously like you and uncle roger you see it's about time to select an heir apparent for brockhurst luckily i've a free hand my life's the last in the entail then looking at him lady calmady's lips trembled a little health had returned and with it his former good looks but matured spiritualized as it seemed to her just now the livid line of the scar had died out too and was nearly gone and all this taken in connection with his words just uttered affected her to so great and poignant a love so great and poignant a fear of losing him that she dared not trust herself to make any comment on those same words lest the floodgates of emotion should be opened and she should lose her self-control very well dicky she said bowing her head then she added quickly with a little gasp of renewed distress and apology 
Oh, but, oh, dear me, Honoria is here too. Whereat Richard laughed outright. He could not help it. She was so vastly engaging in her distress. All right, he said. I am equal to accepting Honoria St. Quentin into the bargain. In short, mother dear, I take over the lot, and if anybody else turns up between now and two o'clock, I'll take them over as well. Why, why, you dear sweet, don't look so scared. There's nothing to trouble about. I'm not too good to live, never fear. On the contrary, I am prepared to do quite a fine amount of living, only on new and more modest lines, perhaps. But we won't talk about that just yet, please. We'll wait to give it a name until we're a little more sure how it promises to work out. End of chapter 6 of book 6「Book Six, Chapter Seven of the History of Sir Richard Calmady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Calmady by Lucas Mallet. Book Six, Chapter Seven, Wherein Two Enemies Are Seen to Cry Quits. Godfrey Ormiston scudded along the terrace past the dining-room windows at the top of his speed, and Miss St. Quentin followed him at a hardly less unconventional pace. Together they burst, by the small arch side door, into the lobby. There ensued discussion, lively though brief. Then, Winter setting wide the dining-room door in invitation, sight of Honoria was presented to the company assembled within. She, in brave attire of dark red cloth, black braided and befrogged, heavy silk cords and knotted dangling tassels, headgear to match, dark red and black, a tall stiff aigrette set at the side of it, in all producing a something delightfully independent, soldierly, ruffling even in her aspect, as she pushed the black-haired, bright-faced, slim-maid lad, her two hands on his shoulders, before her into the room. "'May we come to luncheon as we are, Cousin Catherine?' she cried. "'We're scandalously late, but we're also most ferociously hungry, and—' But here, although Lady Carmody turned on her a welcoming and far from unjoyful countenance, she stopped dead, while Godfrey incontinently gave vent to that which his younger brother, sitting beside his mother, Mary Ormiston, at table on Richard Carmody's right, described mentally as the most awful squawk, which squawk, it may be added, whatever its effect upon other members of the company, as denoting involuntary and unceremonious descent from the high places of thirteen-year-old public-schooled omniscience on the part of his elder, produced in eight-year-old Dick Ormiston such overflowings of unqualified rapture, that for a good two minutes he had to forego a simulation of chocolate souffle, and slipping his hands beneath the table, squeeze them together just as hard as ever he could with both knees, to avoid disgracing himself by a mission of an ecstatic giggle. For once he had got the whip hand of Godfrey. Having himself, for the best part of an hour now, been conversant with interesting developments, he found it richly diverting to behold his big brother thus incontinently bowled over by sudden disclosure of them. He repressed the giggle with the help of squeezing knees and a certain squirming all down his neat little back, but his blue eyes remained absolutely glued to Godfrey's person, as the latter, recovering his presence of mind and good manners, proceeded solemnly up to the head of the table to greet his unlooked-for host. Honoria, meanwhile, if guiltless of an audible squawk, had been, as she subsequently reflected, potentially alarmingly capable of some such primitive expression of feeling, for the shock of surprise which she suffered was so forcible that it induced in her an absurd, unreasoning instinct of flight. Indeed, that had happened, or rather was in the process of happening, which revolutionised all her outlook, for that the unseen presence 
consciousness of which had come to be so constant a quantity in her action and her thought should thus declare itself in visible form be materialized become concrete and that instantly without prologue or preparation projecting itself wholesale so to speak into the comfortable commonplaces of a sunday luncheon after her slightly uproarious race home with a perfectly normal schoolboy from morning church too affected her much as sudden intrusion of the supernatural might it modified all existing relations introducing a new and as yet incalculable element nor had she quite yet realised what power the unseen Richard Calmady these many years had exercised over her imagination, until Richard Calmady, seen, was there, evident, actually before her. Then all the harsh judgments she had passed on him, all the disapproval of and dislike she had felt towards him, flashed through her mind. And that matter, too, of his cancelled engagement... The last time she had seen him was in the house at Lowndes Square, on the night of Lady Louisa Barking's great ball. Standing, she could see all that now. It was as if photographed upon her brain, and always would be, and it turned her a little sick. Nevertheless, it was impossible to pause any longer. It would be ridiculous to fly, so she must stick it out. That best of good Samaritans, Mary Ormiston, began talking to Julius March across the length of the table. "'Oh, dear, yes, of course,' she was saying, "'but I never realised she was a sister of your old Oxford friend. I wish I had. It would have been so pleasant to talk about you and about home in that far country. Her husband is in the Rifle Brigade, and she really is a nice dear woman.' I saw a great deal of her while we were at the Cape. And so, under cover of Mary's kindly conversation, Miss St. Quentin settled down into her lazy, swinging stride. Her small head carried high, her pale, sensitive face very serious, her straight eyebrows drawn together by concentration of purpose and concentration of thought, she followed the boy up the long room. As she came towards him, Richard Carmody looked full at her. His head was carried somewhat high, too. His face was very still. His eyes, with those curiously small pupils to them, were very observant, in effect hiding rather than revealing his thought. His manner, as he held out his hand to her, was courteous, even friendly. And yet, notwithstanding her high and fearless spirit, Honoria, for the first time in her life, probably, felt afraid. And then she began to understand how it came about, that whether he behaved well or ill, whether he was good or bad, cruel or kind, seen or unseen even, Richard, of necessity, could not but occupy a good deal of space in the lives of all persons brought into close contact with him. For she recognised in him a rather tremendous creature, self-contained, not easily accessible, possessed of a larger portion than most men of energy and resolution, possessed too, and this as she thought of it again turned her a trifle sick, of an unusual capacity of suffering. "'I am ashamed of being so dreadfully late,' she said, as she slipped into the vacant place on his left. Godfrey Ormiston was beyond her, next to Julius March. Honoria was aware that her voice sounded slightly unsteady, in part from her recent scamper, in part from a queer emotion which seemed to clutch at her throat. "'But we walked home over the fields and by the warren, and just in that boggy bit where you cross the Welsh road, Godfrey found the slot of a red deer in the snow, and naturally we both had to follow it up.' "'Oh, naturally,' Richard said. "'I'm not so sure it was a red deer, Honoria,' the boy broke in. "'Oh, yes, it was,' she declared, as she helped herself to a cutlet. "'It couldn't have been anything else.' "'Why not?' Richard asked. He was interested by the tone of assurance in which she spoke. "'Oh, well, the tracks were too big for a fallow deer to begin with. And then there's a difference. You can't mistake it if you've ever compared the two in the cleft of the hoof.' "'And you have compared the two. "'Oh, certainly,' Honoria answered. 
she was beginning to recover her nonchalance of manner and indolent slowness of speech. I lose no opportunity of acquiring odds and ends of information. One never knows when they may come in handy. She looked at him as she spoke, and her upper lip shortened and her eyes narrowed into a delightful smile, a smile, moreover, which had the faintest trace of an asking of pardon in it. And it struck Richard that there was in her expression and bearing a transparent sincerity, and that her eyes, now narrowed as she smiled, were not the clear, soft brown they appeared at a distance to be, but an indefinable colour, comparable only to the dim yet clear green gloom which haunts the underspaces of an ilex grove on a summer day. He turned his head rather sharply. He didn't want to think about matters of that sort. He was grateful to this young lady for the devoted care she had bestowed on his mother. But otherwise her presence was only a part of that daily discipline which must be cheerfully undertaken in obedience to the exigencies of his new and fair idea. Oh, probably it's a deer that has broken out of Windsor Great Park and travelled, he said. They do that sometimes, you know. But here, small Dick Ormiston, whose spirits, lately pirouetting on giddy heights of felicity, had suffered swift declension bootwards at mention of this thrilling adventure in which, alas, he had neither lot nor part, projected himself violently into the conversational arena. Mother, he piped, his words tumbling one over the other in his eagerness, Mother, I expect it's the same deer that Grandpapa was talking about when Lord Shotover came to tea last Friday and wanted to know if Honoria wasn't back at Newlands again. And then he and Grandpapa yarned, don't you know, because, Cousin Richard, it must have been while you were away last year, the buckhounds met at Bagshot and ran through Frimley and right across Spendle Flats. No, they didn't, Cousin Richard. Godfrey interrupted. They ran through the bottom of Sandyfield Lower Wood. Oh, but they lost. Anyway, they lost, Cousin Richard, the younger boy cried. You weren't there, Godfrey, so you can't know what Grandpapa said. He said they lost somewhere just into Brockhurst, and he told Lord Shotover how they beat up the country for nearly a week, and how they never found it, and had to give it up as a bad job and go home again. And, and Lord Shotover said, oh, rotten bad sport, stag hunting, unless you get it on Exmoor, where they're not carted and they don't saw their antlers off. He said meets of the buckhounds ought to be called stockbroker's parade. That was about all they amounted to. And so, Cousin Richard, I think, don't you, Mother, that this must be that same deer. Whereat the elder Dick's expression, which had grown somewhat dark at the mention of Lord Shotover, brightened sensibly again. And for cause unknown, he looked at Honoria, smiling amusedly, before saying to the very voluble small sportsman, to be sure, Dick, your arguments are unanswerable, convincingly sound. No reasonable man could have a doubt of it. Of course it's the same, dear. And so the luncheon finished gaily enough, though Miss St. Quentin was conscious her contributions to the cultivation of that same gaiety were but spasmodic. She dreaded the conclusion of the meal, fearing lest then she might be called upon to behold Richard Carmody once again, as she had beheld him, now just on six years ago, in the half-dismantled house in Lowndes Square, on the night of Lady Louisa Barking's ball. And from that she shrank, not with her former physical repulsion towards the man himself, but with the moral repulsion of one compelled against his will to gaze upon a pitifully cruel sight, the suffering of which he is powerless to lessen or amend. The short, light-made crutches lying on the floor by the young man's chair shocked her as the callous exhibition of some unhappy prisoner's shackling irons might. It constituted an indignity offered to the Richards sitting here beside her, so much as to think of, let alone look at, that same Richard when on foot. Therefore, it was with an oddly mingled relief and sense of playing traitor that she rose with the rest of the little company and left him by himself. She was thankful to escape, though all the while her inherent loyalty tormented her with accusation of meanness, as of one who deserts a comrade in distress. 
but here the small dick, to whom such complex refinements of sensibility were as yet wholly foreign, created a diversion by prancing round from the far side of the table and forcibly seizing her hand. He was jealous of the large share Godfrey had today secured of her society. He meant to have his innings. So he rubbed his curly head against her much-braided elbow, butting her lovingly in the exuberance of his affection as some nice little ram-lamb might. But just as they reached the door, through which Lady Calmady and the rest of the party had already passed, the boy drew up short. "'I say, hold on half a minute, Honoria, please,' he said. And then, turning round, his cheeks red as peonies, he marched back to where Richard sat alone at the head of the table. "'In case, oh, in case, don't you know,' he began, stuttering in the excess of his excitement. "'In case, Cousin Richard, Mummy didn't quite take in what you said at the beginning of luncheon. "'You did mean for really that I was to come and stay here in the summer holidays, "'and that you'd take me out, don't you know, and show me your horses?' "'And to Honoria, glancing at them, there was a singular and almost tragic comment on life "'in the likeness yet unlikeness of those two faces.' the features almost identical, the same blue eyes, the two heads alike in shape, each with the same close-fitted bright brown cap of hair. But the boy's face flushed without afterthought or qualification of its eager happiness, the man's colourless, full of reserve, almost alarmingly self-contained and still. Yet when the elder Richard's answer came, it was altogether gentle and kindly. "'Yes, most distinctly for really, Dick,' he said. "'Let there be no mistake about it. "'Let it be clearly understood. "'I want to have you here just as long and just as often "'as your mother and father will spare you. "'I'll show you the horses, never fear, "'and let you ride them too.' "'Ah, a real big one?' "'Just as big a one as you can straddle.' "'Richard paused.' And I'll show you other things, if all goes well, which I'm beginning to think, and perhaps you'll think so too some day, are more important even than horses. He put his hands under the boy's chin, tipped up the ruddy, beaming little face and kissed it. It's a compact, he said. Now, cut along, old chap. Don't you see you're keeping Miss St. Quentin waiting? whereupon the small Richard started soberly enough, being slightly impressed by something, he knew not quite what, only that it made him feel awfully fond somehow of this newly discovered cousin and namesake. But about halfway down the room, that promise of a horse, a thoroughbred, and just as big as he could straddle, swept all before it, rendering his spirits uncontrollably explosive. So he made a wild rush and flung himself headlong upon the waiting Honoria. Oh, you want to bear fight, do you? Two can play at that game, she cried. You young rascal. And then without apparent effort or diminution of her lazy grace, the elder Richard saw her pick the boy up by his middle and, notwithstanding convulsive wrigglings on his part, throw him across her shoulder and bear him bodily away through the lobby, into the hall and out of sight. Hence it fell out that not until quite late that evening did the moment so dreaded by Miss St. Quentin actually arrive. In furtherance of delay, she practised a diplomacy not altogether flattering to her self-respect, coming down rather late for dinner and retiring immediately after that meal to the gun-room, under plea of correspondence which must be posted at Farley in time for tomorrow's day mail. She was even late for prayers in the chapel, so that taking her accustomed place next to Lady Carmody in the last but one of the stalls upon the epistle side, she found all the members of the household, gentle and simple alike, already upon their knees. The household mustered strong that night, a testimony it may be supposed to feudal as much as to religious feeling. In the seats immediately below her were an array of women servants, declining from the high dignities of Mrs. Reynolds the housekeeper, the faithful Clara, and her own lanky and loyal north countrywoman Falstitch, to a very youthful scullery maid, sitting just without the altar rails at the end of the long row. Opposite were not only Winter, Bates the steward, Powell, Andrews and the other men's servants, but Chaplin, heading a detachment from the house stables, 
and unexampled occurrence, Gnudi the Italian chef, with his air of gentle and philosophic melancholy and his anarchic sentiments in theology and politics, liable, these last, when enlarged on, to cause much fluttering in the dovecote of the housekeeper's room. To hear Signor Gnudi talk sometimes made your blood run cold. It seemed as if you couldn't be safe anywhere from those wicked foreign barricades and massacres, as Clara put it. And yet, in point of fact, no milder man ever larded a woodcock or stuffed it with truffles. Alone, behind all these, in the first of the row of stalls with their carven spires and dark, vaulted canopies, sat Richard Carmody, whom all his people had thus come forth silently to welcome. But through prayer and psalm and lesson alike, as Miss St. Quentin noted, he remained immovable, to her almost alarmingly cold and self-concentrated. Only once he turned his head, leaning a little forward and looking towards the purple and silver and fair white flowers of the altar and the clear shining of the altar lights. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The words were given out by Julius March, not only with an exquisite distinctness of enunciation, but with a ring of assurance of sustaining and thankful conviction. Richard leaned back in his stall again, looking across at his mother, while Honoria, taken with a sensitive fear of inquiring into matters not rightfully hers to inquire into, hastily turned her eyes upon her open prayer book. They must have many things to say to one another, that mother and son, as she divined today. Far be it from her to attempt to surprise their confidence. She rose from her knees, cutting her final petitions somewhat short, directly the last of the men-servants had filed out of the chapel, and crossing the chapel room, a tall, pale figure in her trailing white evening dress, she pulled back the curtain of the oriel window, opened one of the curved, many-paned casements, and looked out. She was curiously moved, very sensible of a deeper drama going forward around her, going forward in her own thought, subtly modifying and transmuting it, than she could at present either explain or place. The night was cloudy and very mild. A soft, sobbing westerly wind, with the smell of coming rain in it, saluted her as she opened the casement. The last of the frost must be gone by now, even in the hollows. The snow wholly departed also. The spring, though young and feeble yet, puling like some ailing baby child in the voice of that softly complaining westerly wind, was here, very really present at last. Honoria leaned her elbows on the stone window ledge. Her heart went out in strong emotion of tenderness towards that moist wind which seemed to cry, as in a certain homelessness, against her bare arms and bare neck. Inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these my brethren. But just then Catherine Carmody called to her, and that in a sweet, if rather anxious, tone. Honoria, dear child, come here, she said. Richard is putting me through the longer catechism regarding those heath fires in August last year and the state of the woods. Then, as the young lady approached her, Lady Carmody laid one hand on her arm, looking up in quick and loving appeal at the serious and slightly troubled face. My answers only reveal the woeful greatness of my ignorance. My geography has run mad. I am planting forest in the midst of cornfields, so Dickie assures me, and making hay, generally, as you, my dear, would say, of the map. Still her eyes dwelt upon Honoria's in insistent and loving appeal. Come, she said, explain to him, and save me from further exposition of my own ignorance. Thus admonished, the young lady sat down on the low sofa beside Richard Carmody. As she did so, Catherine rose and moved away. 
Honoria, determined to see only the young man's broad shoulders, his irreproachable dress clothes, his strangely still and very handsome face. But since there was no concealing rug to cover them, it was impossible that she should long avoid also seeing his shortened and defective limbs and oddly shod feet. And at that she winced and shrank a little, for all her high spirit and inviolate maidenly strength. "'Oh, yes, those fires,' she said hurriedly. "'Oh, there were several. You remember, Cousin Catherine? Or I dare say you don't, for you were ill all the time. But the worst was on Spendle Flats.' Uh, you know that long three-cornered bit, she looked Richard bravely in the face again, uh, which lies between the Portsmouth Road and our crossroad to Farley. It runs into a point just at the top of Star Hill. Yes, I know, Dicky said. He had seen her wince. Well, that wasn't wonderful. She could not very well do otherwise if she had eyes in her head. He didn't blame her. And then, though it was not easy to do so with entire serenity, this was precisely one of those small, unpleasant incidents which, in obedience to his new code, he was bound to accept calmly and good-temperedly, just as part of the day's work, in fact. He had done with malingering, he had done with the egoism of sulking and hiding, even to the extent of a couvre-pied. All right, here it was. Richard settled his shoulders squarely against the straight, stuffed back of the Chippendale sofa and talked on. "'It's a pity that bit is burnt,' he said. "'I haven't been over that ground for nearly six years, of course, "'but I remember there were very good trees there, "'a plantation at the top end, "'just before you come to the big gravel pits "'and the rest self-sown. "'Are they all gone?' "'Licked as clean as the back of your hand,' Honoria replied, "'warming to her subject. "'They hardly repaid felling for firewood. "'It made me wretched.' some idiot threw down a match i suppose there had been nearly a month's drought and the whole place was like so much tinder there was an easterly breeze too you can imagine the blaze we hadn't the faintest chance poor old isles lost his head completely and sat down with his feet in a dry ditch and wept there must be over two hundred acres of it it's a dreadful eyesore, perfectly barren and useless, but for a little sour grass even a gypsy's donkey has to be hard up before he cares to eat. Miss St. Quentin shifted her position with a certain impatience. I can't bear to see the land doing no work, she said. Doing no work? Dicky inquired. He began to be interested in the conversation from other than a purely practical and local standpoint. "'Of course,' she asserted. "'The land has no more right to lie idle than any of the rest of us, "'unless it's a bit of tilth sweetening in fallow between two crops. "'That is reasonable enough. "'But for the rest,' she said, "'a certain brightness and self-forgetting gaining on her, "'let it contribute its share all the while, "'like an honest citizen of the universe. "'Let it work, most decidedly let it work.' "'And what about such trifles as the few hundred square miles of desert or mountain range?' Richard inquired, half amused, half, and that rather unwillingly, charmed. "'They are liable to be a thorn in the side of the, well, socialist?' "'Oh, I've no quarrel with them. They come under a different head.' Honoria's manner had ceased to be in any degree embarrassed, though a slight perplexity came into her expression. For just then she remembered somehow her pacings of the station platform at Culoz, the salutation of the bleak, pure evening wind from out the fastnesses of the Alps, and all her conversation there with her faithful admirer Ludovic Quayle. And it occurred to her what singular contrast in sentiment that bleak evening wind offered to the mild, moist westerly wind, complaint of the homeless baby, spring, which had just now cried against her bosom. And again Honoria became conscious of being in contact, both in herself and in her surroundings, with more coercing, more vital drama than she could either interpret or place. Again something of fear invaded her, to combat which she hurried into speech. 
No, I haven't any quarrel with deserts and so on, she repeated. They're uncommonly useful things for mankind to knock its head against. Invincible, unnegotiable, splendidly competent to teach humanity its place. You see, we've grown not a little conceited, so at least it seems to me, on our evolutionary journey up from the primordial cell. We're too much inclined to forget we've developed soul quite comparatively recently, and therefore that there is probably just as long a journey ahead of us before we reach the ultimate of intellectual and spiritual development as there is behind us physically, from, say, the parent Ascidian to you and me. And, and somehow, Honoria's voice had become full and sweet, and she looked straight at Dicky with a rare candour and simplicity. Somehow those big open spaces remind one of all that. They drive one's ineffectualness home on one. They remind one that environment, that mechanical civilization. All the shortcuts of applied science, after all, count for little, and inevitably come to the place called stop. And that braces one. It makes one the more eager after that which lies behind the material aspects of things, and to which these merely act as a veil. Honoria had bowed herself together. Her elbows were on her knees, her chin in her two hands, her charming face alight with a pure enthusiasm and Richard watched her curiously. His acquaintance with women was fairly comprehensive, but this woman represented a type new to his experience. He wanted to tolerate her merely, to regard her as an element in his scheme of self-discipline. And it began to occur to him that from some points of view she knew as much about that, as much about the idea inspiring it, as he did. He leaned himself back in the angle of the sofa and clasped his hands behind his head. "'All the same,' he said, "'I am afraid those burnt acres on Spendle Flats are hardly extensive enough to afford an object for me to knock my head against and so enforce salutary remembrance of the limitations of human science. Possibly that has already been sufficiently brought home to me in other ways.' He paused a minute. Honoria straightened herself up. Again she saw, whether she would or no, those defective shortened limbs and oddly shod feet. And again, somehow, that complaint of the moist spring wind seemed to cry against her bare arms and neck, begetting an overwhelming pitifulness in her. So, since it's not necessary we should reserve it as an object lesson in general ineffectualness, Miss St. Quentin, what shall we do with it? Oh, plant, she said. Ah, with the ubiquitous Scotsman. Oh, it wouldn't carry anything else, except along the boundaries. There you might put in a row of hornbeam and oak. They always look rather nice against a background of firs. Only the stumps of the burnt trees ought to be stubbed. Let them be stubbed, Richard said. Where are you going to find the labour? The estate is very much undermanned. Import it, Richard said. No, no, Honoria answered, again warming to her subject. I don't believe in imported labour. If you have men by the week, they must lodge, and the lodger is as ten plagues of Egypt in a village. If a man comes by the day, he is tired and slack. His heart is not in his work. He does as little as he can. Moreover, in either case, the wife and children suffer. He's certain to take them home short money. He's pretty safe, being tired in the one case, or in the other, on the loose, to drink. Dicky's face gave. He laughed a little. We seem to have come to a fine impasse, he remarked. Though humiliatingly small, that tract of burnt land must clearly be kept to knock one's head against. Honoria rose to her feet. "'Richard, I wish you'd build,' she said, in her earnestness unconscious of the unceremonious character of her address. "'Iles ought to have done that before now, but he is old and timid, and his one idea has been to save. You know, this Brockhurst property alone would carry eight or ten more families. There's plenty of work it needn't be made. It is there ready to hand.' 
Give them good gardens, allotments if you can, and leave to keep a pig. That's infinitely better than extravagant wages. Root them down in the soil. Let them love the place. Tie them up to it. Your socialism is rather quaintly crossed with feudalism, isn't it? Dickie remarked. He drew himself forward, slipped down off the sofa and stood upright. And then, indeed, the cruel disparity between his stature and her own, for tall though she was, he by right of make and length of arm should evidently have been by some two or three inches the taller, and all the grotesqueness of his deformity were fully disclosed to Honoria. For the second time that day, her tact, her presence of mind, her ready speech, deserted her. She backed a little away from him. And Richard perceived that. It is not easy to be absolutely philosophic. Something of his old anger revived towards Miss St. Quentin. He shuffled forward a step or two, and steadying himself with one hand on the arm of the sofa, reached down to pick up his crutches. But his grasp was not very sure just then. He secured one. To his intense annoyance, the other escaped him, falling back on the floor with a rattle. And then, instantly, before he could make effort to recover it, Honoria's white figure swept down on one knee in front of him. She laid hold of the crutch, gave it him silently, and rose to her full height again, pale, gallant, and stately, but with her quivering of her lips and nostrils, and an amazement of regret and pity in her eyes, which very certainly had never found place there heretofore. "'Thanks,' Richard said. He waited just a minute. He too was amazed somehow. He needed to revise the position. "'About those eight or ten happy families whom you wish to root so firmly in the soil, and the housing of them, are you busy tomorrow morning?' "'Oh, no, no!' Honoria declared, with rather unnecessary emphasis. "'Generosity should surely be met by generosity.' Dickie leaned his arm against the arm of the sofa and looked up at the speaker. Her transparent sincerity, her superb chastity, he could call it by no other word, of manner and movement, even of outline, the slight angularity of strong muscle as opposed to soft roundness of cushioned flesh, these arrested and impressed him. "'I had Chiffney up from the stables this afternoon and made my peace with him,' he said. "'He was very full of your praises, Honoria, for the cousinship may as well be acknowledged between us, don't you think? You have supplemented my lapses in respect of him as of a good deal else.' Richard looked away to the door of Lady Carmody's bedroom. It stood open, and Catherine came from within with some books and a silver candlestick in her hands. "'My dears,' she said, "'do you know it grows very late?' "'All right,' he answered. "'We're making out some plans for tomorrow.' He looked at Honoria again. "'Chiffney engaged. He and Chaplin would find a horse between them which could be trusted to, well, to put up with me,' he said. "'I promised to go down and have breakfast with dear Mrs. Chiffney at the stables, but I can be back here by eleven. Would you be inclined to come out with me then?' We could ride over to that burnt land and have a poke round for sites for your cottages. Oh, yes, indeed I can come, Honoria answered. Her delightful smile beamed forth, and it had a new and very delicate charm in it. For it so happened that the woman in her, whom, to use her own phrase, she had condemned to solitary confinement in the back attic, beat very violently against her prison door just then in attempt to escape. "'Dear Cousin Catherine, good night. Good night, Richard,' she said hurriedly. She went out of the room, lazily, slowly, down the black polished staircase, across the great silent hall and along the farther lobby. But she let the gun-room door bang to behind her and flung herself down in the armchair, in which, by the way, the old bulldog had died a year ago, broken-hearted by overlong waiting for the homecoming of his absent master.' And then Honoria, though the least tearful of women, wept, not in petulant anger or with the easy, luxuriously sentimental overflow common to feminine humanity, but reluctantly, with hard, irregular sobs which hurt, yet refused to be stifled since the extreme limit of emotional and mental endurance had been reached. 
"'Oh, it's fine,' she said half aloud. "'I can see that it's fine. "'Oh, but, dear God, is there no way out of it? "'It's so horribly, so unspeakably sad.' "'And Richard remained on into the small hours, "'sitting before the dying fire of the big hearth-place "'at the eastern end of the gallery. "'Mentally he audited his accounts, "'the profit and loss of this day's doing.' and on the whole the balance showed upon the profit side. Verily it was only a day of small things, of very humble ambitions, of far from world-shaking successes. Still four persons, he judged, he had made a degree or so happier. His mother rejoiced, though with trembling as yet, at his return to the ordinary habits of the ordinary man. Sweet dear thing, small wonder that she trembled. He had led her such a dance in the past that any new departure must give cause for anxious questionings. Dicky sunk his head in his hands. Oh, God forgive him what a dance he had led her. And Julius March was happier. He, Richard, was pretty certain of that, since Julius could not but understand that in the present case at all events neither fulfilment of prophecy nor answer to prayer had been disregarded. And the hard-bitten, irascible old trainer Tom Chifney was happier, probably really the happiest of the lot, since he demanded nothing more recondite and far-reaching than restoration to favour and due recognition of the importance of his calling and of the merits of his horses. A nice, funny, voluble little Dick Ormiston was happier too. Richard's heart went out strangely to the dear little lad. He wondered if it would be too much to ask Mary and Roger to give him the boy altogether. Then he put the thought from him, judged it savoured of the selfishness, the exclusiveness and egoism with which he had sworn to part company for ever. He stretched his hand out over the arm of the chair, craving for some creature warm, sentient and dumbly sympathetic to lay hold of. He remembered there used to be a man down near Alton, a hard-riding farmer who bred bulldogs, white ones with black points, like Camp and Camp's forefathers. He would tell Chifney to go down there and bespeak the two best of the next litter of puppies. Yes, he wanted a dog again. It was foolish, perhaps, but after all, one did want something, and since other things were denied, a dog must do, and he wanted one badly. Yet the day had been a success on the whole. He had been true to his code. Only, and Richard shrugged his shoulders rather wearily, it had got to be begun all over again tomorrow, and next day, and next, an endless perspective of tomorrow's. And the poor flesh, with its many demands, its delicious and iniquitous passions, its enchantments, its revelations, its adorable languors, its drunken heats, must it have nothing, nothing at all? Must that whole side of things be ruled out for ever? He had no more desires for mistresses, God forbid. Helen somehow had cleansed him of all possibility of that and he would never ask any woman to marry him. The sacrifice on her part would be too great. He thought of little Lady Constance. Simply, it was not right. So, practically, the emotional joys of life were reduced to this. They must consist solely in giving. Giving, giving of time, sympathy, thought and money. A far from ignoble programme, no doubt but a rather austere one for a man of liberal tastes, of varied experience, and of barely thirty. And he was strong as a bull now. He knew that. He might live to be ninety. Yes, he thought he would ask for little Dick Ormiston. The boy would be an amusement and interest him. And then, suddenly, the vision of Honoria St. Quentin in her red and black braided gown, with that air of something roughly and soldierly about it, whipping the small dick up in her strong arms, throwing him across her shoulder and bearing him off bodily, and of Honoria later, her sensitive face all alight, as she discoursed of the ultimate aim and purpose of life and of living, came before him. Above her white dress he could see her white and finely angular shoulders as she swept down to pick up that wretched crutch. 
Yes, she was a being of singular contrasts, of remarkable capacity, both mental and practical. And she might have a heart. She might. Once or twice it had looked rather like it. But after all, what did that matter? The feminine side of things was excluded. Besides, he supposed she was half engaged to Ludovic Quayle. Dicky yawned. He was sleepy. His meditations became unprofitable. He had best go to bed. And the devil fly away with all women. Of saving and accepting my well-beloved mother, he said. End of chapter 7 of book 6《Book Six, Chapter Eight of the History of Sir Richard Carmody. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book Six, Chapter Eight, Concerning the Brotherhood Founded by Richard Carmody, and other matters of some interest. It was still very sultry. All the windows of the red drawing-room stood wide open. Outside the thunder rain fell, straight as ramrods, in big globular drops, which spattered upon the grey quarries and splashed on the pink and lilac, lemon-yellow, scarlet and orange of the pot-plants. Hydrangeas, pelagoniums and early flowering chrysanthemums set three deep along the base of the house wall, the whole length of the terrace front. The atmosphere was thick, masses of purple cloud, lurid light crowning their summits, boiled up out of the southeast. But the worst of the storm was already over, and the parched land, grateful for the downpour of rain, exhaled a whiteness of smoke as in thanksgiving from off some altar of incense. On the grass slopes of the near park a flight of rooks had alighted. They stalked and strode over the withered turf with a self-important, quaintly clerical air, seeking provender, but so far finding none, since the moisture had not yet sufficiently penetrated the hardened soil for earthworms and kindred creeping things to move surface woods. Within, the red drawing-room had suffered conspicuous change, for on Richard moving downstairs to his old quarters in the southwestern wing of the house, Lady Carmody had judged it an act of love, rather than of desecration, to restore this long disused apartment to its former employment. Adjoining the dining-room, connecting this last with the billiard-room, summer parlour and garden hall, this room was convenient to assemble in before and sit in for a while after meals. Richard would thereby be saved superfluous journeys upstairs, and this act of restitution which was also in a sense an act of penitence, once decided upon, Catherine carried it forward with a certain gentle ardour, renewing crimson carpets and hangings and disposing the furniture according to its long-ago positions. The memory of what had once been should remain for ever here enshrined, but with the glad colours of life, not the faded ones of unforgiven death upon it. It satisfied her conscience to do this, for it appeared to her that so very much of good had been granted her of late, so large a measure of peace and hope vouchsafed to her, that it was but fitting she should bear testimony to her awareness of all that by obliteration of the last outward sign of the rebellion of her sorrowful youth. The Richard of to-day, home-staying, busy with much kindness, thoughtful of her comfort, honouring her with delicate courtesies, which to whoso receives them makes her womanhood a privilege rather than a burden, yet teasing her not a little, too, in the security of a fair and equal affection, bore such moving resemblance to that other Richard, first master of her heart, that Catherine could afford to cancel the cruelty of certain memories, retaining only the lovelier portion of them, and could find a peculiar sweetness in frequentation of this room, formerly devoted wholly to a sense of injury and blackness of hate. And on the day in question, Catherine's presence exhaled a specially tender brightness, even as the thirsty earth, refreshed by the thunder rain, sent up a rare whiteness as of incense smoke. For she had been somewhat anxious about Dicky lately. To her sensitive observation of him, 
his virtue, his evenness of temper, his reasonableness, had come to have in them a pathetic element. He was lovely and pleasant in his ways, but sometimes, when tired or off his guard, she had surprised an expression on his face, a constrained patience of speech, even of attitude, which made her fear he had given her but that half of his confidence calculated to cheer, while he kept the half calculated to sadden, rather rigorously to himself. And in good truth, Richard did suffer somewhat at this period. The first push of enthusiastic conviction had passed, while his new manner of conduct and of thought had not yet acquired the stability of habit. The tide was low, shallows and sandbars disclosed themselves. He endured the temptations arising from the state known to saintly writers as spiritual dryness, and found those temptations of an inglorious and wholly unheroic sort. And though he held his peace, Catherine feared for him, feared that the way he elected to walk in was over-straight, and that though resolution would hold, health might be overstrained. "'My darling, you never grumble now,' she had said to him a few days back, to which he answered, "'Poor dear mother, have I cheated you of one of your few small pleasures? Was it so very delightful to listen to that same grumbling?' "'I begin to believe it was,' Catherine declared. "'It conferred a unique distinction upon me, you see, because I had a comfortable conviction that you grumbled to nobody else. One is jealous of distinction. Yes, I think I miss it, Dicky." Whereupon he laughed and kissed her, and swore he'd grumble fast enough if there was anything, which positively there wasn't, to grumble about. All of which, though it charmed Catherine, appeased her anxiety but moderately. The young man worked too hard, his opportunities of amusement were too scant. Catherine cast about in thought and in prayer for some lightening of his daily life, even if such lightening should lessen the completeness of his dependence upon herself. And it was just at this juncture that Miss St. Quentin wrote, proposing to come to Brockhurst for a week. She had not been there since the Whitsuntide recess. She wrote from Ormiston, where she was staying on her way south, after paying a round of country house visits in Scotland. It was now late September. She would probably go to Cairo for the winter with young Lady Tobermory, grandniece by marriage of her late godmother and benefactress, whose lungs were pronounced to be badly touched. Might she therefore come to Brockhurst to say good-bye? And to this proposed visit Richard offered no opposition, though he received the announcement of it without any marked demonstration of pleasure. Oh, by all means, let her come. Of course it must be a pleasure to his mother to have her. And he'd got on very well with her in the spring. Unquestionably he had. Richard's expression was slightly ironical. But he did really like her? Oh, dear, yes. He liked her exceedingly. She was quite curiously clever, and she was sincere. And she was rather beautiful, too, in her own style. He had always thought that by all means have her. After which conversation, Richard went for a long ride, inspected cottages in building at Sandyfield, visited a house undergoing extensive internal alterations which stands back from Clark's Green, about a hundred yards short of Apple Yard, the saddler's shop at Farley Row. He came in late. Unusual silence held him during dinner, and Lady Carmody took herself to task, reproaching herself with selfishness. Honoria was very dear to her, and so only too probably she had overrated the friendliness of Dicky's attitude towards the young lady. But they had seemed to get on so extremely well in the spring, and very fairly well at Whitsuntide. Yet perhaps in that, as in so much else, Richard put a constraint upon himself obeying conscience rather than inclination. Catherine was perturbed. Nor had her perturbations suffered diminution yesterday upon Miss St. Quentin's arrival. Richard remained unexpansive. Today, however, matters had improved. Something, possibly the thunderstorm, seemed to have thawed his coldness. 
broken up his reticence of manner. Therefore Catherine gave thanks and moved with a lighter heart. As for Miss St. Quentin herself, an innate gladsomeness pervaded her aspect not easy to resist. Lady Calmady had been sensible of it when the young lady first greeted her that morning. It remained by her now, as she stood after luncheon at one of the open windows, watching the uprolling thundercloud, the spattering raindrops, the quaintly solemn behaviour of the stalking, striding rooks. Honoria was easily entertained to-day. She felt well disposed toward every living creature, and the rooks diverted her extremely. Profanely, they reminded her of certain archiepiscopal garden parties, with this improvement on the human variant, that here wives and daughters also were condemned to decent sables instead of being at liberty to array themselves according to self-invented canons of remarkably defective taste. But, though diverted, it must be owned she gave her attention the more closely to all that outward drama of storm and rain, and to the antics of the rooks, because she was very conscious of the fact that Richard Carmody had followed her and his mother into the red drawing-room, and it hurt her, though she had now of necessity witnessed it many times. It hurt, it still very shrewdly distressed her, to see him walk. As she heard the soft thud and shuffle of his onward progress, followed by the little clatter of the crutches as he laid them upon the floor beside his chair, the brightness died out of Honoria's face. She registered sharp annoyance against herself, for she had not anticipated that this would continue to affect her so much. She supposed she had grown accustomed to it during her last two visits to Brockhurst, and that this time it would occasion her no shock but the sadness of the young man's deformity remained present as ever. The indignity of it offended her. The desire by some, by any means, to mitigate the woeful circumscription of liberty and opportunity which it inflicted wrought upon her almost painfully. And so she looked very hard at the hungry antiquing rooks, both to secure time for recovery of her equanimity and also to spare Richard's smallest suspicion that she avoided beholding his advance and installation. "'We needn't start until four, mother,' she heard him say. "'But I'm afraid it is clearing.' Honoria turned from the window. "'Yes, it is clearing,' she remarked. "'Incontestably clearing. You won't escape the grim-shot function after all.' "'Oh, it's a nuisance having to go,' Richard replied. "'But, you see, this is an old engagement. "'People are wonderfully civil and kind. "'I wish they were less so. "'They waste one's time. "'But it doesn't do to be ungracious, "'and we needn't stay more than half an hour, need we, mother?' "'He looked up at Honoria. "'Don't you think, on the whole, you'd better come too?' he said. "'But the young lady shook her head smilingly. "'She stood close beside Lady Carmody.' "'Oh, dear, no,' she answered. "'I am quite absolutely certain I hadn't better come too.' Richard continued to look up at her. "'Half the county will be there. "'Everything will be richly, comprehensively dull. "'Think of it. Oh, "'Do come,' he repeated. "'It would be so good for your soul.' "'Oh, my soul's in the humour to be nobly careless of personal advantage,' Honoria replied. It's in a state of almost perilously full-blown optimism regarding the security of its own salvation, today, somehow. Her glance rested very sweetly upon Lady Carmody. And then all the rest of me, and not impossibly my soul has a word to say in that connection too, cries out to go and tramp over the steaming turf and breathe the scent of the fir woods again. Honoria sat down lazily on the arm of a neighbouring easy chair, against the crimson cover of which her striped blue and white shirting dress showed excellently distinct and clear. Richard's prolonged and quiet scrutiny oppressed her slightly, necessitating change of attitude and place. And then, she continued, I want to go down to the paddocks and have a look at the yearlings. How are they coming on? Have you anything good? Well, two or three promising fillies. They're in the paddock nearest the long water. You'll find them as quiet as sheep, but I'll ask you not to go in among the brood mares and foals unless Chiffney's with you. 
they may be a bit savage and shy, and it's not altogether safe for a lady. He stretched out his hand, taking Lady Carmody's hand for a moment. Dear mother, you look tired. You'll have to put up with Grimshot. The weather's not going to let us off. Go and rest until we start. And when a few minutes later, Catherine, departing, closed the door behind her, he addressed Miss St. Quentin again. How do you think my mother is? Beautifully well. Not worried? No, Honoria said. You are really quite contented about her, then? The question both surprised and touched his hearer as a friendly and gracious admission that she possessed certain rights. Oh, dear, yes, she said. I am more than contented about her. No one can fail to be so who, loving her, sees her now. There was just one thing she wanted. Now she has it, and so all is well. What one thing? Dickie asked, with a hint of irony in his manner and his voice. "'Why, you. You, Richard,' Honoria said. She drew herself up proudly, a little alarmed by, a little defiant, of the directness of her own speech, perceiving so soon as she had uttered it that it might be construed as indirect reproach, and to administer reproach had been very far from her purpose. She fixed her eyes upon the domes of the great oaks, crowning an outstanding knoll at the far end of the Lime Avenue. The foliage of them, deep green, shading to russet, was arrestingly solid and metallic, offering a rather magnificent scheme of stormy colour taken in connection with the hot purple of the uprolling cloud. Framed by the stonework of the open window, the whole presented a fine picture in the manner of Salvatore Rosa. A few bright raindrops splashed and splattered, and the thunder growled far away in the north. The atmosphere was heavy. For a time neither spoke. And then Honoria said, gently as one asking a favour, "'Richard, will you tell me about that home of yours? Cousin Catherine was speaking of it to me last night.' And it seemed to her his thought must have journeyed to some far distance and found difficulty in returning thence, it was so long before he answered her, while his face had become set and showed colourless as wax against the surrounding crimson of the room. "'Oh, the home!' he exclaimed, shrugging his shoulders just perceptibly. "'It doesn't amount to very much. My mother, in her dear unwisdom of faith and hope, magnifies the value of it. It's just an idle man's fad. A fad with an uncommon amount of backbone to it, apparently. That depends on its eventual success. It's a thing to be judged not by intentions, but by results. What made you think of it? Richard looked full at her, spreading out his hands and again shrugging his shoulders slightly. Again, Miss St. Quentin accused herself of a defect of tact. "'Isn't it rather obvious why I should think of it?' he asked. "'It seemed to me that in a very mild and limited degree it was calculated to meet a want.' He smiled upon her quite sweet-temperedly, yet once more there was a flavour of irony in his tone. "'Of course, hideous creatures and disabled creatures are an eyesore. We pity, but we look the other way. I quite accept that.' They're a nuisance, since they are a standing witness to the fact that things here below very far from always work smoothly and well, and that there are disasters beyond the power of applied science to put right. The ordinary human being doesn't covet to be forcibly reminded of that by means of a living object lesson. Richard shifted his position, clasped his hands behind his head, he had begun speaking without idea of self-revelation, but the relief of speech after long self-repression took him, goading him on. Old strains of feeling, kept under by conscious exercise of will, asserted themselves. He asked neither sympathy nor help. He simply called from off those shallows and sandbars laid bare by the ebbing tide of his first enthusiasm. He protested, wearied by the spiritual dryness which had caused all effort to prove so joyless of late. To have sought relief in words before his mother would have been unpardonable, he held. She had borne enough from him in the past, and more than enough. 
but to permit it himself in the presence of this young, strong, capable woman of the world was very different. She came out of the swing of society and of affairs, of large interests in politics and in thought. She would go back into those again very shortly, so what did it matter? She captivated him and incensed him alike. His relation to her had been so fertile of contradictions, at once so singularly superficial and fugitive, and singularly vital. He did not care to analyse his own feelings in respect of her. He had, so he told himself, never quite cared to do that. She had wounded his pride shrewdly at times. Still, he had unquestioning faith in her power of comprehending his meaning as she sat there, graceful, long-limbed and indolent, in her pale dress, looking towards the window, the light on her face revealing the fine squareness of the chiselling of her profile, of her jaw, her nostril and brow. She appeared so free of spirit, so untrammelled, so excellently exalted above all that is weak, craven, smirched by impurity, capable of baseness and deceit. But naturally with me the case is different, he went on, his voice growing deeper, his utterance more measured. It is futile to resent being reminded of that which in point of fact you never forget. It's childish for the pot to call the kettle black. And so I came to the conclusion, a few months ago, to put away all such childishness and set myself to gain whatever advantage I could from, well, from my own blackness. Honoria turned her head, averting her face yet further. Richard could only see the outline of her cheek. She had never before heard him make so direct allusion to his own deformity and it frightened her a little. Her heart beat curiously quick, for it was to her as though he compelled her to draw near and penetrate a region in which, gazing thitherward questioningly from afar, she had divined the residence of stern and intimate miseries, inalienable, unremittent, taking their rise in an almost alarming distance of time and fundamentally of cause. You see, in plain English, he said, I look at all such unhappy beings from the inside, not as the rest of you do, merely from the out. I belong to them and they to me. It is not an altogether flattering connection. Only recently, I am afraid, have I had the honesty to acknowledge it. But having once done so, it seems only reasonable to look up the members of my unlucky family and take care of them, and, if possible, put them through, not on the lines of a charitable institution, which must inevitably be a rather mechanical, stepmother kind of arrangement at best, but on the lines of family affection, of personal friendship. He paused a moment. Does that strike you as too unpractical and fantastic? contrary to sound philanthropic principle and practice. Honoria shook her head. It is based on a higher law than any of modern organised philanthropy, she said, and her voice had a queer unsteadiness in it. It goes back to the Gospels, to the matter of giving your life for your friend. As she spoke, Honoria rose. She went across and stood at the window. Furtively, she dabbed her pocket handkerchief against her eyes. "'Well, after all, one must give one's life for something or other, you know,' Dicky remarked, "'or the days would become a little too intolerably dull, "'and then one might be tempted to make short work of life altogether.' Honoria returned to her chair and sat down, "'this time not on the arm of it, but in ordinary, conventional fashion. "'She faced Richard. "'He observed that her eyelids were slightly swollen, slightly red.' This gave an extraordinary effect of gentleness to her expression. "'How do you find them, the members of your sad family?' she asked. "'Oh, in all sorts of ways and of places. Not, swears it is contrary to reason, and interfering with the beneficent tendency of nature to kill off the unfit. Yet he works like a horse to help me. He even talks of giving up his practice and moving to Farley Row, so as to be near the headquarters of my establishment. The lease of a rather charming old house there fell in this year. 
Fortunately, the tenant did not want to renew, so I am having that made comfortable for them. Richard smiled. A greater sense of well-being animated him. Out of the world she had come, back into the world she would go again. Meanwhile, she was nobly fair to look upon. She was pure of heart. Intercourse with her made for the justification of high purposes and unselfish experiment. So he thought. I am growing as keen on bagging a fine cripple as another man might on bagging a fine tiger, he said. The whole matter at bottom, I suspect, turns on the instinct of sport. Only the week before last I acquired a rather terribly superior specimen. A lad of eighteen, a factory hand in West Church. He was caught by some loose gearing and swept into the machinery. What is left of him, if it survives, which it had much better not, and I can't help hoping it will, he is such a plucky, sweet-natured fellow, how oh, it will require a nurse for the rest of its life. So I am pushing on the work at Farley, that the home may be ready when we get him out of hospital. By the way, I must go to-morrow and stir up the workmen. Do you care to come and see it all, if the afternoon is fine and not too hot? And Honoria agreed, nor did she shrink when Richard, slipping out of his chair, picked up his crutches. I suppose it is about time to get ready for the grimshot function, he said. She walked beside him to the door, opened it, and passed into the neutral-tinted, tapestry-hung dining-room. There the young man waited a moment. He looked not at her, but straight before him. Honoria, he said, suddenly, almost harshly, you and Helen de Valorbe used to be great friends. For more than a year I have held no communication with her except through my lawyers. Can you tell me anything about her? Miss St. Quentin hesitated. Nothing very direct. I heard from de Valorbe about three months ago. I don't think I am faithless. Indeed, I held on to her as long as I could, Richard. I am not squeamish, and then I always prefer to stand by the woman. But whatever de Valorbe may have been, he pulled himself together rather admirably from the time he went into the army. He wanted to keep straight and to live respectably. And, oh, I hate to say so, but she treated him a little too flagrantly. And then... Oh, and then... Honoria put her hands over her eyes and shook back her head angrily. It wasn't one man, Richard. Dicky went white to the lips. I know that, he said. He moved forward a few steps. Who is it now? Destonel? Oh, no, no, Honoria said. Some Russian, from the extreme east, Kazan, I think, prince, millionaire, drunken savage. But he adores her. He squanders money upon her, surrounds her with barbaric state. This is de Valorbe's version of the affair. The scandal is open and notorious. But she and her prince together have great power. Something will eventually be arranged in the way of a marriage. She will not come back. End of chapter 8 of book 6